The Bleeding Mummy Outside, the midwinter wind hurled wave after wave of a sleet barrage against the window panes, keening a ferocious war chant the while. Within, the glow of sawn railway ties burning on the brass fire dogs blended pleasantly with the shaded lamplight. Jules de Grandin put aside the copy of L'Illustration he had been perusing since dinner time, stretched his slender, womanishly small feet toward the fire, and regarded the gleaming tips of his patent leather pumps with every evidence of satisfaction. Tiens, friend Trowbridge, he remarked lazily as he watched the leaping firelight quicken in reflection on his polished shoes. This is most extremely pleasant. Me, not for anything, would I leave the house on such a night. He is a fool who quits a cheerful fire to— The sharp, peremptory clatter of the front-door knocker battered through his words, and before I could hoist myself from my chair the summons was repeated louder, more insistently. I say, Dr. Trowbridge, will you come over to Larson's? I'm afraid something's happened to him. I hate to drag you out on such a night, but I think he really needs a doctor, and— Young Professor Ellis half staggered into the hall as the driving wind thrust him almost bodily across the doorstep. I ran over to see him a few minutes ago, he added as I slammed the door against the storm. And as I went up his front path I noticed a light burning in an upper window, though the rest of the house was dark. I knocked but got no answer, then went into the yard to call him, when all of a sudden I heard him give the most god-awful yell— followed by a shriek of laughter, and as I looked up at his window he seemed to be struggling with something, though there was no one else in the room. I rang his bell a dozen times and pounded on the door, but not another sound came from the house. At first I thought of notifying the police, then I remembered you lived just round the corner, so I came here instead. If Larson's been taken ill, you can help. If we need the police, there's always time to call him, so— Eh bien, my friends, why do we stand here talking while the poor Professor Larson is in need of help? demanded Jules de Grandin from the study door. Have you no professional pride, friend Trowbridge? Why do we linger here? Why, you've only finished saying you wouldn't budge from the house tonight, I retorted accusingly. Do you mean— But certainly I do, he interrupted. Only two kinds of people cannot change their minds, my friend. The foolish and the dead. Jules de Grandin is neither. Come, let us go. No use getting out the car, I murmured as we donned our overcoats. This sleet would make driving impossible. Very well, then, let us walk, but let us be about it swiftly, he responded, fairly pushing me through the door and out into the raging night. Heads bent against the howling storm, we set out for Professor Larson's house. I didn't exactly have an engagement with Larson, Professor Ellis admitted as we trudged along the street. Fact is, I expect he'd about as soon have seen the devil as me. But, uh, have you heard about his latest mummy? He broke off. His what? I answered sharply. His mummy. He brought it in from Africa last week, and he's been talking about it ever since. This evening he was going to remove the wrappings, so I just ambled over to his house on the off chance he'd let me stick around. Larson's a queer chap. Good man in anthropology and all that, of course, but a lone wolf when it comes to work. He found this mummy by accident, in a cleverly hidden tomb near Naga Eder, and that country was given up as thoroughly worked out thirty years ago, you know? Funny thing about it, too. While they were excavating the sepulchre, two of his workmen were bitten by tomb spiders and died in convulsions. That's unusual, for the Egyptian tomb spider's not particularly venomous, though he's an ugly-looking brute. They'd just about cleared the shaft of rubble and started working toward the funerary chamber— when all Larson's fellahin ran out on him, too. But he's a stubborn devil, and he and Foster stuck it out, with the help of such men as they could hire in the neighborhood. They had the devil of a time getting the mummy down the Nile, too. Half the crew of their Dahabia came down with some mysterious fever, and several of them died and the rest deserted. And just as they were ready to sail from Alexandria, Foster, who was Larson's assistant, came down with fever and died within three days. Larson hung on like grim death, though, and brought the mummy through. Smuggled it right past the Egyptian customs men, disguised as a crate of Smyrna sponges. But see here, I interrupted. Both you and Professor Larson are members of the Harrisonville Museum staff. 
How does it happen he's able to treat this mummy as his personal property? Why didn't he take it to the museum instead of his house? Ellis gave a short laugh. Don't know Larson very well, do you? he asked. Didn't I say he's a lone wolf? This expedition to Naga Adir was a fifty-fifty affair. The museum paid half the shot, and Larson just about beggared himself to make up the difference. He had a theory there were some valuable Fifth Dynasty relics to be found at Naga, and everybody laughed at him. When he justified his theory, he was like a spoiled kid with a stick of candy and wouldn't share his find with anyone. When I suggested he let me help him unwrap the thing, he told me to take a running jump in the lake. I hadn't an idea, really. He'd let me in when I called on him tonight. But when I heard him yelling and laughing and saw him jumping around like a chestnut on a griddle, I thought maybe he'd gone off his rocker and ran to get you as quickly as I could. Here we are. We'll probably be told to go to hell for our trouble, but he might need help. As he finished speaking, Ellis sounded a thunderous knock on Larson's door. Only the skirling of the wind around the angle of the house and the flapping of an unsecured window blind responded. Pas bleu, either he is gravely ill or most abominably deaf, that one, declared de Grandin, sinking his chin in the fur collar of his coat and grasping at his hat as the storm wind all but wrenched it from his head. Ellis turned to us in indecision. Do you think? he began, but think what you please, my friends, and freeze your feet while doing, the little Frenchman interrupted testily. Me, I go into that house right away, immediately, this minute. Trying the door and nearest window, and finding both securely fastened, he dashed his gloved band through the pane without more ado, undid the latch, and raised the sash. Do you follow, or remain behind to perish miserably with cold? he called as he flung a leg across the sill. De Grandin in the lead, we felt our way across the darkened drawing-room, across the hall, and up the winding staircase. Every room inside the house, save one, was black as ancient Egypt during the plague of darkness. But a thin stream of light trickling out into the hall from beneath Professor Larson's studied door led our footsteps toward his sanctum as a lighthouse guides a ship to port upon a starless night. Larson, Ellis called softly, rapping on the study door. Larson, are you there? No answer came, and he seized the doorknob, giving it a tentative twist. The handle turned in his grasp, but the door held firm, for the lock had been shot from the inside. One side, if you will be so kind, monsieur, requested Jules de Grandin, drawing as far back as the width of the hall permitted, then dashing himself forward like a football player battering toward the goal. The flimsy door fell before his rush, and the darkened hall was flooded with a freshet of dazzling light. For a moment we paused on the threshold, blinking owlishly. Then, "'Good heavens!' I exclaimed. "'For God's sake!' came Ellis's rejoinder. "'Eh bien, I rather think it is the devils,' Jules de Grandin murmured. The room before us was a chaos of confusion, as though its contents had been stirred with a monster spoon in the hands of a maliciously mischievous giant. Furniture was overturned. Some of the chair covers had been ripped open, as though a ruthless, hurrying searcher had cut the upholstery in search of hidden valuables. Pictures hung crazily upon the walls. In the middle of the study, beneath the glare of a cluster of electric lights, stood a heavy oaken table and on it lay a mummy case stripped of its cover. A slender, china-tea-colored form, swathed in criss-crossed linen bandages, reclining on the table by the case. Close to the baseboard of the wall, beneath the window, crouched a grotesque, unhuman thing, resembling a farmer's cast-off scarecrow or a hopelessly outmoded tailor's dummy. We had to look a second time and strain our unbelieving eyes, before we recognized Professor Larson in the crumpled form. Stepping daintily as a cat on a shower-splashed pavement, de Grandin crossed the room and sank to one knee beside the huddled form, drawing his right glove off as he knelt. Is... is he... Ellis whispered hoarsely, halting at the word of which laymen seemed to have a superstitious fear. Dead? de Grandin supplied. Mais oui, monsieur, like a herring. "'But he has not been so long. 
No, I should hazard a guess that he was still living when we left the house to come here. But isn't there something we can do? There must be something, Ellis asked tremulously. But certainly, we can call the coroner, de Gronda answered. Meanwhile, we might examine this. He nodded toward the mummy lying on the table. Ellis's humane concern for his dead colleague dropped from him like a worn-out garment as he turned toward the ancient relic, the man eclipsed completely by the anthropologist. Beautiful, superb, he murmured ecstatically as he gazed at the unlovely thing. See, there's no face mask or funerary statue, either on the mummy or the case. Fifth dynasty work, as sure as you're alive. And the case is, I say, do you see it? He broke off, pointing excitedly at the open cedar coffin. See it, but certainly, de Gronda answered sharply. But what is it you find extraordinary, if one may ask? Why, don't you see? There's not a line of writing on that mummy case. The Egyptians always wrote the titles and biographies of the dead upon their coffins. But this one is just bare virgin wood, see? He leant over and tapped the thin, hard shell of cedar. There's never been a bit of paint or varnish on it. No wonder Larson kept it to himself. Why, there's never been a thing like this discovered since Egyptology became a science. De Grandin's glance had wandered from the coffin to the mummy. Now he brushed past Ellis with his quick, cat-like step and bent above the bandaged form. The Egyptology I do not know so well, he admitted. But medicine I know perfectly. What do you make of this, eh? Huh? His slender forefinger rested for a moment on the linen bands encircling the desiccated figure's left pectoral region. I started at the words. There was no doubt about it. The left breast, even beneath the mummy bands, was considerably lower than the right. And faintly, but perceptibly, through the tightly bound linen there showed the faintest trace of brown-red stain. There was no mistaking it. Every surgeon, soldier, and embalmer knows that tell-tale stain at sight. Professor Ellis's eyes opened till they were nearly as wide as de Grandin's. Blood? he exclaimed in a muted voice. Good Lord! Then, but it can't be blood. It simply can't, you know. Mummies were eviscerated and pickled in natron before desiccation. There's no possibility of any blood being left in the body. Oh, no! The Frenchman's interruption was charged with sarcasm. Nevertheless, monsieur, de Grandin is too old a fox to be instructed in the art of sucking eggs. Friend Trowbridge, he turned to me, how long have you been dealing pills to those afflicted with bellyache? Why, I answered wonderingly, about forty years, but no buts, my friend. Can you or can you not recognize a blood stain when you see it? Of course, but what then is this? if you will kindly tell us. Why, blood, of course, anyone can tell that. Precisément, it is blood, Monsieur Ellis. The good and most reliable Dr. Trowbridge corroborates me. Now let us examine the coffin of this so remarkable mummy, which, despite your pickling in natron and your desiccation, can still shed blood. With a wave of his hand he indicated the case of plain, unvarnished cedar wood. By George! This is unusual, too, Ellis cried, bending above the coffin. Do you see? What? I queried, for his eyes were shining with excitement as he gazed into the violated casket. Why, the way the thing's fastened! Most mummy case lids are held in place by four little flanges, two on each side, which sink into mortises cut in the lower section and held in place by hardwood dowels. This has eight, three on each side and one at each end. Hmm, they must have wanted to make sure whoever was put in there couldn't break loose. And, great Scott, will you look there? Excitedly, he pointed to the bottom of the case. Once more, I looked my wonderment. The abnormalities which struck his practiced eye were quite invisible to me. See how they've lined the case with spices? I've opened several hundred mummy cases, but I never saw that before. As he had said, the entire bottom of the coffin was strewn with loose spices, to a depth of four inches or so. The aromatics had crumbled to a fine powder, but the mingled clove and cinnamon, aloes and thyme, gave off a pungent, almost suffocating aroma as we bent above the bathtub-like coffin. 
De Grandin's small blue eyes were very round and bright as he glanced quickly from me to Ellis, then back again. I damn think this explains it, he announced. Unless I am much more mistaken than I think I am, this body was never a mummy, at least not such a mummy as the old embalmers customarily produced. Will you assist me? He bowed invitingly to Ellis, placing his hands beneath the mummy's shoulders at the same time. Take the feet, if you please, monsieur, he bade, and lift it gently, gently, if you please. It must be put exactly where it was until the coroner has viewed the room. They raised the bandaged form six inches or so above the table, then set it down again, and astonishment was written on their faces as they finished. What is it? I asked, completely mystified by their glances of mutual understanding. It weighs, began de Grandin, and sixty pounds at least, completed Ellis. Well, well be everlastingly consigned to Satan's lowest sub-cellar, rejoined the little Frenchman sharply. It is not well at all, my friend. It is completely otherwise. You know your physiology. You know that sixty percent or more of us is water, simply H2O, such as is found in rivers and on the tables of Americans in lieu of decent wine. Mummification is dehydration. The watery contents of the body is removed and nothing left but bone and desiccated flesh, a scant forty percent of the body's weight in life. This body is a small one. In life it could have weighed scarcely a hundred pounds, yet... Why then... It must have been only partially mummified, I interrupted. But he cut in with, Or oh, not at all, my friend. I damn think that we shall find some interesting disclosures when these wrappings are removed. A bleeding mummy, and a mummy which weighs more than half its lifetime weight. Yes, the probabilities of a surprise are great, or I am more mistaken than I think. Meantime, he turned toward the door, There is the routine of the law to be complied with. The coroner must be told of Monsieur Larson's death, and there is no need for us to burn these lights while we are waiting. Bowing politely to us to precede him, he switched off the study lights before closing the door and followed us to the lower hall where the telephone was located. I simply can't imagine how it happened, Professor Ellis murmured, striding nervously across his late colleague's drawing room while we awaited the advent of the coroner. Larson seemed in the pink of condition this afternoon, and, good Lord, what's that? The sound of a terrific struggle, like that of two men locked in a death grip, echoed through the quiet house. Thump, thump, thump. Heavy pounding footsteps banged upon the floor above our heads. Then, crash, came a smashing impact, as of overturning furniture a momentary pause, a strident scream, and the sudden crescendo of a wild, discordant laugh. Then silence once again. "'Good heavens!' I exclaimed, panic grasping at my throat. "'Why, it's directly overhead, in the study where we left the mummy, and—' "'Impossible!' Professor Ellis contradicted. "'Nobody could have gotten past us to that room, and—' "'Impossible or not, friend Trowbridge speaks the truth, by damn!' The little Frenchman shouted, springing from his chair and racing toward the stairs. En avant, mes enfants, follow me. Three steps at a stride, he mounted headlong up the stairway, paused a moment at the closed door of the study while he whipped a pistol from his pocket. Then his weapon swinging in a circle before him, advanced with a quick leap, snapped on the lights and, Hands up! he shouted warningly. A single offer of resistance and you breakfast with the devil in the morning. Grand Dieu, my friends! Behold! Save that one or two chairs had been overset, the room was just as we had left it. Upon the table lay the supine bandaged mummy, its spice-filled case uncovered by its side. The thing which had been Larson crouched shoulders to the wall, as though stricken in an attempt to turn a somersault, the window blind flapped cracklingly in the chilling winter wind. The window! It's open, cried Professor Ellis. It was closed when we were here, but... Dear, 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 does one not know it? De Grandin interrupted angrily, striding toward the open casement. Parbleu, the way in which you pounce upon the obvious is greatly trying to my nerves, friend Ellis, and... Ah? Uh? Ah? Uh? 
One sees, one perceives, one understands. Almost. Abreast of him, we gazed across the sill, and, obedient to the mute command of his pointing finger, looked at the snow-encrusted roof of the first-floor bay window which joined the house wall, something like two feet below the study window. Gouged in the dead-white veneer of snow were four long parallel streaks, exposing the slate beneath. Hmm, he murmured, lowering the sash and turning toward the door. The mystery is in part explained, my friends. That window, it would be the logical place for a burglar to force entry, he added as we trooped down the stairs. The roof of the bay window has but very little slope, and stands directly underneath the window of Professor Larson's study. One bent on burglary could hardly fail to note its possibilities as an aid to crime, and the fact that we had light going only in the downstairs room was noticed to the world that the upper story was untenanted. So, quite so, but there wasn't any burglar there, Ellis interrupted practically. De Grandin favoured him with such a stare as a teacher might bestow on a more than ordinarily dull pupil. One quite agrees, mon ami, he replied. However, if you will have the exceeding goodness to restrain your curiosity and conversation for a time, it may be we shall find that which we seek. The dark, hunched-up object showed with startling vividness against the background of the snow-powdered lawn as we descended from the porch. De Grandin knelt beside it and struck a match to aid in his inspection. It was a ragged, unkempt figure, unwashed, unshaven, a typical low-class sneak thief who had varied his customary sorry trade with an excursion into the higher profession of housebreaking, with disastrous results to himself. He crouched as he had fallen from the bay window's sloping roof, one arm twisted underneath him, his head bent oddly to one side, his battered, age-discolored hat mashed in at the crown and driven comically down upon his head till his ears were bent beneath it. Little loads of sleety snow had lodged within the wrinkles of his ragged coat, and tiny threads of icicles had formed on his moustache. The man was dead, no doubt of it. Not one, not even the most accomplished contortionist, could twist his neck at that sharp angle. And the manner of his death was obvious. Frightened at the sight of the mummy, the poor fellow had endeavoured to effect a hasty exit by the open window, had slipped upon the sleet-glazed roof of the bay window and fallen to the ground, striking head first and skidding forward with his full weight on his twisted neck. I voiced my conclusions hastily, but de Grandin shook a puzzled head. One understands the manner of his death, he answered thoughtfully. But the reason, that is something else again. We can well think that such a creature would have a paralyzing fear when he beheld the mummy stretched upon the table, but that does not explain the antics he went through before he fell, or jumped back through the window he had forced. We heard him thrash about. We heard him kick the furniture. We heard him scream with mirthless laughter. For why? Frightened men may scream. They sometimes even laugh hysterically. But what was there for him to wrestle with? That's just what Larson did, Professor Ellis put in hastily. Don't you remember? Exactement, the Frenchman answered with a puzzled frown. Professor Larson cries aloud and fights, with nothing. This luckless burglar breaks into the very room where Monsieur Larson died so strange a death, and he too wrestles with the empty air, and falls to death while laughing hideously. There is something very devilish here, my friends. When we had gone back in the house, young Ellis looked at us with something very near to panic in his eyes. "'You say that we must leave that mummy as it is until the coroner has seen it?' he demanded. "'Your understanding is correct, my friend,' de Grandin answered. "'All right. We'll leave the damn thing here, but just as soon as Mr. Martin has finished with it, I think we'd better take it out and burn it.' "'Eh? What is it that you say? Burn it, monsieur?' de Grandin asked. "'Just that.' It's what the Egyptologists call an unlucky mummy, and the sooner we get rid of it, the healthier it'll be for all of us, I'm thinking. See here. He glanced quickly upward, as though fearing a renewed outbreak in the room above, then turned again to us. Do you recall the series of fatalities following Tutankhamun's exhumation? 
De Grandin made no answer, but the fixed, unwinking stare he leveled on the speaker, and the nervous way his trimly waxed moustache quivered at the corners of his mouth, betrayed his interest. Ellis hurried on. Call it nonsense, if you will, and you probably will. But the fact is, there seems something in this talk of the ancient gods of Egypt having power to curse those disturbing the mummies of people dying in apostasy. You know, I assume, that there are certain mummies known as unlucky, unlucky for those who find them or have anything to do with them. Tutankhamun is probably the latest, as well as the most outstanding example of this class. He was a heretic in his day, and had offended the old ones or their priests, which amounted to the same thing. So when he died, they buried him with elaborate ceremonies, but set no image of Amun-Ra at the bow of the boat which carried him across the Lake of the Dead and the plaques of Tem, Seb, Nephthys, Osiris, and Isis were not prepared to go with him into the tomb. Tutankhamun, notwithstanding his belated efforts at reconciliation with the priesthood, was little better than an atheist, according to contemporary Egyptian belief, and the wrath of the gods went into the tomb with him. It was not their wish that his name be preserved to posterity, or that any of his relics be brought to light again. Now think what happened. When Lord Carnarvon located the tomb, he had four associates. Carnarvon and three of his helpers are dead today. Colonel Herbert and Dr. Evelyn White were among the first to go into Tut's tomb. Both died within a year. Sir Archibald Douglas was engaged to make an X-ray. He died almost before the plates could be developed. Six out of seven French journalists who went into the tomb shortly after it was opened died in less than a year and almost every workman engaged in the excavations died before he had a chance to spend his pay. Some of these men died one way, some another, but the point is, they all died. Not only that, even minor articles taken from the tomb seem to exercise a malign influence. There is absolute proof that attendants in the Cairo Museum, whose duties keep them near the Tutankhamun relics, sicken and die for no apparent reason. Do you wonder why they call him an unlucky mummy? Very good, monsieur. What then? de Grandin prompted as the other lapsed into a moody silence. Just this. That mummy case upstairs is bare of painting as the palm of your hand, and the orthodox Egyptians of the Fifth Dynasty would no more have thought of putting a body away without suitable biographical and religious writings on the coffin than the average American family today would think of holding a funeral without religious services of some sort. Further than that, the evidence points to that body's never having been embalmed at all. Apparently it was merely wrapped and put into a coffin with a layer of spices around it. Embalming had religious significance in ancient Egypt. If the flesh corrupted, the spirit could not return at the end of the prescribed cycle and reanimate it, and to be buried unembalmed was tantamount to a denial of immortality. This body had only the poorest makeshift attempt at preservation. It looks as though this person, whoever he was, died outside the religious pale, doesn't it? You make a strong case, monsieur, de Grandin nodded. But, all right, then look at the thing's history so far. Larson's workmen died while working in the tomb. How? By tomb spider bite. Bosh! A tomb spider is hardly more poisonous than our own garden spiders. I know, I've been bitten by the things and suffered less inconvenience than when a scorpion stung me in Yucatan. Then, on the passage down the Nile, most of the boat crew sickened, and some of them died with a strange fever. Yet they were hardy devils, used to the climate, and in all probability immune to anything in the way of illness the country could produce. Then Foster, Larson's assistant, pegged out just as they were setting sail from Egypt. Looks as though some evil influence was working, doesn't it? Now tonight, Larson was all ready to unwrap the mummy, but never got past taking it from the box. He's dead, dead like a herring, as you put it, and only God knows how he died. Right while we're waiting for the coroner to come, this poor devil of a burglar breaks into the house, fights with some unseen thing, just as Larson did, and dies. Say what you will. His voice rose almost to a scream. There's an aura of terrible misfortune round that mummy, and death is waiting for whoever ventures near it. De Grandin patted the waxed ends of his diminutive moustache affectionately. 
what you say may all be true, monsieur, he conceded. But the fact remains that both Dr. Trowbridge and I have been near the mummy, yet we were never better in our lives, though I could do nicely with a gulp or so of brandy at this time. Not only that, Professor Larson spent nearly his entire fortune and a considerable portion of the museum's funds in finding this so remarkable cadaver. It would be larceny, no less, for us to burn it, as you suggest. All right, Ellis answered with a note of finality in his voice. Have it your own way. As soon as the coroner's through with me, I'm going home. I wouldn't go near that cursed mummy again for a fortune. Hello, Dr. de Grandin, Coroner Martin greeted, stamping his feet and shaking the snow from his coat. Bad business, this, isn't it? Any idea as to the cause of death? The one outside unquestionably died from a broken neck, the Frenchman answered. As for Professor Larson's... Eh, the one outside? Mr. Martin interrupted. Are there two of them? Hmm. We're lucky there aren't five, Ellis cut in bitterly. They've been dying so fast we can't keep track of them since Larson started to unwrap that... One moment, if you please, monsieur. De Grandin interrupted as he raised a deprecating hand. Monsieur the coroner is a busy man and has his duties to perform. When they have been completed, I make no doubt he will be glad to listen to your interesting theories. At present, he bowed politely to the coroner. Will you come with us, monsieur? he asked. Count me out, said Ellis. I'll wait down here, and I want to warn you that... We never heard the warning he had for us. For de Grandin in the lead, we mounted the stairs to the study where Professor Larson and the mummy lay. Hmm, Mr. Martin, who in addition to being coroner was also the city's leading funeral director, surveyed the room with a quick, practiced glance. This looks almost as if... He strode across the room toward Larson's hunched-up body and extended one hand, but... Grand Dieu des cochons! Stand back, monsieur! De Grandin's shouted admonition halted Mr. Martin in mid-stride. Back, monsieur, back, friend Trowbridge, for your lives! Snatching me by the elbow and Mr. Martin by the skirt of his coat, he fairly dragged us from the room. What on earth? I began as we reached the hall, but he pushed us toward the stairway. Do not stand and parley, he commanded shortly. Out, out into the friendly cold while there is still time, my friends. Pardieu, I see it now. Monsieur Ellis has right, that mummy. Oh, oh, oh! The sudden cry came to us from the floor below, followed by the sound of scuffling, as though Ellis and another were struggling madly. Then came an awful, marrow-freezing laugh, shrill, mirthless, sardonic. Son du diable, it has him! de Grandin shouted as he rushed madly toward the stair, leaped to the balustrade, and shot downward like a meteor. Coroner Martin and I followed sedately, and found the Frenchman standing mute and breathless at the entrance of the drawing-room, his thin red lips pursed, as though emitting a soundless whistle. Professor Larson's parlor was furnished in the formal, stilted style so popular in the late years of the last century. Light chairs and couches of gilded wood upholstered in apple-green satin, a glass-doored cabinet for bric-a-brac, a pair of delicate spindle-legged tables adorned with bits of Dresden china. The furniture had been tossed about the room, the light gray velvet rug turned up, the china cabinet smashed and flung upon its side. In the midst of the confusion, Ellis lay, his hands clenched at his sides, his knees drawn up his lips retracted in a grim, sardonic grin. Good God! Coroner Martin viewed the poor tensed body with staring eyes. This is dreadful. Could you, it will be more so if we linger here, de Grandin cried. Outside, my friends, do not wait to take your coats or hats. Come out at once. I tell you, death is lurking in each shadow of this cursed place. He herded us before him from the house, and bade us stand a moment, hatless and coatless in the chilling wind. I say, I protested through chattering teeth, this is carrying a joke too far to Grandin. There's no need to joke, he echoed sharply. 
Do you consider it a joke that Professor Larson died the way he did tonight? That the misguided burglar perished in the same way? That even now the poor young Ellis lies all stiff and dead inside that cursed hellhole of a house? Your sense of humor is peculiar, my friend. What was it? Coroner Martin asked practically. Was there some infection in the house that made Professor Ellis scream like that before he died? Or was it... Tell me, monsieur, de Grandin interrupted. Have you facilities for fumigation at your mortuary? Of course, the coroner returned wonderingly. We've apparatus for making both formaldehyde and cyanogen gas, depending on the class of fumigation required, but... Very good. Be so good as to hasten to your place of business and return as quickly as may be with materiel for cyanogen fumigation. I shall await you here. Make haste, monsieur. This matter is of utmost urgency, I assure you. While Mr. Martin was obtaining the apparatus for fumigation, de Grandin and I hastened to my house, procured fresh outdoor clothing, and retraced our steps. Though I made several attempts to discover what he had found at Larson's, his only answers were impatient shrugs and half-articulate exclamations, and I finally gave over the attempt, knowing he would explain in detail when he thought it proper. Hands deep in pockets, heads drawn well down into our collars, we waited for the coroner's return. With the deftness of long practice, Mr. Martin's assistants set the tanks of mercuric cyanide in place at the front and back doors of the Larson house, ran rubber hose from them to the keyholes, and lighted spirit lamps beneath them. When Mr. Martin suggested that the bodies be removed before fumigation began, de Grandin shook his head decidedly. It would be death, or most unnecessary risk of death at best, to permit your men to enter till the gas has had at least a day to work within the house he answered. But those bodies should be cared for, the coroner contended, speaking from the professional knowledge of one who had practiced mortuary science for more than twenty years. They will undergo no putrefactive changes worthy of account, the Frenchman answered. The gas will act to some extent as a preservative, and the risk to be avoided is worth the trouble. As Coroner Martin was about to counter, he continued, Demonstration outweighs explanation ten to one, my friend. Permit that I should have my way, and by this time tomorrow night you will be convinced of the good foundation for my seeming stubbornness. Shortly after eight o'clock the following evening, we met once more at Larson's house, and as calmly as though such crazy actions were an everyday affair with him, de Grandin smashed window after window with his walking stick and bade us wait outside for upward of a quarter hour. At last, I think that it is safe to enter now, he said. The gas should be dispelled. Come, let us go in. We tiptoed down the hall to the drawing room where Professor Ellis lay, and de Grandin turned on every available light before entering the room. Beside the young man's rigid body he went to his knees, and seemed to be examining the floor with minutest care. "'Whatever are you doing?' I began, when— "'Triomphe, I have found him,' he announced. "'Come and see.' We crossed the room and stared in wonder at the tiny object which he held between the thumb and finger of his gloved right hand. It was a tiny ball-like thing, scarcely larger than a dried bean, a little hairy spider with a black body striped about the abdomen with lines of vivid vermilion. "'You observe him?' he asked simply. "'Was I not wise to order our retreat last night?' "'What is the thing?' I demanded. "'It's harmless-looking enough, but, eh bien, there is a very great but there, my friend,' he retorted with a mirthless smile. "'You saw what had been Monsieur Larson. You looked upon the poor, new-dead young Ellis. This, this little, seemingly so harmless thing it was, which killed them. It is a catipo or Latrodectus nacelti, the deadliest spider in the world. Even the cobra's bite is but a sweetheart's kiss beside the sting of this so small deadly thing. Those bit by him are seized immediately with convulsions. They beat the air, they stumble, and they whirl. At length they give vent to a dreadful scream, which simulates a laugh. And then they fall and die. 
Does not that make it clear? The wholly irrational antics performed by Professor Larson ere he died could be explained in no sane manner. They puzzled me. I was not willing to accept Professor Ellis's theory that the mummy was unlucky, although, as the good God knows, it proved so for him. However, that Professor Larson was entirely dead could not be doubted, nor could one readily assign a reason for his death. Tiens, in such a case the coroner must be called. And so we telephoned for Monsieur Martin. Meantime, as we sat waiting in this room, a poor half-starving devil of a man decided he would break into the house and steal whatever he could find. He mounted the bay window's roof, and, guided by his evil star, set foot inside the chamber where the mummy and Professor Larson lay. We heard him trample on the floor. We heard him give that dreadful laughing scream. We searched for him, and found him dead upon the lawn. Very good. In due time, Monsieur Martin comes. We lead him to the place where Monsieur Larson is, and as we go into the room I chance to look into the spices strewn about the bottom of that mummy case. Huh? What is it that I see? Pablo, I see a movement. Spices do not move, my friend, except they be blown on by the wind, and there is no wind in that room. Moreover, spices are not jetty black with bands of red about their bellies. No, pardieu, but certain spiders are. I see him, and I know him. In the eastern islands, in Java, in Australia, I have seen him, and I have also seen his deadly work. He is the Latrodectus nacelti, called Catipo by the natives, and his bite is almost instant and most painful death. More those bitten by him dance about insanely with a sort of frantic seizure. They laugh, but not with happiness. They scream with mirthless laughter. Then they die. I did not wish to dance and laugh and die, my friends. I did not wish that you should do so either. There was no time for talk or explanation. Our only safety lay in flight, for they are tropic things, those spiders, and once we were outside the cold would kill them. I was about to call a warning to Monsieur Ellis too, but I was, alas, too late. Beyond a doubt one of the spiders had fastened on his clothing while he bent over to inspect that mummy case. The insect clung to him when he left the room, and while he waited downstairs for us it crawled until it came in contact with his naked skin. Then, angered, it may be, by some movement which he made, it bit him, and he died. When I saw him lying here upon the floor I took incontinently to flight. Jules de Grandin is no coward, but who could say how many of those cursed spiders had crawled from the mummy case and found hiding places in the shadows, even in our clothing, as in the case of Monsieur Ellis. To stay here was to court a quick and highly disagreeable death. Accordingly I rushed you out into the storm, and asked Monsieur Martin to provide fumigation for the house forthwith. Now, since the cyanogen gas has killed every living thing inside this house, it is safe for us to enter. The bodies may safely be taken away by your assistance at any time, monsieur. He finished with a bow to Mr. Martin. Eh bien, were he but here, we could set poor Monsieur Ellis's mind at rest concerning many things, de Grandin murmured as we drove toward my house. He could not understand how Professor Larson's servants died by spider bite, since the Egyptian tomb spider is known to be innocuous, or nearly so. The answer now is obvious. In some way which we do not understand, a number of those poisonous black spiders found their way into that mummy case. They are terrestrial in their habits, living in the earth and going forth by night. Light irritates them, and when the workmen brought their torches into the tomb, they showed their annoyance by biting them. Death, accompanied by convulsions, followed, and because the small black spiders were invisible in the shadows, the harmless tomb spiders received the blame. Some few of the black spiders came overseas with Professor Larson. When he pried the lid from that mummy case, perhaps when he thrust his hand into the scattered spices to lift the mummy out, they fastened on him, bit him, killed him. You apprehend? Hmm, it sounds logical enough. I answered thoughtfully. But have you any idea how those spices came in that coffin? Poor Ellis seemed to think we'd hit on something extraordinary when he saw them. But he's gone now, and... Great Scott, de Grandin, do you suppose those old Egyptian priests could have planted spider eggs in the spices, hoping they would hatch eventually, 
so that whoever molested the body in years to come would stand a chance of being bitten and killed? For a moment he drummed soundlessly with gloved fingers on the silver head of his stick. At length, My friend, you interest me, he declared solemnly. I do not know that what you say is probable, but the manner of that mummy's preparation is unusual. I think we owe it as a debt to poor dead Ellis to look into the matter thoroughly. Look into it? How? Tomorrow we shall unwrap the body, he responded, as casually as though unshrouding centuries-old dead Egyptians were an everyday activity with us. If we can find some explanation hidden in the mummy clothes, well and good. If we do not, eh bien, the dead have spoken before, why not again? The dead have spoken? I echoed slowly, incredulously. What in the world? Not in this world, precisely, he interrupted with the shadow of a smile. But there are those who look behind the veil, which separates us from the ones we call the dead, my friend. We shall try other methods first, those failing. He recommenced his drumming on the handle of his cane, humming softly. Sacré de nom, ron, ron et ron, la vie est brève, la nuit est longue. Next evening we unwrapped the mummy. It was an oddly assorted group which gathered in the basement of Harrisonville Museum to denude the ancient dead of its cerements. Hodgson, the assistant curator of the Department of Archaeology, a slender little man in gold-bowed rimless spectacles, bald to the ears and much addicted to the habit of buttoning and unbuttoning his primly untidy double-breasted jacket, stood by in a state of twittering nervousness as de Grandin set to work. "'Who sups with the devil needs a long spoon?' the little Frenchman quoted with a smile, as he drew a pair of heavy rubber gloves on his hands, before taking up his scissors and snipping one of the criss-crossed linen bands with which the body was tightly wrapped. I do not greatly fear that any of those small black imps of hell survived Monsieur Martin's gas, he added, laying back a fold of yellowed linen. But it is well to be prepared. The cemeteries are full to overflowing with those who have thought otherwise. Yard after endless yard of linen he reeled off, coming at length to a strong, seamless shroud drawn sackwise over the body and tied at the feet with a stout cord. The cloth of which the sack was made seemed stronger and heavier than the bandages, and was thickly coated with wax or some serratious substance, the whole being apparently air-tight and water-tight. Why, bless my soul, I never saw anything like this before, stammered Dr. Hodgson, leaning forward across de Grandin's shoulder to stare curiously at the inner shroud. So much we gathered from Monsieur Ellis before— when he first viewed this body, de Grandin answered dryly, and Professor Hodgson retreated with an odd little squeaking exclamation, for all the world like that of an intimidated mouse. Salash, the Frenchman whispered softly, his contempt of Hodgson's cowardice written plainly on his face. Then, as he cut the binding string away and began twitching the waxed shroud upward from the mummy's shoulders, Ah? Uh -huh. Ah, ha, ha, que diable! The body brought to view beneath the blue-white glare of the electric bulbs was not technically a mummy. Though the aromatic spices and the sterile, arid atmosphere of Egypt had combined to keep it in a state of most unusual preservation, the feet, first parts to be exposed, were small and beautifully formed, with long straight toes and narrow heels, the digits and soles, as well as the whole planter region, stained brilliant red. There was surprisingly little desiccation, and though the terminal tendons of the brevis digitorum showed prominently through the skin, the effect was by no means revolting. I had seen equal prominence of flexor muscles in living feet where the patient had suffered considerable emaciation. The ankles were sharp and shapely, the legs straight and well turned, with the leanness of youth, rather than the wasted look of death. The hips were narrow, the waist slender, and the gentle swelling bosoms high and sharp. Making allowance for the early age at which women of the Orient mature, I should have said the girl died somewhere in her middle teens, certainly well under twenty. 
Huh? De Grandin murmured, as the waxed sack slid over the body's shoulders. I think that here we have the explanation of those stains, friend Trowbridge, Nispa. I looked and gulped back an exclamation of horrified amazement. The slim tapering arms had been folded on the breast in accordance with the Egyptian custom, but the humerus of the left arm had been cruelly crushed, a compound comminutive fracture having resulted so that a quarter inch or more of splintered bone thrust through the skin, above and below the deltoid attachment. Not only this, the same blow which had crushed the arm had smashed the bony structure of the chest, the third and fourth left ribs being snapped in two, and through the smooth skin underneath the breast a prong of jagged bone protruded. A hemorrhage of considerable extent had followed, and the long-dried blood lay upon the body from left breast to hip in a dull brown-red veneer. Waxed though the mummy sack had been, the welling blood had found its way through some break in the coating, and soaked the tightly knotted outer bandages, and borne mute testimony of an ancient tragedy. The finely cut features were those of a woman in her early youth. Semitic in their cast, they had a delicacy of line and contour which bespoke patrician breeding. The nose was small, slightly aquiline, high-bridged, with narrow nostrils. The lips were thin and sensitive, and where they had retracted in the process of partial desiccation showed small sharp teeth of startling whiteness. The hair was black and lustrous, cut short off at the ears, like the modern Dutch bob affected by young women parted in the middle and bound about the brows with a circlet of hammered gold set with small studs of lapis lazuli. For the rest, a triple-stranded necklace of gold and blue enamel, armlets of the same design and a narrow golden girdle fashioned like a snake, composed the dead girl's costume. Originally a full plaited skirt of sheer white linen had been appended to the girdle, but the fragile fabric had not withstood the years of waiting in the grave and only one or two thin wisps of it remained. "'La pauvre!' exclaimed the Frenchman, gazing sadly at the broken little body. "'I think, my friends, that we see here a demonstration of that ancient saying that the blood of innocence cannot be concealed. Unless I am more wrong than I admit, this is a case of murder, and—' "'But it might as well have been an accident,' I cut in. I've seen such injuries in motor wrecks, and this poor child might have been the victim of a chariot smash-up. I do not think so, he returned. This case has all the marks of ritual murder, my friend. Observe the— I think we'd better wrap the body up again, Hodgson broke in hastily. We've gone as far as we can tonight, and, well, I'm rather tired, gentlemen, and if you don't mind, we'll call the session off. He coughed apologetically. But there was the mild determination of weak men who have authority to make their wishes law in his manner as he spoke. You mean that you're afraid of something that might happen? De Grandin countered bluntly. You fear the ancient gods may take offense at our remaining here to speculate on the manner of this poor one's death. Well, Hodgson took his glasses off and wiped them nervously. Of course, I don't believe those stories that they tell of these unlucky mummies, but you're bound to admit there have been some unexplained fatalities connected with this case. Besides, well, frankly, gentlemen, this body's less a mummy than a corpse, and I have a terrible aversion to being around the dead, unless they've been mummified. De Grandin smiled sarcastically. The old-time fears die hard, he assented. Nevertheless, monsieur, we shall respect your sensibilities. You have been most kind, and we would not try your nerves still further. Tomorrow, if you do not mind, we shall pursue our researches. It may be possible that we shall discover something hitherto unknown about the rites and ceremonies of those old ones who ruled the world when Rome had scarce been thought of. Yes, yes, of course, Hodgson coughed as he edged near the door. I'm sure I shall be happy to give you a pass to the museum tomorrow, only, he added as an afterthought, I must ask that you refrain from mutilating the body in any way. It belongs to the museum, you know, and I simply cannot give permission for an autopsy. More bleu, but you are the shrewd guesser, monsieur, de Grandin answered with a laugh. 
I think you must have read intention in my eyes. Very well, we consent. There shall be no post-mortem of the body made. Bonsoir, monsieur. I'm sorry, Dr. de Grandin, Hodgson greeted us the next morning, but I'm afraid you'll not be able to pursue any further investigations with the mummy, uh, the body, I mean, we unwrapped last night. The little Frenchman stiffened in both body and manner. You mean that you have altered your decision, monsieur? he asked with cold politeness. Not at all. I mean the body's disintegrated with exposure to the air, and only a few wisps of hair, the skull, and some unarticulated bones remain. While they weren't quite airtight, the bandages and the wax-coated shrouds seem to have been able to keep the flesh intact, but exposure to our damp atmosphere has reduced them to a heap of bone and dust. Hmm, the Frenchman answered. That is unfortunate, but not irreparable. I think our chance of finding out the cause and manner of the poor young lady's death is not yet gone. Would you be good enough to lend us the ornaments, some of the mummy cloth and several of the bones, monsieur? We guarantee their safe return. Well, Hodgson hesitated momentarily. It's not quite regular, but if you're sure you will return them, monsieur. De Grandin's voice broke sharply through the curator's apologetic half-refusal. I am Jules de Grandin. I am not accustomed to having my good faith assailed. No matter. The experiment which I have in mind will not take long, and you are welcome to accompany us. Thus you need never have the relics out of sight at any time. Will that assure you of their safe return? Hodgson undid the buttons of his jacket, then did them up again. Oh, don't think I was doubting your bona fides, he returned. But this body cost the museum a considerable sum, and was the indirect cause of our losing two valuable members of the staff. I'm personally responsible for it, and— No matter, de Grandin interrupted. If you will come with us, I can assure you that the articles will be within your sight at all times, and you may have them back again this morning. Accordingly, Hodgson superintending fussily, we selected the gold and lapis lazuli diadem, the broken humerus, one of the fractured ribs, and several lengths of mummy cloth which bore the dull red blood stains, and thrust them into a travelling bag. De Grandin paused to call a number on the phone, talked for a moment in a muted tone, then directed me to an address in Scotland Road. Half an hour's drive through the brisk winter air brought us to a substantial brownstone-fronted residence in the decaying but still eminently respectable neighborhood. Lace curtains hung at the tall windows of the first floor, and the windows of the basement dining room were neatly draped with scrim. Beside the carefully polished bell-pull, a brass plate with the legend, Creighton, Clairvoyant, was set. A neat maid in black-and-white uniform responded to de Grandin's ring, and led us to a drawing-room rather over-furnished with heavy pieces of the style popular in the middle nineties. "'Mrs. Creighton will be down immediately, sir. She's expecting you,' she told him as she left the room. My experience with those who claim ability to look beyond the veil was limited, but I had always imagined that they set their stages more effectively than this. The carpet, patterned with impossible roses large as cabbages, the heavy and not especially comfortable golden oak chairs upholstered in green plush, the stereotyped oil paintings of the Grand Canal, of Capri by moonlight and Vesuvius in action, were pragmatic as a plate of prunes, and might have been duplicated, item by item, in the parlor of half a hundred non-fashionable but respectable boarding-houses. Even the faint aroma of cooking food, which wafted up to us from the downstairs kitchen, had a reassuring and worldly tang, which seemed entirely out of harmony with the ghostly calling of our hostess. Madame Creighton fitted her surroundings perfectly. She was short, stout, and matronly, and her high-necked white linen blouse and plain blue skirts were far more typical of the busy middle-class housewife than of the self-admitted medium. Her eyes, brown and bright, shone pleasantly behind the lenses of neat, rimless spectacles. Her hair, already shot with grey, was drawn tightly back from her forehead, and twisted in a commonplace knot above her occiput. 
Even her hands were plump, short-fingered, slightly work-worn, and wholly commonplace. Nowhere was there any indication of the psychic in her dress, face, form, or manner. You brought the things? she asked de Grandin when introductions were completed. Nodding, he placed the relics on the oaken table beside which she was seated. These were discovered, he began, but she raised her hand in warning. Please don't tell me anything about them, she requested. I'd rather my controls did all that, for one never can be sure how much information secured while one is conscious may be carried over into the subconscious while the trance is on, you know. Opening a drawer in the table, she took out a hinged double slate and a box of thin white chalk. Will you hold this, Dr. Trowbridge? she asked, handing me the slate. Take it in both hands and hold it in your lap. Please don't move it or attempt to speak to me until I tell you. Awkwardly, I took the blank-faced slate and balanced it on my knees, while Mrs. Creighton drew a small crystal ball from a little green felt bag, placed it on the table between the broken arm bone and the fractured rib, then, with a snap of the switch, set an electric light in a gooseneck fixture standing on the table aglow. The luminance from the glowing bulb shone directly on the crystal sphere, causing it to glow as though with inward fire. For a little time, two minutes, perhaps, she gazed intently at the glass ball. Then her eyes closed, and her head, resting easily against the crocheted doily on the back of her rocking chair, moved a little sideways as her neck muscles relaxed. For a moment she rested thus, her regular breathing only slightly audible. Suddenly, astonishingly, I heard a movement of the chalk between the slates. I had not moved or tilted them. There was no chance the little pencil could have rolled. Yet unquestionably the thing was moving. Now I distinctly felt it as it traveled slowly back and forth across the tightly folded leaves of the slate, gradually increasing its speed till it seemed like a panic-stricken prisoned thing rushing wildly round its dungeon in search of escape. I had a momentary wild, unreasoning desire to fling that haunted slate away from me and rush out of that stuffy room. But pride held me in my chair. Pride made me grip those slates as a drowning man might grip a rope. Pride kept my gaze resolutely on Mrs. Creighton, and off of the uncanny thing which balanced on my knees. I could hear de Grandin breathing quickly, hear Hodgson moving restlessly in his chair, clearing his throat and, I knew this without looking, buttoning and unbuttoning his coat. Mrs. Creighton's sleep became troubled. Her head rolled slowly, fretfully from side to side, and her breathing became stertorous. Once or twice she gave vent to a feeble moan, finally the groaning, choking cry of a sleeper in a nightmare. Her smooth, plump hands clenched nervously and doubled into fists. Her arms and legs twitched tremblingly. At length she straightened stiffly in her chair, rigid as though shocked by a galvanic battery, and from her parted lips there came a muffled, strangling cry of horror. Little flecks of foam formed at the corners of her mouth. She arched her body upward, then sank back with a low, despairing whimper, and her firm chin sagged down toward her breast. I knew the symptoms. No medical practitioner can fail to recognize those signs. Madame, de Grandin cried, rising from his chair and rushing to her side. You are unwell. You suffer. She struggled to a sitting posture, her brown eyes bulging as though a savage hand were on her throat, her face contorted with some dreadful fear. For a moment she sat thus. Then with a shake of her head she straightened, smoothed her hair, and asked matter-of-factly, Did I say anything? No, madame, you said nothing articulate, but you seemed in pain, so I awakened you. Oh, that's too bad, she answered with a smile. They tell me I often act that way when in a trance, but I never remember anything when I wake up, and I never seem any the worse because of anything I dream while I'm unconscious. If you had only waited, we might have had a message on the slate. We have, I interrupted. I heard the pencil writing like mad, and nearly threw the thing away. Oh, I'm so glad, responded Mrs. Creighton. Bring it over and we'll see what it says. The slate was covered with fine writing 
the minute characters, distinct as script etched on a copper plate, running from margin to margin, spaces between the lines so narrow as to be hardly recognizable. For a moment we studied the calligraphy in puzzled silence. Then, Mort de ma vie! We have triumphed over death and time, my friends! De Grandin cried excitedly. Attendez, s'il vous plaît! Opening the slates before him like a book, he read, Revered and awful judges of the world, ye awful ones who sit upon the parapets of hell, I answer guilty to the charge you bring against me. I, Atua, who now stands on the brink of deathless death, whose body waits the crushing stones of doom, whose spirit, robbed forever of the hope of fleshly tegument, must wander in a menti till the end of time has come, confesses that the fault was hers, and hers alone. Behold me, awesome judges of the living and the dead. Am I not a woman, and a woman shaped for love? Are not my members beautiful to see? My lips like apricots and pomegranates? My eyes like milk and beryl? My breasts like ivory set with coral? Yea, mighty ones, I am a woman, and a woman formed for joy. Was it my fault, or my volition, that I was pledged to serve the great all-mother Isis, or ever I had left the shelter of my mother's flesh? Did I abjure the blissful agony of love, and seek a life of sterile chastity? Or was the promise spoken for me by another's lips? I gave all that a woman has to give, and gave it freely. "'knowing that the pains of death and after death "'the torment of the gods awaited me. "'Nor do I deem the price too great to pay. "'Ye frown, ye shake your dreadful heads "'upon which rest the crowns of Amun and of Neph, "'of Seb and Tem, of Suti and Osiris's mighty self. "'Ye say that I speak sacrilege. "'Then hear me yet a while. "'She who stands in chains before ye, Shorn of reverence as a priestess of great mother Isis, shorn of all honor as a woman, tells ye these things to your teeth, knowing that ye cannot do her greater hurt than that she stands already judged to undergo. Your reign and that of those ye serve draws near its end. A little while ye yet may strut and preen yourselves, and mouth the judgments of your gods. But in the days that wait your very names shall be forgot, save when some stranger delves into your tombs and drags your violated bodies forth for men to make a show of. I and the very gods ye serve shall be forgotten. They shall sink so low that none shall call their names, not even as a curse, and in their ruined temples none shall do them reverence, and no living thing be found, save only the white-bellied lizard and the fearful jackal. And who shall do this thing? An offspring of the Hebrews. Yea, from the people ye despise a child shall spring, and great shall be his glory. He shall put down your gods beneath his feet, and spoil them of all glory and respect. They shall become but shadow gods of a forgotten past. My name ye've stricken from the roll of priestesses. No writing shall be graven on my tomb and I shall be forgotten for all time by gods and men. So reads your judgment. I give ye then the lie. Upon a day far in the future, strange men from a land across the sea shall open wide my tomb and take my body from it, nor shall my flesh taste of corruption until those strangers look upon my face and see my broken bones, and seeing, wonder how I died. And... I shall tell them. Yea, by Osiris's self I swear that though I have been dead for centuries, I shall relate the manner of my judgment and my death, and they shall know my name and weep for me, and on your heads they shall heap curses for this thing ye do to me. Pile now your stones of doom upon my breast, break my bones and the fevered beating of my heart. I go to death. But not from out the memory of men as ye shall go. I have spoken. Below the writing was a little scrawl of drawing, as crudely executed as a child's rough chalk sketch on a wall. 
Yet as we looked at it we seemed to see the outline of a woman held upon the ground by kneeling slaves, while a man above her poised a heavy rock to crush her exposed breast, and another stood in readiness to aid the executioner. Cordieu! de Grandin exclaimed as we gazed upon the drawing. I shall say she told the truth, my friends. She was a priestess of the goddess Isis, and as such was sworn to lifelong chastity, with awful death by torture as the penalty for violation of her vow. Undoubtlessly she loved not wisely, but too well, as women have been wont to love since time began, and upon discovery she was sentenced to the death decreed for those who did forget their obligations to the goddess. Her chest was broken in with stones, and without benefit of mummification her mutilated body was put in a casket void of any writing which might give a clue to her identity. Without a single invocation to the gods who held the fate of her poor spirit in their hands, they buried her. But did she triumph? Who says otherwise? We know her name, Atua. We know the reason and the manner of her death. But those old priests who judged her and decreed her doom, who knows their names? Yes, Pablo, who knows or cares a single solitary dam where their vile mummies lie? They're assuredly gone into oblivion, while she, tiens, at least she is a personality to us, and we are very much alive. Excuse me, gentlemen, if you're quite finished with these relics, I'll take them now, Professor Hodgson interrupted. This little seance has been interesting, but you must admit, nothing sufficiently authentic to be incorporated in our archives has been developed here. I fear we shall have to label these bones and ornaments as belonging to an unidentified body found by Dr. Larson at Naga Eddare. Now, if you don't mind, I shall get—get get anywhere you wish, monsieur, and get there quickly, de Grandin broke in furiously. You have presided over relics of the dead so long your brain is clogged with mummy dust. As for your heart, more d'un ramor, I do not think you have one. As for me, he added with a sudden smile, I return at once to Dr. Trowbridge's. This poor young lady's tragic fate affects me deeply, and unless some urgent business interferes, I plan to drown my sorrow. More bleu, I shall do more. Within the hour, I shall be most happily intoxicated. The Door to Yesterday Dinner would be ready in fifteen minutes, and we were to have lobster cardinal, a thing Jules de Grandin loved with a passion second only to his fervor for la Marseillaise. Now he was engaged in the rite of cocktail mixing, intent upon his work as any alchemist brewing an esoteric filter. Now for the vermouth? he announced, decanting a potion of amber liquid into the tall silver shaker half filled with gin and fine shaved ice, with all the care of a pharmacist compounding a prescription. One drop too little and the cocktail she is spoiled, one little so small drop too much, and she is wholly ruined. Ah, uh, so, she is now precisely perfect, and ready for the shaking. Slowly, Rhythmically he began to churn the shaker up and down, gradually increasing the speed in time with the bit of bawdy ballad which he hummed. Ma fille pour pénitence, ron, 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 petit patapon. Ma fille pour pénitence, nous nous embrasserons. Captain Chenevere, Mr. Gordon Goodlow, announced Nora McGuinness, my household factotum from the study doorway. "'annoyance at having strangers call when dinner was about to be served, "'showing on her broad Irish face. "'On the heels of her announcement came the callers, "'Captain Chenevere, a big, deep-chested young man, "'attired in that startling combination of light and dark blues "'in which the state of New Jersey garbs its gendarmerie, "'Mr. Goodlow, a dapper, slender little man, "'with neatly cropped white hair and short-clipped white moustache, "'immaculate in black mohair jacket and trousers, "'his small paunch trimly buttoned underneath a waistcoat of spotless linen. "'Sorry to interrupt you, gentlemen,' Captain Chenevere apologized. "'But there have been some things happening at Mr. Goodlow's place "'which no one can explain, "'and one of my men got talking with a member of your local force, "'Detective Sergeant Costello.' who said that Dr. de Grandin could get to the bottom of the trouble if anybody could. Eh? You say the good Costello sent you? 
de Grandin asked, giving the cocktail mixer a final vigorous shake. He should know better. Me, I am graduated from the Sûreté. I no longer take an interest in criminal investigation. We understood as much, the captain answered. That's why we're here. If it had been a matter of ordinary crime detection, or an extraordinary one, I think that we could handle it. But it's something more than that, sir. He paused and grinned rather sheepishly. Then, this may sound nutty to you, but I'm more than half convinced there's something supernatural about the case. Huh? De Grandin put the cocktail shaker by. Hmm? He flung a leg across the table corner, and half sitting, half standing, regarded the visitors in turn with a fixed, unwinking stare. Ah, uh huh This is of interest, he admitted, breaking open a blue packet of Maryland cigarettes and setting one of the malodorous things aglow. Proceed if you please, gentlemen. Like the ass of Monsieur Balaam, I am all ears. Mr. Goodlow answered, Last year my brother, Colonel Clark Clay Goodlow, sold his seat on the stock exchange and retired from active business, he began. For some years he'd contemplated returning to Kentucky, but when he finally gave up active trading in the market, he found that he'd become acclimated to the north. Reckon the poor fellow just couldn't bear to get more than an hour or two away from Wall Street, as a matter of fact. So he built himself a home near Keyport. He moved there with his daughter, Nancy, my niece, last April, and died before he'd been there quite a month. De Grandin's slender, jet-black eyebrows rose a fraction of an inch nearer the line of his honey-colored hair. Very good, monsieur, he answered querulously. Men have died before, men have been dying regularly, since Mother Eve and Father Adam partook of the forbidden fruit. What is there so extraordinary in this especial death? I didn't see my brother's body, Mr. Goodlow began. But I did, Captain Chenever broke in. Every bone, from skull to metatarsus, was broken, and the whole form was so hammered out of shape that identification was almost impossible. Huh? De Grandin's small blue eyes flickered with renewing interest. And then? Mr. Goodlow took up the narrative. My niece was almost prostrated by the tragedy— and as I was in England at the time, it was impossible for me to join her right away. Accordingly, Major Derringer, a rather distant kinsman, and his wife came up from Lexington to attend the funeral, and make such preliminary arrangements as were necessary until I could come home. The day following the funeral, Major Derringer was found on the identical spot where my brother's body was discovered, dead crushed and mauled, almost out of resemblance to anything human, Captain Chenever supplied. Mrs. Derringer was taken severely ill as a result of her husband's dreadful death, Mr. Goodlow added. She was put to bed with special nurses in attendance, day and night, and while the night nurse was out of the room for a moment, she rose and slipped through the window, wandered across the lawn in her night clothes, and— The thing was like an antiphon. De Grandin looked inquiringly at Captain Chenever as Mr. Goodlow paused, and the trooper nodded grimly. The same, he snapped. Same place, same dreadful mutilation, everything the same except— Yes, Pablo, except— De Grandin prompted sharply as the young policeman paused. Except that Mrs. Derringer had bled profusely where compound fractures of her ribs had forced the bones through her sides and on the tiled floor of the lodge near the spot where she was found was the trail of a great snake marked in blood. Good heavens! I exclaimed. By damn it! murmured Jules de Grandin. This is truly such a case as I delight in, monsieur le capitaine. If you gentlemen will be good enough to join us at dinner, I shall do myself the honor of accompanying you to this so strange house, where guests are found all crushed to death, and serpents write their autographs in blood. Yes, certainly, of course. Prospect Hill, the late Colonel Goodloe's house, was a reproduction of an English country seat done in the grand manner. Built upon a rise of ground, heading a little valley in the hills, it was a long, low, red-brick mansion flanked by towering oaks and chestnut trees. 
Leveled off before the house was a wide terrace paved with tessellated tiles and bordered by a stone balustrade punctuated at regular intervals by wide-mouthed urns of stone in which petunias blossomed riotously. A flight of broad low steps ran down through succeeding terraced levels of smooth shaved lawns to a lake where water lilies bloomed and several swans swam lazily. Across a stretch of greensward to the left was a formal garden, where statued nymphs stooped to beds of clustering roses, which drenched the air with almost drugging sweetness. Low colonnaded lodges, like cloisters, branched off from the house at either side, the left connecting with the rose garden, the right leading to a level square of grass in which was set a little summer house of red brick and wrought iron. One moment, if you please. De Grandin ordered as we clambered from the car before the house. Show me, if you will be so good, Monsieur le Capitaine, exactly where it was they found Madame Derringer and the others. We might as well prepare ourselves by making a survey of the terrain. We walked across the lawn toward the little summer house, and Captain Chenevere halted some six feet from the lodger. I'd say we found him here, he answered. Um, yes, just about here, judging by the... He paused a moment as though to orient himself, then stepped forward to the green-tile paving of the lodger, drawing an electric flashlight from his blouse pocket as he did so. The long summer twilight had almost faded into night, but by such daylight as remained, aided by the beam of Captain Chenevere's torch, we could descry very faintly a sinuating weaving trail against the grey-green of the tiles. I recognized it instantly. There is no boy brought up in the country districts before the coming of the motor car had caused earth roads to give way to hard-surfaced highways who cannot tell a snake track when he sees it in the dust. But never had I seen a track like this. In form it was a duplicate of trails which I had seen a thousand times, but in size it might have been the mark left by a motor lorry's wheel. Involuntarily I shuddered as I beheld the grisly thing— and Captain Chenevere's hand stole instinctively to the walnut stock of the revolver which dangled in its holster from his belt. Gordon Goodloe, scion of a dozen generations of a family who chose death in preference to dishonor, held himself in check by almost superhuman force. Jules de Grandin showed no more emotion than if he were in a museum, viewing some not especially interesting relic of the past. Hmm? he murmured softly to himself, studying the dull, reddish-brown tracing with pursed lips and narrowed eyes. He must have been the bisaïeul of the serpents, this one. He raised his narrow shoulders in a shrug, and— Come, let us go in, he suggested. Perhaps there is more to see inside. Mr. Goodlow cleared his throat angrily, but Captain Chenevere laid a quick hand on his elbow. Shh, he cautioned softly. Let him handle this his own way. He knows what he's about. An aged, but by no means decrepit, colored butler met us at the door. In one hand he held an old-fashioned candle lamp, in the other a saucer containing grains of wheat. What the devil? Mr. Goodlow snapped. Has the electric power gone off again, Julius? Yes, sir, said the colored man. His words, despite the native softness of his voice, having a peculiar intonation revealing that his mother tongue was not the English of the South. The current has been gone since six o'clock this afternoon, and the telephone has been out of order for some time as well. Damn poor service, muttered Goodloe, but how long's it been since your light and telephone died before? sharply queried Captain Chenevere. I saw the negro shiver as though he felt a sudden draught of gelid air. Not since Madame Derringer, he began, but the captain shut him off. That's what I thought, he answered, then to de Gronda in a whisper. Something damn funny about this, sir. Their electric light all died the night Mrs. Derringer was, uh, died, and the telephone went dead at the same time. Same thing happened on both previous occasions, too. Do you mind if I pop over to the barracks and put in a trouble call? I've got my motorcycle parked out in the yard. De Grandin had been studying the butler with that intent, unwinking stare of his, but now turned to the trooper with a nod. By all means, he replied. Go there and go quickly, my friend. 
Also return as quickly as may be with one of your patrol cars, if you please. Park it at the entrance of the grounds and approach on foot. It may be we shall be in need of help, and I would have it that our reinforcements come unannounced, if possible. Okay, the other answered, and turned upon his heel. How's Miss Nancy, Julius? Mr. Goodlow asked. Feeling any better? No, sir, I'm afraid she's not, the butler replied. And again it seemed to me that he shivered like a man uncomfortable with cold or in mortal terror. Jules de Grandin's gaze had scarcely left the negro since he saw him first. Now, abruptly, he addressed him in a sudden flow of queer, outlandish words, vaguely reminiscent of French, but differing from it in tone and inflection, no less than in pronunciation, as the argo of the slums differs from the language of polite society. The negro started violently as de Grandin spoke to him, glanced shamefacedly at the plate of wheat he held, then, keeping his eyes averted, answered in the same outlandish tongue. Throughout the dialogue was constantly repeated a queer, harsh-sounding word, Lugaru, though what it meant I had no faintest notion. At length, Bon, de Grandin told the butler, then to Mr. Goodlow and me, He says that Mademoiselle your niece is feeling most unwell, monsieur, and that he thinks it would be well if we prescribed for her. He and his wife have attempted to assist her, but she's fallen into a profound stupor from which they cannot rouse her. And it was while attempting to summon a physician from Keyport that he discovered the telephone had gone out of order. Have we your permission to attend, mademoiselle? Yes, of course, Mr. Goodlow answered. And as we followed the butler up the wide, balustraded stairway, Damn West Indian niggers. I can't think why Clark had them around. I'll be getting rid of them in short order as soon as I can get some of our servants up here from the south. Why the devil couldn't he have told me about Nancy? Perhaps because he had no opportunity, de Grandin answered with a mildness wholly strange to him. I surmised that he came from Haiti or Martinique by his accent and by... no matter. Accordingly, I addressed him in his native patois, and he responded. I must apologize for breaking in upon your conversation, but there were certain things I wished to know, and deemed it best to ask him quickly before he fully understood the nature of my mission here. Huh, responded Mr. Goodlow. Did you find out what you wanted? Perfectly, monsieur. Forgive me if I do not tell you what it is. At present I have no more than the vaguest of vague suspicions, and I should not care to make myself a laughing stock by parading crazy theories unbacked by any facts. Plainly, Mr. Goodlow was unimpressed with Jules de Grandin as an investigator and it was equally plain that he had in mind setting forth his dissatisfaction in no uncertain terms. But our advent at his niece's bedroom door cut off all further conversation. "'Miss Nancy! Oh, Miss Nancy!' the butler called in a soft, affectionate tone, striking lightly on the panels with his knuckles. No answer was forthcoming, and waiting a moment the old negro opened the door and held his candle high, standing aside to permit us to pass. In the faint yellow light of half a dozen candles flickering in wall sconces, we descried a girl lying still as death upon the tufted mattress of a high four-poster bed. Her eyes were closed, her hands were folded lightly on her breast, and on her skin was the ghastly, whitish-yellow pallor of the moribund, or newly dead. Small gouts of perspiration lay like tiny beads of limpid oil upon her forehead. A little ridge of glistening globules of moisture had formed upon her upper lip. "'My God, she's dead!' cried Mr. Goodlow. "'But not dead, but sleeping, though not naturally,' de Grandin answered. "'See, her breast is moving, though her respirations are most faint. Attend to her friend Trowbridge.' Placing his fingertip against her left radial artery, he consulted the dial of the diminutive gold watch strapped against the underside of his left wrist, motioning me to take her right-hand pulse. "'Great heavens!' I exclaimed as I felt the feeble throbbing in her wrist. "'Why, her heart's beating a hundred and twenty, and—' "'I make it a hundred and twenty-six, he interrupted. "'What diagnosis would you make from the other signs, my friend?' "'Well—' I considered, lifting the girl's eyelids and holding a candle to her face. 
We have pallor of the body surface, subnormal temperature, rapid pulse and weak respiration, together with dilated pupils, acute coma induced by anemia of the brain, I'd say. Consequent on cardiac insufficiency, he added. That's my guess. Perfectly, mine also, he agreed. A little brandy ought to help, I hazarded, but... Undoubtlessly, he acquiesced. But we shall not administer it. Monsieur, he turned to Mr. Goodlow. Will you be good enough to leave us? We must take measures for Mademoiselle's recovery, and... He raised his brows and shoulders in a shrug. It would be better if you left us with the patient. Obediently, our host turned from the room, and as the door swung to upon him, Dépêchez, mon vieux, de Grandin told the butler, who at his signaled order had remained in the room. Cords, if you please, make haste. Lengths of linen were snatched down from the windows, quickly twisted into bandages, then bound about the girl's wrists and ankles, finally knotted to the uprights of the bed. Last of all, several bands were passed completely around her body and the bed, binding her as fast upon the mattress as ever criminal was lashed upon the rack. "'Whatever are you doing?' I asked him angrily as he knotted a final cincture. "'This is positively inhuman, man.' "'I fear it is,' he admitted. Then, turning to the butler, "'Summon your wife to stand guard, mon brave, and bid her call us instantly if Mademoiselle awakes and struggles to be free. You understand?' Parfaitement, monsieur, returned the other. What the deuce does it mean? I demanded as we descended the stairs. First you interrogate that servant in some outlandish gibberish, then you lash that poor sick girl to her bed as though she were a violent maniac. That's the damnedest treatment for anemic coma I ever saw. Now, Cordieu, my friend, unless I am much more mistaken than I think, that is the damnedest anemic coma that I ever saw as well, he broke in. Anon, I shall explain, but, ah, here is the good Monsieur Goodlow. There are things which he can tell us, too. We entered the library, where Mr. Goodlow paced furiously before the fireless fireplace, a long cigar unlighted in his mouth. There you are, he barked as we entered the room. How's Nancy? De Grandin shook his head despondently. She is not so good, Monsieur, he answered sadly. We have done what we could for her at present, and the butler's wife sits watching by her bed. Meanwhile, we should like to ask you several things, if you will kindly answer. Well, Goodloe challenged, how comes it that Monsieur, your brother, had servants from the French West Indies in his service, rather than Negroes from his native state? I don't see that has any bearing on the case, our host objected. But if you're bound to have the family pedigree... Oh, yes, that would be most helpful, de Grandin assured him with a smile. The other eyed him narrowly, seeking to determine whether he spoke ironically, and at length... Like most Kentuckians, our family came from Virginia, he returned. Green Clark, our maternal great-grandfather, was a shipowner in Norfolk, trading principally with the West Indies... It was easier to import sugar from Saint-Domingue, as they called it then, than to bring it through the Gulf from Louisiana. So he did a thriving trade with the islands. Eventually, he acquired considerable land holdings in Haiti, and put a younger brother in charge as overseer. The place was overrun and burned when the blacks revolted, but our great-granduncle escaped, and later, when Christophe set up stable government, the family reacquired the lands, and farmed them until the Civil War, the Virginia branch of the family always kept up interest in the West Indian trade, and Clark, in his younger days, spent considerable time in both Haiti and Martinique. It was on one of his sojourns in Port-au-Prince that he acquired Julius and Marie as household servants. They came with him to the States, and were in his service for more than forty years. They'll not be here much longer, though. I don't like West Indian niggers' impudent ways, and I'm going to give them the boot as soon as I can get a couple of our servants up here. De Grandin nodded thoughtfully. Then, You have no record of your ancestors' activities in Haiti before the blacks' revolt, he asked. No, Mr. Goodlow answered shortly. Ah, huh? a pity, monsieur. Perhaps we might find in that some explanation of the so strange deaths which seem to curse this house. However, 
but let it pass for the present. We must seek our explanation elsewhere, it would seem. He busied himself lighting a cigarette, then turned once more to Mr. Goodloe. Captain Chenever should be here shortly, he announced. It might be well if you accompany when he leaves, monsieur. Unless I misread the signs, the malign genius which presides over this most unfortunate house is ready for another manifestation, and you are in all probability the intended victim. We may foil it and learn something which will enable us to thwart it permanently in your absence. If you remain, eh bien, who can say what may occur? Mr. Goodloe eyed him coldly. You're suggesting that I run away? he asked. Ah, no, by no means, monsieur. Merely that you make a temporary retreat while friend Trowbridge and I fight her rearguard engagement. You cannot help us by your presence. Indeed, your being here may prove a great embarrassment. I'm sorry, sir, our host returned. But I can't agree to any such arrangement. I've called you in to solve this case at Captain Chenevere's suggestion and against my own best judgment. If I'm to pay you, I must at least demand that you put me in possession of all facts you know or think you know. Thus far, your methods have been more those of the fortune-telling charlatan than the detective. And I must say, I'm not impressed with them. Either you will handle the case under my direction, or I will write you a check for services to date and call another into consultation. De Grandin's little round blue eyes flashed ominously, with a light like winter ice reflecting January moonlight. His thin lips drew away from his small white teeth in a smile which held no mirth, but he controlled his fiery temper by an almost superhuman effort. This case intrigues one, Monsieur Goodloe, he answered stiffly. It is not on your account that I hesitate to leave it, but rather out of love for mastering a mystery. Be so good as to listen attentively, if you please. To begin, when first I saw your butler, I thought I recognized in him the earmarks of the Haitian. Also I noticed that he bore a saucer filled with wheat when he responded to our knock. Now in Haiti, as I know from personal experience, the natives have a superstition that when an unclean spirit comes to haunt a place, protection can be had if they will scatter grains of rice or wheat before the door. The visitant must pause to count the scattered grain, they think, and accordingly daylight will surprise him before the tale is told. The Kwashi, or Haitian blacks, refer indifferently to various unpleasant members of the spirit world as Lugaru, which is, of course, a corruption of Lou Garou, or werewolf. Very well, I drew my bow at random and addressed your man in Haitian patois, and instantly he answered me. He told me much for one who bears himself addressed in the language of his childhood in a strange land, will throw away reserve and give full vent to his emotions. He told me, by example, that he was in the act of scattering grain about the house, and especially upon the stairs, and in the passage leading to Mademoiselle Nancy's room, because he was convinced that the Lugaru, which had already made away with three members of your family, was planning a fresh outrage. For why? Because, by blue, on each occasion previously, the electric light inside the house had died for no apparent reason, and all outside connections by telephone had similarly died. Captain Chenever, who had made the investigation of the deaths, noted this coincidence also, and remarked upon it. He is now gone to report the failure of your light and telephone to the proper parties. But something else, of even greater interest, your butler disclosed. The day before her father's death, the day Monsieur Derringer died so strangely, and immediately preceding Madame Derringer's so tragic death, Mademoiselle Nancy exhibited just such signs of illness as she showed today. Dullness, listlessness, headache. Finally, a heavy stupor, almost simulating death, from which no one could rouse her. Never before, and he has known her all her life, had she shown signs of such an illness. Indeed, she was always a most healthy young lady, not subject to the customary feminine ills of headache, biliousness, or stomach sickness. Alors, he was of opinion that these sinking fits of hers were connected in some manner with the advent of the Lugaru. I must admit, I think he reasoned wisely. 
When Dr. Trowbridge and I examined her, your niece showed every sign of anemic coma. This in a lady who has always been most healthy is deserving of remark, especially since she shows no evidence of cardiac deficiency intervening these strange seizures. You comprehend? I comprehend. You've let yourself be fooled by the bestial superstitions of an ignorant savage, Mr. Goodloe burst out disgustedly. If this is a sample of the way you solve your cases, sir, I think we'd better call it quits and— Monsieur, Monsieur le médecin, dépêchez-vous, mademoiselle! The urgent whisper cut him short as an elderly negress, deeply wrinkled but still possessing the fine figure and graceful carriage of the West Indian black, appeared at the library door. We come, at once, immediately, right away, de Grandin answered, turning unceremoniously from Mr. Goodloe and hastening up the stairs. Detain him without, my friend, he whispered with a nod toward Goodloe as we reached the sick-room door. Should he find her bound, he may ask questions, even become violent, and I shall be too busy to stop my work and slay him. Accordingly, I blocked the bedroom door as best I could while the little Frenchman and the negress hastened to the bed. Nancy Goodloe was stirring but not conscious. Rather, her movements were the writhings of delirium, and like a patient in delirium, she seemed endowed with supernatural strength, for the strong bandages which bound her wrists had been thrown off, and the surcingle of cotton which held her to the bed was burst asunder. Morbleu, what in Satan's name is this? began de Grandin, then abruptly. But, gloire de Dieu, what is that? He brushed past the bed, leant out the window, and pointed toward the patch of smooth-shaven lawn before the loggia, red-brick-and-iron summer-house. What seemed to be a jet of vapor rising from a broken steam-pipe was whirling like a dust-swirl above the grass plot, rotating still more swiftly, at length concressing and solidifying. An optical illusion it doubtless was, but I could have sworn the gyrating haze took form and substance as I gazed and became, beneath my very eyes, the image of a great white snake. "'Here, damn you, what do you mean by this?' Mr. Goodloe burst past me into the girl's bedroom and snatched furiously at the cotton bindings which half restrained his niece upon the bed. "'By gad, sir, I'll teach you to treat gentlewomen this way,' he stormed. Then, surprisingly, Huh? Raising furious eyes to de Grandin as the little Frenchman peered out the window, he had caught sight of the ghastly whirling wreath of vapor on the lawn. The thing by now had definitely assumed a serpent's form, and it was a moving serpent, a serpent which circumvoluted in a giant ring, rearing and swaying its ugly wedge-shaped head from side to side. A serpent which made loops and figurates upon the moonlit lawn, and described great flowing triangles which melted into squares and hexagons and undulating coiling mounds, an ever-changing, never-hastening, never-resting figure of activity. Huh? Mr. Goodloe repeated, horror and blank incredulity in the querying monosyllable. We saw his face. The eyes were staring, glassy, void of all expression as the eyes of one new dead. His jaw hung down and his mouth was open, round and expressionless as the entrance to a small empty cave. His breath sounded stertorously like a snore. For a moment he stood thus, then hands held before him like a sleepwalker or a person playing blind man's bluff, he turned, shambled down the hall, and began a slow and halting descent of the stairs. Lugaru, Lugaru, Ayida Uedo, gibbered the negro servant, her horror-glazed eyes rolling in a very estrus of fear as she gazed alternately at the whirling thing upon the lawn, the struggling girl upon the bed, and Jules de Grandin. Silence, cried the Frenchman, then clearing the space between the window and the bed at a single leap, Mademoiselle Nancy, awake, he ordered, seizing the girl's shoulders and shaking her furiously from side to side, as a terrier might shake a rat. For a moment they struggled thus, seemingly engaged in a wrestling bout, but finally the girl's dark eyes opened and she looked him in the face. 
De Grandin's little round blue eyes seemed starting from his head. The veins along his temples swelled and throbbed as he leant abruptly forward, till his nose and that of Nancy Goodloe nearly touched. Attend me, carefully, he commanded in a voice which sounded like a hiss. You will go back to sleep, a simple, restful, natural sleep, and both your waking and subconscious minds shall be at rest. You will awake when daylight comes, and not before. I, Jules de Grandin, order it. You comprehend? Sleep, 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 he finished in a low and crooning voice, swaying the girl's shoulders to and fro, as one might rock a restless child. Slowly she sank back on her pillow, composed herself as quietly as a tired little girl might do, and in a moment seemed to fall asleep, all traces of the delirium which had held her in its grip a moment since departed. Oh! Involuntarily the exclamation broke from me. The writhing, twisting serpent on the lawn had vanished, and I could not rightly say whether what remained was a wraith of whirling vapor, or a spot of bright moonlight, which seemed to move as the shadow of some wind-blown bough swept over it. Come, my friend! De Grandin ordered sharply, snatching at my elbow as he dashed from the room. We must find him. Mr. Goodloe had left the house and crossed the intervening lawn by the time we reached the door. As we came up with him, he stood a few feet from the place where we had seen the great white snake, staring about him with puzzled, wide, lackluster eyes. Whoa, what am I doing here? he faltered, as the Frenchman caught him by the shoulder and administered a gentle shake. "'Do not you remember, monsieur?' de Grandin asked. "'Do you not recall the thing you saw out here, the thing which beckoned you to come, and whose summons you obeyed?' Goodlow looked vaguely from one of us to the other. "'I... I seem to have some vague recollection of someone, something, which called me out, he answered in a sleepy, faltering voice. But who it was, or what it was, I can't remember. No? de Grandin returned curiously. Eh bien, perhaps it is as well, or better. You are tired, monsieur. I think you would do better if you slept, as we should also. Tomorrow we shall talk about this case at length. Docile as a sleepy child, our fiery-tempered host permitted us to lead him to the house and assist him into bed. De Grandin made a final tour of inspection, noted the light, natural sleep in which Nancy Goodloe lay, then followed Julius to the room assigned us. Clad in lavender pajamas, mauve dressing gown, and purple kid slippers, he sat beside the window, gazing moodily out upon the moonlit lawn, lighting one vile-smelling French cigarette from the glowing stump of another, muttering unintelligibly to himself from time to time, like one who makes a mental calculation of a puzzling problem in arithmetic. "'For goodness' sake, aren't you ever coming to bed?' I asked crossly. "'I'm sleepy, and—' "'Then go to sleep, by all means,' he shot back sharply. "'Sleep, animal!' Rest yourself in swinish ease. Me, I am a sentient human being. I have thoughts to think and plans to make. When I have done, then I shall rest. Until that time, you will oblige me by not obtruding yourself upon my meditations. All right, I answered, turning on my side and taking him at his word. Gordon Goodloe was in a chastened mood next morning. While he had no clear recollections of the previous evening's events, there was a haunting fear at the back of his mind, a sort of nameless terror which dogged his footsteps, yet evaded his memory, as fancied images half seen from the tail of the eye dissolve into nothingness when we turn about and seek to see them by direct glance. Miss Goodloe remained in bed, apparently suffering from no specific illness, but in a greatly weakened state. I think she'll be all right, with rest and a restricted diet, I ventured, as de Grandin and I left her room, but— No, my friend, you have wrong, the little Frenchman told me, with a vigorous shake of his head. Tonight, unless I much mistake my diagnosis, she will have another seizure and— 
You'll hypnotize her again, I interjected. By blue, not by any means, he broke in. Me? This evening I shall be a spectator at the show, though not perhaps an idle one. No, on second thought, I am decided I shall be quite active. Yes, certainly. When Captain Chenever arrived with assurances that troubleshooters of the electric and telephone companies could find no mechanical reason for the failure of service in the Goodlow house, and when by trial we found both electric light and telephone in perfect working order, de Grandin showed no surprise. Rather, he seemed to take the mystery of alternating failure and function in the service as confirmation of some theory he had formed. Shortly after noon, Accompanied by Julius, the butler, he made a hurried trip in Captain Chenevere's police car, returning before dinner-time with a covered tin pail, filled with something which splashed as he bore it to the kitchen and put it near the stove, where it would remain warm, but not become totally hot. I passed a rather dismal day. Mr. Goodloe was in such a state of nervous fear that he seemed incapable of carrying on a conversation— Miss Goodloe lay quietly in bed, refusing food, and answering questions with a gentle patience which reminded me of a convalescent child. De Grandin bustled about importantly. Now in conference with Captain Chenevere, now with Julius, now delving into some old family records which he found in the library. By dinner-time I was in a state where I would have welcomed a game of cribbage as a pastime. Our host excused himself shortly after dinner and the young police captain, de Grandin, and I were left alone with cigars and liqueurs on the terrace. "'You're sure you've got some dope on it?' Chenevere asked suddenly, flinging his cigar away with nervous petulance, then selecting another from the humidor and lighting it with quick, spasmodic puffs. "'None but the feeble-minded are sure. Of that I am indubitably sure,' de Grandin answered. "'But I think I have at least sufficient evidence to support an hypothesis. "'This house, I found by inquiries which I made in the city, "'was largely built of second-hand materials. "'The owner wished that weathered bricks be used, "'and considerable search was necessary to procure materials of a proper age and quality. "'The brick and ironwork, of which that little summer-house is built, by example, "'came from a demolished structure on the outskirts of Newark,' a house once used to restrain the criminally insane. You apprehend the significance of that? The young trooper regarded him quizzically a moment, as though seeking to determine whether he was serious. At length, No, I can't say I do, he confessed. De Grandin turned interrogatively to me. Do you, by any happy chance, see a connection in it? he demanded. No, I answered. I can't see it makes any difference whether the brick and iron came from an insane asylum or a chicken coop. He nodded a trifle sadly. One should have anticipated some such answer from you, he replied. Then, attend me carefully, both of you, he ordered. We must begin with the premise that, though it is incapable of being seen or weighed or measured, a thought is a thing, no less than is a pound of butter, a flitch of bacon, or a dozen sacerdotal candles. You follow me? Bien, bien, whether you do or not. A madhouse is far from being a pleasant place. Their human wreckage, the mentally dead whose bodies unfortunately survive them, is brought to be disposed of, imprisoned, cabined, cribbed, confined. Often those we call criminally insane are very criminal indeed, though not medically insane. Their madness consists in their having given themselves, body, soul, and spirit, to abysmal and unutterable evilness. Very well, from such there emanates, we do not know quite how, though psychical experiment has proved it to be a fact, an active, potent force of evil, and inanimate things like stone and wood, brick and iron, are capable of absorbing it. Oh, yes! I have seen spirit manifestations evoked from a chip taken from a rafter in a house where great wickedness had been indulged in. I have seen dreams of old, dead, evil days evoked in sensitive subjects, doing no more than sleep in the room where some bit of torture paraphernalia from the prisons of the Spanish Inquisition in Toledo had been placed, all unbeknown to them. 
Yes. There then is our starting point. What then? Last night three people saw a most remarkable manifestation on that lawn yonder. I saw it. The negro butler's wife beheld it. Even Dr. Trowbridge, who most certainly cannot be called a psychic, saw it. Voila, that thing was no figment of the fancy. It was there, of course. Whether Monsieur Goodloe saw it, in the same sense that we beheld it, we cannot say. He has no recollection of it. But certainly he saw something. Something which caused him to leave his house and walk across the grass plot exactly as did his brother, his kinsman, and his female relative, presumably. Had I not been quick, I think we should have seen another tragedy there before our very eyes. I say, I interrupted, just what was it you did last night, de Grandin? I have to admit, however much my better judgment tells me it was an optical illusion that I saw, or thought I saw, a great snake materialize on the lawn, then when you hypnotized Miss Goodlow, the thing seemed to fade away. Did she have any connection with— Ah, bah! he broke in with a nod. "'Has the lens any connection with the burning of the concentrated sunlight? "'By damn it, I think yes.' "'How?' I began. "'But you have seen the working of the Ver Ardent, "'the, how do you call him, burning glass, yes?' "'Of course,' Chenever and I replied in chorus. "'Very good.' "'He nodded solemnly. "'Very exceedingly good. "'All about us, invisible, impalpable.' but all about us nonetheless, our spiritual forces, some good, some evil, all emanations of generations of men who have lived and struggled, loved, hated, and died long years ago. But this great force is, in the main, so widespread, so lacking in cohesion, that it cannot manifest itself physically, except upon the rarest of occasions. At times it can make itself faintly felt, as sunshine can impart a coat of tan to the skin. But to inflict a quick and powerful burn, the sunlight must be bound together in a single intense beam by the aid of the burning lens. Just so with these spiritual forces, whether they be good or naughty. They are here already, as sunlight is abundant on a sunny day. But it needs the services of a medium to bring these forces into focus, so they can become physically apparent. Yes, assuredly. Now, not all mediums reside in the stuffy back rooms of darkened houses, eking out precarious livelihoods by the contributions of the credulous who desire to consult the spirits of departed relatives. Alas, no. There are many unconscious mediums who all innocently give force and potency to some evil spirit entity, which but for them would be unable to manifest itself at all. Such mediums are most often neurotic young women. They seem ideally fitted to supply the psychoplasm needed by the spirit for materialization, whether that manifestation be for the harmless purpose of ringing a tambourine, tooting a toy trumpet, or committing bloody murder. This, of course, I knew already. Also, I knew that on previous occasions, when members of the Goodloe family had been so tragically killed, Mademoiselle Nancy had suffered from strange seizures, such as that she had last night. It are a wicked thing, a spirit or an elemental, draining the physical energy from her in the form of psychoplasm with which to make itself material, I tell me. Accordingly, when I see that spirit forming out of nothingness, I turn at once to Mademoiselle Nancy as its source of power. She is unconscious, but her subconscious mind is active. She seeks to burst the bonds I put upon her. To what end? One wonders. But one thing I can do, if only I can succeed in making her conscious for one little so small minute, I can hypnotize her put her in a natural sleep in which the unconscious giving off of physio-psychical power will be halted. And so, I wake her, though I have great trouble doing it. I wake her and then I bid her sleep once more. She sleeps, and the building up of that so evil white snake thing comes abruptly to a halt. Voila, très bien. What's next? Chenever demanded. First, a further test of that which summoned Monsieur Goodloe from the house last night, the little Frenchman answered. 
I have taken means which will, I think, ensure its harmlessness, but I am curious to see how it goes about its work. That done, we shall destroy the summer-house from which the evil emanation seems to come, and that accomplished, we shall seek for causes of these so strange deaths, and for the source of the curse which seems to overhang this family. Logicians reason a posteriori. We shall seek to visualize in the same manner, from ultimate effect to primal cause. You understand? Captain Chenever shook his head, but held his peace. I'm hanged if I do, I declared. Very well, you shall in time, he promised with a smile. But you shall not be hanged. You are too good a friend to lose by hanging, dear old silly Trowbridge of my heart. It must have been near midnight when the negro butler ran out on the terrace to summon us. Mademoiselle is restless, monsieur le médecin, he announced. My wife is with her, but— Very good, de Grandin cried. Is all in readiness? Oui, monsieur. Bon, let us go. He hastened toward the house and— Look upon the lawn, my friends, he bade Chenever and me. What is it that you see, if anything? We turned toward the plot of grass before the summer-house, and I felt a prickling of my scalp, and despite midsummer heat, a sudden chill ran down my neck and back. A jet of whitish vapor was rising from the grass, and as we looked it began to weave and wind and twist, simulating the contortions of a rearing serpent. "'Good God!' cried Captain Chenever, reaching for his pistol, but— "'Desist!' de Grandin warned. I have that ready which will prove more efficacious than your shot, mon capitaine, and I do not wish that you should make unnecessary noise. It is better that we do our work in silence. Await me here, but on no account go near it. In a moment he and Julius returned, each armed with what looked like those large tin atomizers used to spray insecticide on rose bushes. They charged across the strip of lawn, their tin weapons held before them as soldiers might hold automatic rifles, deployed while still some distance from the whirling mist, then turned and faced each other, de Grandin running in a circle from left to right, the negro circling toward him from right to left. Each aimed his atomizer at the earth, and we heard the swish, swish of the things as they worked the plungers furiously. Although I could not tell what the guns held, it seemed to me they sprayed some dark-hued liquid on the grass. Fini! the little Frenchman cried, as he and Julius completed their circuit. Now! Huh? Ah, uh huh? He seemed to freeze and stiffen in his tracks as he looked toward the house. Chenever and I turned, too, and I heard the captain give a muffled exclamation, even as I caught my breath in surprise. Walking with an undulating, swaying motion, which was almost like that of a dance, came Nancy Goodloe. Her flimsy nightdress fluttered lightly in the faint night breeze. In the moonlight, falling fine as dusted silver powder through the windbreak of Lombardy poplars, she was so wraith-like and ephemeral as to seem a phantom of the imagination. Her arms were raised before her and bent sharply at the elbows, and again at the wrists, so that her hands thrust forward, for all the world like twin snakeheads poised to strike. Abruptly she came to a halt, half turned toward the house from which she had come, as though awaiting the advent of a delayed companion. Then, apparently reassured, began describing a wide circle on the lawn in a gliding, side-stepping dance. I saw her face distinctly as a moonbeam flashed upon it, a tense, drawn face, devoid of all expression as a countenance carved of wood, eyes wide, staring and expressionless, mouth retracted so that a hard white line of teeth showed behind the soft red line of lips. And now the drawn, sardonically smiling lips were moving, and a soft contralto chant rose upon the midnight stillness. The words I could not understand— Vaguely they reminded me of French, yet they were not truly French, resembling that language only as the jargon of a Yorkshireman or the patois of our canebreak negroes simulated the English of an educated Londoner. One word or phrase alone I understood, Aida Uedo, 
Aida Uedo, intermixed with connectives of unintelligible gibberish which meant nothing to me. Quick, my friends, seize him, lay hands on him, hold him where he is. De Grandin's whispered order cut through Nancy Goodloe's chanting invocation as he motioned us to turn around. As we swung round, we beheld Gordon Goodloe. Like a wanderer in a dream he came, the night air stirring through his tousled hair, his eyes fast set and staring, with a look of blank, half-conscious horror. His mouth was partly opened, and from the corners there drooled two little streams of spittle. He was like a paralytic moving numbly in a state of quarter-consciousness, a condemned man marching to the gallows in an anesthesia of dread. Volition gone from out his limbs and muscles working only through some reflex process, entirely divorced from conscious guidance. Do not address him, only hold him fast, de Grandin ordered sharply. On no account permit him to overstep the line we drew. The other may not come to him, see you that he goes not to it. Obediently, Chenevere and I seized Goodloe by the elbows and stopped him in his stride. He did not struggle with us, nor indeed did he seem aware we held him, but we could feel the dead weight of his body as he leaned toward the twisting, writhing thing inside the circle which de Grandin and Black Julius had marked upon the lawn. The mist had now solidified. It had become a great white snake, which turned and slid its folds like melting quicksilver, one upon another, rearing up its dreadful head opening its fang-barbed mouth, and hissing with a low, continuous sibilation, like the sound of steam escaping from a broken pipe. I shrank away as the awful thing drew itself into a knot and drove its scale-armored head forward in a sudden lunge toward us, but terror gave way to astonishment as I saw the driving battering ram of scale and muscle stopped in mid-air, as though it had collided with an invisible but impenetrable barrier. Time and again the monster struck at us, hissing with a sort of venomous fury, as each drive fell futilely against the unseen wall, which seemed to stand between ourselves and it. Then, from the little red-brick summer-house, there came a sudden spurt of flame. Unseen by us, de Grandin and the butler had drenched the place with gasoline until the very bricks reeked with it. Now, as they poured a fresh supply of petrol out, they set a match to it, and the orange flames leaped upward hungrily. A startling change came over the imprisoned reptile. No longer did it seek to strike at Chenevere and Goodloe and me. Rather, its efforts seemed directed to regaining the protection of the blazing summer-house. But the invisible barrier which had held it back from us restrained its efforts to retreat. It struck and struck again helplessly at the empty air, then began to twist and writhe in a new fashion, contorting on itself swaying its head, shuddering its coils, as though in insupportable agony. And as the lapping tongues of flame leaped higher, the thing began to shrink and shrivel, as though the fire which burnt the roof and cracked the bricks and bent the iron grills of the little house with its fierce heat were consuming it. It was a fearsome sight. To see a twenty-foot snake burned alive, consumed to crisping ashes, would have been enough to horrify us almost past endurance. But to see that mighty writhing mass of bone and scale and iron-hard muscle cremated by a fire which blazed half a hundred feet away, so far away that we could scarcely feel the least faint breath of heat, that was adding stark impossibility to nauseating horror. Fini! Triomphe achevé! Parfait! De Grandin cried triumphantly, as he and Julius capered round the blazing summer house like savages dancing round some sacrificial bonfire. You are strong and cunning, Monsieur le Revenant, but Jules de Grandin, he was stronger and more cunning. Ha! But he tricked you cleverly, that one. He made a mock of all your wicked, vengeful plans. He caught you in a trap where you thought no trap was. He snared you in a snare from which there was no exit. He burned you in the fire and made you into nothing. He has consumed you utterly and finally. Abruptly he ceased his frenzied dance and insane chant of triumph, and, See to Mademoiselle, mon brave, he ordered Julius. 
I think that she will rest the clock around when your wife has put her in her bed. Tomorrow we shall see the last act of this tragedy, and then... Eh bien, the curtain always falls upon the finished play, n'est-ce pas? Candles burned, with a soft, faintly shifting light in the tall seven-cupped candelabrum, which graced the centre of the polished mahogany table in the Goodlow drawing-room. Full to repletion at the end of an exceptionally good dinner, Jules de Grandin was at once affable and talkative. "'What was it you and Julius sprayed on the lawn last night?' I had asked, as Gordon Goodlow, his niece, Captain Chenever and I found seats in the parlour, and Julius, quiet-footed as a cat, brought in coffee and liqueurs before setting the candles alight and drawing the gold-mesh curtains at the tall French windows. The little Frenchman's small blue eyes twinkled roguishly as he turned his gaze on me and brushed a wholly imaginary fleck of dust from the sleeve of his immaculate white linen mess jacket. Chicken blood, he answered with an elfin grin. What? Chenevere and I demanded in incredulous chorus. Precisément, your hearing is quite altogether perfect, my friends, he answered. Chicken blood. Son des poulets, you comprehend? But, I began, when he checked me with an upraised hand. Did you ever stop to think why there are statues of the blessed saints upon the altars of the Catholic Church? He asked. Why there are... What the deuce are you driving at? I demanded. He drained his cup of brandied coffee almost at a gulp, and patted the needle-sharp ends of his diminutive wheat-blonde moustache with affectionate concern. The old schoolman knew nothing of what we call the new psychology today, he answered with a chuckle, but they had as good a working knowledge of it as any of our present-day professors. Consider, in the laboratory we employ rotating mirrors to induce a state of quick hypnosis when we would make experiments. Before that we were wont to use gazing crystals. For very long ago it was found that the person concentrating his attention on a small bright object was an excellent candidate for hypnotism. Very good, but that is not all. If one stares fixedly at anything, whatever be its size, he soon detects a feeling of detachment stealing over him. I've seen soldiers standing at attention become unconscious and fall fainting to the ground because they focused their gaze upon some object before them and held it there too long. Very well, then. The olden fathers of the church discovered, not by psychological formulae, but empirically, that an image placed upon a shrine gave the kneeling worshipper something on which to concentrate his gaze, and induced a state of mild semi-hypnosis, which made it possible to exclude extrinsic thoughts. It enabled the worshipper, in fine, to coordinate his thought with the wording of his prayer made the act of praying less like indulging in a conversation with himself. You apprehend? Good. The underlying psychology of the thing the fathers did not know, but they proved by successful experiment that the images fulfilled this important office. Similarly, in darkest Africa, where the voodoo rites of the West Indies had their birth, worshippers of the unclean gods typified by the snake discovered that the blood of fowls especially chickens, was a potent talisman against their deities, which might otherwise burst the boundaries of control. Every voodoo rite, whatever its nature, is accompanied by the sacrifice of a fowl, preferably a rooster, and this blood is scattered in a circle between the worshippers and the altar of their gods. Why this is, we do not know, we only know it is. But upon some ancient day, so long ago that no one knows its date, it was undoubtedly discovered that the serpent god of the voodoo men could be controlled by spreading warm chicken blood across his path. This was a secret which the Haitian blacks brought with them out of Africa. Very good. When Mademoiselle Nancy struggled on her bed the night we came, and we beheld something taking shape upon the lawn, something with a serpent's form, which drew Monsieur Goodloe from the house by some subtle fascination. What was it that Julius's wife cried out? Aida Uedo. Now that, my friends, is the designation of the wife and consort of Dambala Uedo, the great serpent god of the voodoo men. She is a sort of Juno in their pantheon, 
second in power only to her dreadful husband, who in turn, of course, is their Jove. Alor, her involuntary cry gave me to think. I felt my way, step by careful step, like a blind man tap-tapping with his stick down some unfamiliar street. If that which we saw materialize on the lawn were indeed the form of Aida Uedo, then the charms used by the Hessian voodoo men should prove effective here. It is the logic, Nespa. Accordingly, I procured a plentiful supply of chicken's blood from one who deals in poultry, and had it ready for emergency last night. The reason why, I cannot tell you. I only know that I applied such knowledge as I had to conditions as I found them. I took the chance. I gambled, and I won. Voilà tout. But why'd you burn the summer house? Chenevere demanded. Pardieu, we sterilized it, de Grandin answered. When we had burned it, we put an end to those so evil hauntings, which had caused three deaths and nearly caused a fourth. Fire kills all things, my friends. Microbes, animals, even wicked spirit manifestations. Tear down a haunted house, and the earth, all soaked in evil emanations of the long-dead wicked, will still give forth its exhalations in the form of what we call ghosts, because we lack a better name for them. More? Incorporate one little portion of that haunted place in some new building, and the new structure may prove similarly haunted. But if you burn the place, poof, the hauntings and the haunters cease, and cease forever. The wood or brick or iron of which the haunted house was made acts as a base of operations for the spirit manifestation. But when it is destroyed by fire, or even superheated, it becomes cleansed, in the sense the exorcists use the term, and no longer can it harbor old, unclean and sinful things. Gordon Goodlow, no longer skeptical but frankly interested, put in, Can you account for the apparition, which undoubtedly caused these deaths, and almost killed me, doctor? De Grandin pursed his lips as he regarded the glowing end of his cigar intently. Not altogether, he replied. Vaguely, as the wearer of a too tight shoe feels the approach of a storm of rain, I have a feeling that your family's connection with the former French possession of Haiti is involved, but why it should be I do not know. However, he bowed ceremoniously to Nancy Goodlow, Mademoiselle, your niece has it in her power, I believe, to enlighten us. I, the girl asked incredulously, Précisément, Mademoiselle, remember how in each former case you were stricken with a so strange illness? Then the serpent thing appeared. I do not know, of course, but I much suspect that the illnesses were caused by the slow withdrawal of the psychophysical force, which we call psychoplasm, in order that it might be absorbed by the evil entity which could not otherwise attain physical force and kill your father and your kinsmen. Therefore, it would seem, you have some, all innocent, I assure you, connection with this so queer business. If that be so, you may remember something which will help us. Remember, the girl burst out. Why, I've absolutely no recollection of anything. I only know that I've been ill, then lapsed into unconsciousness, and when I woke, memory is of many kinds, mademoiselle, de Grandin broke in gently. There are certain ancestral experiences which though we may have no conscious knowledge of them, are graven deeply on the records of our subconscious memory. Consider, have you never in your travels come upon some old historic place and had a sudden feeling of, why, I've been here before? Consciously, and in this life you have not, of course, yet you are greatly puzzled by the so strange familiarity of a scene which you are sure you have never seen before. Yes, of course, the explanation is presumed that some ancestor of yours underwent a deep emotional experience at that place. Incidents historically ancestral have made a deep impression on the family memory, and when proper stimuli are applied, this group memory will work its way up to the surface, as objects long immersed in water and forgotten will rise to the top if the pond is sufficiently agitated. You comprehend? I... I don't think I do, 
she answered with a puzzled smile. Do you mean that something which made a marked impression on my great-great-grandmother, for instance, and of which I'd never heard, might be remembered by me if I were taken to the place where it occurred, or— Precisely, exactly, quite so, he cut in enthusiastically. You have it, mademoiselle. In each of us there is some vestige of the past. We are the sum of generations long since dead, even as we are the remote ancestors of generations yet unborn. I do not say that we can do it, but with your consent and assistance, I think it possible that we may probe the past tonight and learn whence came this curse which has so sorely tried your family. Are you willing? Why, yes. Of course, if Uncle Gordon says so. You won't hurt her in any way, asked Mr. Goodlow. Not in the slightest, monsieur, upon my honor. Be very sure of that. All right, then. I'll agree, our host returned. Nancy Goodlow seated herself in a big wing chair, hands folded demurely in her lap, head lolling back against the tapestry upholstery. Theretofore I had regarded her as a patient more than a woman, two very different things, and the realization of her really splendid beauty, her smoldering dark eyes, her strong white teeth, her alluring bosom and captivating turn of long lithe limb, struck me suddenly as she lay back in her chair with just enough voluptuousness of attitude to make us realize that she knew she was a woman in a group of men, and as such the center of attraction which was not entirely scientific. De Grandin took his stand before her, thrust his hand into the left-hand pocket of his cummerbund, and drew forth the little gold note-pencil, which hung upon the chain to the other end of which was fixed his clinical thermometer. Mademoiselle, he ordered softly, you will be good enough to look at this, at its very tip, if you please. So? Good. Observe it closely. Deliberately, as one who beats time to a slow andante tune, he wove the little gleaming pencil back and forth, describing arabesques and intricate interlacing figures in the air. Nancy Goodlow watched him languidly from under long black eyelashes. Gradually, her attention fixed. We saw her eyes follow every motion of the pencil finally converged toward each other until it seemed she made some sort of grotesque grimace. Then the lids were lowered on her purple eyes, and her head, propped against the chair back, moved slightly sidewise as the neck muscles relaxed. Her folded hands fell loosely open on her silk-clad knees, and she was, to all appearances, sleeping peacefully. Presently the regular light heaving of her bosom and the softly sibilated even breathing told us she had indeed fallen asleep. The little Frenchman put his pencil in his pocket, crossed the room on tiptoe, and stroked her forehead and temples with a quick light touch. Mademoiselle, he whispered, can you hear me? I can hear you, answered Nancy Goodlow in a soft and drowsy voice. Bien, ma belle, you will please project your mental eye upon the screen of memory. Go back, mademoiselle, until you reach the time when first your family crossed the trail of Aida Uedo, and tell us what it is you see. You hear? I hear. You will obey. I will try. For something like five minutes we sat there, our eyes intent upon the sleeping girl. She rested easily in the big chair, her lips a little parted, her light even breathing so faint that we could scarcely hear it, but no sign or token did she give that she had seen a thing of which she might tell. Ask her if, Gordon Goodlow began, but sst, de Grandin cut him short. Be quiet, stupid one, she is, grand Dieu, observe. As though the room had suddenly become chilled, Nancy Goodlow's breath was visible. Like the steaming vapor seen upon a freezing winter day, a light, halitous cloud, faintly white, tangible as exhaled smoke from a cigarette, was issuing from between the young girl's parted lips. I felt a sudden shiver coursing down my spine. 
one of those causeless fits of nervous cold which, occurring independently of outside stimuli, make us say, Someone is walking over my grave. Then definitely the room grew colder. The humid midsummer heat gave way to a chilliness which seemed to affect the soul as well as the body. A dull biting hardness of cold suggestive of the limitless freezing eternities of interstellar space. I heard de Grandin's small strong teeth click together like a pair of castanets, but his gaze remained intently on the sleeping girl and the grey-white mist which floated from her mouth. Psychoplasm, I heard him mutter, half believingly. The smoke-like cloud hung suspended in the dead still atmosphere of the room a moment. Then, gently as though wafted by a breeze, it eddied slowly toward the farther wall hung motionless again, and gradually spread out, like the smoke-screen laid by a military airplane, a drifting, gently bellowing, but thoroughly opaque curtain, obscuring the wall from ceiling to baseboard. It is difficult to describe what happened next. Slowly, in the grey-white wreaths of vapour, there seemed to generate little points of bluish light, mere tiny specks of phosphorescence scintillant in the still smoke-screen. Gradually, but with ever-quickening tempo, they thickened and multiplied till they floated like a maze of dancing midges, spinning their luminant dance until they seemed to coalesce into little nebulae of light as large as glowing cigarette ends, but burning all the while with an intense blue, eerie light. It was as if, in place of the smoke vapor, the room was cut in twain by a curtain of solid, opaque moonlight. Gradually the glowing nebulae changed from their spinning movement to a slow weaving motion. The luminous curtain was breaking up, forming a definite pattern of highlights and shadows. A picture, as when the acid etches deeply in the copper of a half-tone plate was taking form before our eyes. We were looking, as through the proscenium of a theater, into another room. It was a beautiful apartment, regal in its lavishness as though it formed some portion of a royal palace. Walls were spread with Flemish tapestries. Chairs and couches were of carven walnut and dull red mahogany. Rare specimens of faience stood on gilt-legged, marble-topped tables. A massive clock with dial of beaten silver and hands of hammered gold swung its jeweled pendulum in a case of polished ebony. Against a chaste white marble mantelpiece, there leaned a woman in a golden gown. She was a charming creature, scarce larger than a child, with small, delicate features of cameo clarity, soft, wavy hair cut rather short, and clustering round her neck and ears in a multitude of tiny ringlets. Her eyes were large and dark, her lips full and red. Her teeth, as she smiled sadly, were small and white as bits of shell pearl. There was, too, a peculiar quality to her skin, not dark with sunburn, nor yet with the olive darkness of the Spaniard or Italian, but rather golden pink, in perfect complement to the golden tissue of her high-waisted sleeveless gown. I looked at her in wonder for a moment, then, a quadroon, I classified her, the product of a mixture of two races, a lovely mixed-cast offspring of miscegenation, more beautiful than ninety of each hundred whites, inheriting only the perfection of form and carriage of black ancestors from the Congo. A door at the farther end of the apartment opened quickly but soundlessly, and a young man hastened forward. He was in military dress, the uniform of a French officer of a hundred and fifty years ago, but the shoulders of his scarlet-faced white coat were decorated with knots of yarn instead of the more customary epaulets. He paused before the girl, booted heels together, and bowed stiffly from the waist above the pale gold hand she gave him, with the charming, precise grace I had so often seen in Jules de Grandin. As he raised her fingers to his lips, I saw that, like hers, his skin was pale matte gold, and in his dark brown wavy hair— there was the evidence of African descent. His lips moved swiftly, but no sound came from them, nor did we hear what she replied. With a start I realized we were witnessing a pantomime, a picture charged with action and swift motion, but silent as the cinematograph before the movies became vocal. 
What they said we could not tell, but that the young woman bore some tidings of importance was evident, that he urged the girl to some course was equally apparent, and that she refused, although with great reluctance and distress, was obvious. The entrance of the room was darkened momentarily as a third actor strode upon the scene. Clothed in white linen, booted and spurred, a heavy riding whip in his hand, he fairly swaggered through the choicely furnished room. No quadroon this, no slightest hint of Africa was in his straight dark hair or sunburned features. This was a member of the dominant, inevitably conquering white race, and by his features an American or Englishman. As he drew near the girl and the young officer, I realized with a start of quick surprise that the latest comer might have been Gordon Goodlow at thirty, or perhaps at thirty-five. He looked with mingled anger and contempt upon the other two a moment, then shot a quick imperious question at the woman. The girl made her answer, wringing her slim hands in a very ecstasy of pleading, but the man turned from her and again addressed the youthful soldier. What answer he received I could not tell, but that it angered him was certain, for without a second's warning he raised his riding whip and cut the youth across the face with its plaited thong. Blow after blow he rained upon the unresisting boy, and finally, flinging away the scourge, he resorted to his fists, felled the trembling lad to the floor, and kicked him as he might have kicked a dog. I stared in horror at the exhibition of brutality. But even as I looked, the picture was obscured, the moving figures faded in a blur of smoky haze, and once again we found ourselves staring at a wall of idly drifting vapor. Again the little sparkling lights began to dance within the smoke, and now they spun and wove until another scene took form before us. It was a bedroom into which we looked. A tall four-poster bedstead stood in the foreground, while bureaus and dressing tables of carved apple wood were in the corners. Light curtains of some cotton stuff swayed gently at the windows, and across the darkened chamber a shaft of moonlight cut a swath as clear and bright as a spotlight on a darkened stage. Beside a toilet table stood the girl we'd seen before, more beautiful and winsome in her night dress of sheer cambric than she had been when clothed in cloth of gold. Sadly, she regarded her reflection in the oval, gold-framed mirror as she drew a comb of tortoise shell through her curling, jet-black ringlets. Then, as she saw another image in the glass, she straightened in an attitude of panic fear. Across her creamy shoulders leered the face of the white man who had thrashed the soldier in the scene we had seen before, and now the shadow gave way to the substance as the man himself half walked, half staggered into the room. That he was drunk was evident. That he had drunk until the latent beast was raised in him was also patent, as he lurched across the room unsteadily, grasped the trembling girl in his arms and crushed her to him, bruising her protesting lips with kisses which betrayed no trace of love, but were afire with blazing passion. The girl's slim form bent like a taut bow in his grasp, as she struggled futilely to break away. Then, as her groping hands fluttered across the dressing-table's marble top, we saw her slender fingers close upon a slim, thin-bladed dagger. The fine steel, no thicker than a knitting needle, gleamed in the ray of moonlight as it flashed in an arc, then fleshed itself in the man's back an inch or so beneath the shoulder-blade. He let her go and fell back with a grimace of mingled rage and pain, a serio-comic expression of surprise spreading on his liquor-flushed and sunburned features. Then, like a pouncing beast of prey, he leaped on her. As a terrier might shake a rat or a savage tomcat maul a luckless mouse, he shook her, swaying her slim shoulders till her head bobbed giddily and her short hair waved flag-like back and forth. Protesting helplessly, she opened her mouth, and the force with which he shook her drove her teeth together on her tongue so that blood gushed from her mouth in a bright spate. Now, not content with shaking, he beat her with his doubled fists, striking her to the floor in a little huddled heap, then raising her again so that he might once more knock her down. The brutal beating lasted till I would have put my hand before my eyes to shut the cruel sight out. 
but quickly as it started it was done. A soundless cry came from the girl's tormentor, and he raised his hand across his shoulder, attempting to assuage the flow of blood. Then, half turning as he grasped at empty air, he fell face forward to the floor. We saw a wide red stain upon the linen of his shirt as he lay there twitching with convulsive spasms. The white gauze curtain at the chamber window fluttered with a sudden movement not caused by the midnight breeze, and a slim brown hand was thrust across the sill. Between the parted folds of curtain we caught a glimpse of a scarred countenance, the lash-marked face of the young soldier whom we had seen the white man beat. For a moment the face was silhouetted against the background of the night. Then the slim hand opened, letting fall some object at the trembling girl's bare feet. It was the dried wing of a tropic vampire bat. Once more the scene dissolved in haze, and once again it formed, and now we looked upon a tableau of midnight jungle. Resinous torches, some thrust into the earth, some fastened to the trunks of palm trees, cast a glow of ruddy light upon the scene. A cloud of heavy smoke ascended from the torches, forming an inky canopy which blotted out the stars. Seated on the ground in a great circle was a vast concourse of blacks, men and women in macabre silhouette against the flickering torchlight, some beating wildly on small double-headed drums, others circling in and out in the mazes of a shuffling, grotesque dance. Lewd, lecherous, lascivious, the postures of the dancers melted quickly from one to another, each more instinct with lechery than the one preceding. Some semi-naked, so nude as at the instant of their birth they danced, and we knew that something devilish was toward, for though we could not catch the tempo of the drums, we felt the tension of the atmosphere. Now the drummers ceased to hammer on their tom-toms. Now the dancers ceased to pose and shuffle in the blood-red glare of torchlight. Now the crowd gave back, and through the aisle of panting, crowding bronze-black bodies strode a figure. Her head was bound about with scarlet cloth, and a wisp of silk of the same color was wrapped about her loins, leaving the remainder of her body starkly naked, save for a heavy coating of white pigment. Straight from her shoulders, to right and left, she held her arms, and in each hand was clutched by the feet a cock, one white, the other black. With slow gliding steps she paced on white-smeared, slim bare feet, between the lines of crouching figures, who watched her avidly in hot-eyed, slobbering passion. Before a low and box-shaped altar she came to pause, her arms straight out before her. Her head bent low as an aged, wrinkle-bitten negress leaped from the shadows and waved a gleaming butcher-knife twice in the lambent torchlight, decapitating a cockerel at each sweep of the steel. The fowl's heads dropped to earth, and the painted priestess lifted high the sacrifices their wings fluttering, their cut necks spurting blood. Slowly she began to wheel and turn beneath the gory shower, then faster, 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 until it seemed that she was spinning like a top. We saw her face a moment as, all dewed with blood, she turned it toward the altar. It was the girl whom we'd seen twice before. And now the wrinkled crone who had slain the cocks leaped, monkey nimble to the box-like altar, snatched frenziedly at the strong lock and hasp which held the cover down, and flung the lid back from the chest. All eyes, save those of the girl who still spun whirlingly before the sanctuary, were intent upon the box. I watched it, too, wondering what fresh obscenity could be disclosed. Then, with a gasping intake of my breath, I saw. Slowly, very slowly, there reared from the box the head, the neck, an eight-foot length of body of a great white snake. Aida Uedo, the white serpent goddess, the deity of voodoo rites. Aida Uedo, the goddess of slaughter. This girl was a vowed priestess of her bloody cult. The scene obscured once more, then slowly took new form. We stood within a crowded courtroom. Three judges— two in black, one in red, were seated on the dais, flanked by two gendarmes with muskets and fixed bayonets, 
The golden girl, now clothed in simple white, with a wide straw hat tied underneath her chin with satin ribbons, stood before the court, while the white man she had stabbed stood forward to accuse her. We saw him hurl his accusation at her. We saw the spectators turn, whispering to each other as the evidence was given. We saw her plead in her defense. At last we saw the center judge, the judge all gowned in red, address the girl, and saw her curtsy deeply as she made reply. We saw the judge's heads, two capped with black, one crowned with red, bow together as they took counsel of each other. Then, though we heard no words, we saw the sentence of the court as the red-robed center figure delivered judgment in two syllables. Amor. Sentence of death was passed, and she took it smilingly, curtsying low as though to thank the judges for a courtesy bestowed. We looked upon a public square, so hot beneath the tropic noonday sun that a constant flickering of heat rays arose from off the kidney stones which formed the pavement. The square was lined with crowding men and women, rich townspeople, wealthy planters and their women folk, colored men of every shade from ebony to well-creamed coffee, a battalion of white infanterie de ligne in spotless uniforms, a company of mulatto chasseurs in their distinctive regalia. In the center, where the sun beat mercilessly, stood a scaffold with an X-shaped frame upon it. The executioner, a burly great paunched brute whose sleeveless shirt disclosed gorilla muscles, was attended by two giant negroes, who looked as though they should have been head-butchers in an abattoir. A rolling, long tattoo of drums was sounded by the troops' field music as they led her from a house which faced the square, a nun upon her left, a black-frocked priest in shovel-hat upon her right, head bowed, lips moving in a ceaseless, mumbled prayer. A youthful sous-lieutenant, his boyish mouth hard set with loathing at the job he had to do, marched before. A squad of sweating gendarmes closed the file. She was dressed in spotless linen, a straight and simple frock of the fashion which one sees in portraits of Empress Josephine, a wide straw hat bedecked with pink silk roses, and tied coquettishly with wide pink ribbons knotted underneath her chin. Satin shoes laced with narrow ribbons of black velvet round the ankles were upon her little feet, and she held a satin sunshade in her hand. There was something of opéra bouffe about it all, this gay parade of wealth and fashion and flashing military uniforms called out to witness one slim girl walk unconcernedly across the public square. But the thread of comedy snapped quickly as she reached the scaffold's foot. Closing her frivolous parasol, she gave it to the nun, then turned her back upon the executioner, while her golden-flecked brown eyes searched the crowd, which waited breathless at the margin of the square. At last she found the object which she sought, a tall, broad-shouldered white man in the costume of a planter, who lolled at ease beneath a palm-tree's shade and watched the spectacle through half-closed eyes. Her hand went out, aiming like a pointed weapon, as she hurled a curse at him. We could not hear the words she spoke, but the slow articulation of the syllables enabled us to read her lips. As I am crushed this day, so shall you and yours be crushed by my wanga. Then they stripped the linen garment off her, tore off her hat and little satin shoes, her silken stockings and daintily embroidered lingerie. Stark, utterly birth-naked, they bound her to the planks which formed a six-foot X, and broke her fragile bones with a great bar of iron. We could not hear the piteous cries of agony which came each time the executioner beat on her arms and legs with his heavy iron cudgel. We only saw the velvet, gold-hued flesh give way beneath the blows. The slim and sweetly moulded limbs go limp and formless, as the bones within them broke beneath the flailings of the bar. At last we saw the writhing, childish mouth contort to a scream of final agonized petition. Jésus! Then the lovely head fell forward between her outstretched arms, and we knew that it was over. Her sufferings were done and the justice which demanded that the black or mixed blood who raised hand against a white must die by torment was appeased. 
the scene once more dissolved in swirling, hazy clouds of mist. The last scene was the shortest. A maddened mob of shouting, blood-drunk blacks swarmed over the great house where first we saw the girl. They smashed the priceless furniture, hacked and chopped the walls and woodwork in wild, insensate rage, finally set the place afire. And from every hilltop, every smiling valley, every fruitful farm and bountiful plantation, rose the flames of devastation and the cries of slaughtered women, men, and children. The blacks were in rebellion. Oppression brought its own reward, and those who killed and maimed and tortured and arrogantly wrought the blood and sweat of others into gold were killed and maimed and tortured, hounded, harassed, hunted in their turn. The reign of France upon Saint-Domingue was ended, and that century-long Saturnalia of savagery, that amazing mixture of Congo jungle and Paris salon called the Republic of Haiti, had begun. The candlelight burned softly in Pierre's select speakeasy. The omelette souffle, made with Peychaud bitters, had been washed down with a bottle of tart vin blanc. Now cigars aglow and liqueurs poured, we waited for de Grandin to begin. Tiens, but it is simplicity's own self, he informed us. Does not the whole thing leap all quickly to the eye? But certainly, your remote kinsman, Monsieur Goodloe, the one you told us first established family holdings in the island of Saint-Domingue, which now we know as Haiti, undoubtedly found life wearisome in the tropics. Women of his race were rare. They were mostly married or ugly, or both, and besides, white women pine away and fail beneath the tropic sun. Not so with the mixed breeds, however— they, with tropic sunshine in their veins, flourish like the native vegetation in equatorial lands. Accordingly, Monsieur L'Ancetre did as many others did, and took a quarter-blooded beauty for his wife, without benefit of clergy or of wedding ring. Yes, it has been done before and since, my friends. Now consider the condition on that island at that time. There were forty thousand whites of all classes, twenty-four thousand mulattoes and lesser mixed bloods, whom the law declared to be free citizens, and over half a million barbarous black slaves. A very devil of a place. The free mulattoes were the greatest problem. Technically free as any Frenchman, they yet were scorned and hated by their white co-citizens, many of whom shared paternal ancestors with them. The affranchis, Free mulattoes were imposed upon in every way. They sat apart in church and at the theatre. They were forbidden to wear certain cloths and colours decreed by fashion. The very regiments of soldiers wore a distinctive uniform. Moreover, they were made the butt of hatred in the courts. A white man killing a mulatto might be sentenced to the galleys or be made to pay a fine. In a very flagrant case— he might even suffer the inconvenience of being put to death, but even then his comfort was infringed upon as little as was possible. He was hanged or shot. At any rate, he died with expedition and without unnecessary delay. The mulatto who so far forgot himself as to kill or even attempt the life of a white was prejudged before he entered court and inevitably perished miserably upon the torture frame, his bones smashed to splinters by the executioner's iron bar. But no, it was not very pleasant to be a mulatto in Saint-Domingue those days. Very well, let us start from there. When I beheld those West Indian Negroes in your service, and heard their talk of Lugarous, and when I learnt an ancestor of yours had settled in Haiti in the old days, I determined that the whole thing smelled of voodoo. You know how Julius and I outwitted that white ghost snake which had killed your relatives. You know my theory of its appearance on your lawn. Very good. We knew how it came there. The why was something else, but certainly. Mademoiselle Nancy was inextricably mixed up in the case. The evil genius, resident in the fibre of the haunted summer-house, drew strength and power to work material evil to your family from her. Therefore, having rendered the haunting demon powerless, I decided to have Mademoiselle Nancy act as our spirit guide and open for us the door to yesterday. Bien. Accordingly, I asked her to remember. There are many kinds of memory, my friends. Oh, yes. We remember by example what happened yesterday or last year, 
or when we were very young. Ah, <laughs> but we remember other things as well, although we do not know it. Take, for example, the common dream of falling through the air. That is a memory, though the dreamer may never have fallen from a height. Ha! <laughs> but his remote ancestors, who dwelt in trees, they fell, or were in peril of falling daily. To fall in those days meant injury, and injury meant inability to fight with or escape from an enemy. Therefore not to fall was the greatest care the race had on its mind. Generations of fearing falls, taking care not to fall, produced a mass memory of the unpleasant results of falling. But naturally, accordingly, one of today remembers in his dreams the horror of falling from the treetops. Consider further. Though everyone has dreamed he fell, and often wakened from such dreams with the sweat of terror on his brow, we never have this memory of falling while we are awake. Why so? Because our waking, conscious, modern personality knows no such danger. For that matter, we never have the sense of fleeing from a savage animal while we wake. But when we sleep, grand diable, how often in a nightmare do we seek to flee some monstrous beast, and suffer horrors at our inability to run? Another racial memory, that of our remote cave-dwelling ancestors caught fast in a morass, while some saber-toothed tiger or cave-bear hunted them for dinner. The answer, then, is that when we resign our waking workaday consciousness to sleep, we open the sealed doors to yesterday, and all the different personalities, the sum of which we are, rise up to plague us. We suffer hunger, thirst, or shipwreck which our ancestors survived, though we as individuals never knew these things at all. Bientôt, these naughty dreams come to us unannounced. We cannot call them up, we cannot bid them stay away. But what if we are put to sleep hypnotically, then bidden to remember some specific incident in our long chain of ancestral memory? May not the subconscious mind walk straight to the cabinet in which that memory is filed and bring it to the light? That is the question which I asked myself when I considered sending Mademoiselle Nancy back along the trail of memory. It was only an experiment, but it was successful, as you saw. Mademoiselle Nancy is a psychic. Like the best of the professional mediums, she possesses that rare substance called psychoplasm in great abundance. Once she was en rapport with the olden days, she did more than tell us of them. She showed them to us. Very well. This young lady of mixed blood, whom your ancestor had taken for his lighter love, Monsieur Goodloe, was also a member of the inner circle of the voodooists. She was a mamaloi, or priestess of the serpent goddess Aida Uedo, the consort of the great snake god Dambala. Voodoo was a species of freemasonry from which the whites were barred. Many mulattoes, and even people with smaller degrees of African blood, were active in it. When first we saw her, she was talking with a young mulatto soldier. He had evidently come to summon her to attend a meeting of the voodooists, and she was unwilling. Perhaps she felt such savage orgies were beneath her. Possibly she had put them behind her as a sincere Christian. In any event, she was unwilling to obey the summons and fulfill her duty as a priestess. Then came her master who was also your ancestor. You saw how he abused the messenger of voodoo. Like all the whites, he hated the dark mysteries of the voodooists. Probably his hatred was akin to that which normal men feel for the snake, one part hate, three parts fear. Most white men thus regarded the secret cult which was at the end to knit the slaves and free mulattoes into a single force and sweep the white men from the island. Perhaps all would have been well, had not your ancestor become intoxicated that night. But drunk he got, and in his drunken fury he abused her. She stabbed him in the back, and perhaps, as much to spite him as for any other reason, determined to act as priestess at the altar of Aida Uedo. But whatever her decision was, the matter was taken from her hands when the messenger reappeared outside her bedroom window and dropped the bat-wing at her feet. That bat-wing! He was to the voodooist what the signal of distress is to the master mason, or the fiery crosses to a member of a Scottish clan. It is a summons which could not be denied. By no means. No, indeed. We saw her serve Aida Uedo's altar. 
We saw her when she had been apprehended. We saw her led to execution. Ha! And did we not also see her single out your ancestor and hurl her dying curse at him? Did not she say, As I am crushed this day, so shall you and yours be crushed by my wanga? But certainly. Wanga in their patois is a most elastic term. There is no literal translation for it. Vaguely it means the same as medicine when used by the Red Indian, or magic when spoken of by the Black African, or devil-devil when used by natives of the South Sea Islands. Define it accurately we cannot. Understand it we can. It is the working as of a charm through some unknown super-physical agency. Eh bien, did it not work? I shall say as much. Three of your family died horribly with their bones crushed, even as were that poor young girl's on that dreadful day of execution so long ago. Only by the mercy of heaven and the cleverness of Jules de Grandin are you alive tonight, and not all crushed to death, monsieur. But, I began, but be grilled upon hell's hottest griddle, cut in Jules de Grandin. I first. Cordieu, Sahara at its driest is as the rolling billows of the great Atlantic compared to my poor throat, my friend. Garçon, cut a cognac, tout vite, s'il vous plaît. A Gamble in Souls We crossed the big cement-floored room with its high-set steel-barred windows and whitewashed walls, and paused before the heavy iron grill, stopping the entrance to a narrow, tunnel-like corridor. Our guide cast a sidelong, half-apologetic look in our direction. Visitors aren't uh, usually permitted past this point, he told us. This is the jumping off place, you know, and the fellows in there aren't ordinary convicts, so... Perfectly, monsieur. De Grandin's voice was muted to a whisper in deference to our surroundings, but had lost none of its authoritativeness with lessened volume. One understands, but you will recall that we are not ordinary visitors. Me, I have credentials from the service sûreté, and in addition the note from Monsieur le Gouverneur, does it not say? Quite so, the warden's secretary assented hastily. Distinguished foreign criminologists with credentials from the French secret police and letters of introduction from the governor of the state were not to be barred from the penitentiary's anteroom of death, however irregular their presence might be. Open the gate, Casey, he ordered the uniformed guardian of the grill, standing aside politely to permit us to precede him. The death house was L-shaped, the long bar consisting of a one-story corridor some sixteen feet in width, its south wall taken up by a row of ten cells, each separated from its neighbor by a twelve-inch brick wall and from the passageway by steel cage doors. Through these the inmates looked upon a blank, bleak, whitewashed wall of brick, pierced at intervals by small barred windows set so high that even the pale north light could not strike directly into the cells. Each few feet, almost as immobile as sentries on fixed post, blue uniformed guards backed against the northern wall, somnolent eyes checking every movement of the men caged in the little cells which lined the south wall. Straight before us at the passage end, terrifying in its very commonplaceness, was a solid metal door, wide enough for three to pass abreast, grained and painted in imitation of golden oak. Silence proclaimed the legend on its lintel. This was the one-way door leading to the execution chamber, which, with the autopsy room immediately adjoining, formed the footbar of the building's L. The air was heavy with the scent peculiar to inefficient plumbing, poor ventilation, and the stale smoke of cigarettes. The place seemed shadowed by the vulture wings of hopelessness. We paused to gaze upon the threshold, nostrils stinging with the acrid effluvium of caged humanity, ears fairly aching with the heaviness of silence which weighed upon the confined air. Oh, my dear, my darling. It was a woman's sob-strangled voice which came to us from the gateway of the farthest cell. I just found out. I, I never knew, my dear, until last night when he told me. Oh, what shall I do? I'll, I'll go to the governor. Tell him everything. Surely, surely he'll... The man's low-voiced reply cut in. 
No use, my dear. There's nothing but your word, you know, and Larry has only to deny it. No use, no use. He bowed his head against the grating of his cell a moment, then huskily. This makes it easier, though. Beth, dear, it's been the thought that you didn't know and never could that hurt, hurt more than my brother's perfidy, even. Oh, my dear, I... I love you, Lonnie, came the woman's hoarse avowal. Will it help you to know that, to hear it from my lips? Help? A seraphic smile lighted up the tired, lined face behind the bars. Help? Oh, my darling, when I walk that little way tomorrow night, I'll feel your love surrounding me, feel the pressure of your hand in mine to give me courage at the end. He broke off shortly, sobs knotting in his throat, but through his eyes looked such love and adoration that it brought the tears unbidden to my lids and raised a great lump in my throat. He reached his long, artistically fine hands across the little space which separated his cell door from the screen of strong steel mesh which guards had set between him and the woman, and she pressed her palm against the wire from her side. A moment they stood thus. Then, Please, please! She turned beseechingly to the man in blue who occupied a chair behind her. Oh, please take the screen away a moment. I... I want so to kiss him goodbye. The man looked undecided for a moment, then sudden resolution forming in his immobile face, put forth his hand to move the wire netting. Here, began our guide, but the word was never finished, for quicker than a striking snake, de Grandin's slim white hand shot out, seized him by the neck immediately below the medulla oblongata, exerting sudden steel-tight pressure, so that the hail stopped abruptly on a strangled, inarticulate syllable, and the man's mouth hung open, round and empty as the entrance to a cave. Monsieur, the little Frenchman promised in an almost soundless whisper. If you bid him stop, I shall most surely kill you. He relaxed the pressure momentarily, and— It's against the regulations, our guide expostulated softly. He knows he's not allowed to. Nevertheless, de Grandin interrupted, the screen shall be removed, monsieur. Name of a little blue man, would you deny them one last kiss when he stands upon death's door sill? But no. The screen had been removed, and although the steel bars intervened, the man and woman clung and kissed, arms circled round each other, lips and hearts together in a final long farewell. Now gasped the prisoner, releasing the woman's lips from his for an instant. One long, long kiss, my dearest dear, and then goodbye. I'll close my eyes and stop my ears so I can't hear you leaving, and when I open them again you'll be gone, but I'll have the memory of your lips on mine when, oh, when, uh, he faltered, but, my dear, my dear, the woman moaned, and stopped his mouth with burning kisses. Pablo, it is sacrilege that we should look at them about face, whispered Jules de Grandin, and swung himself about so that his back was to the cells. Obedient to his hands upon our elbows, the warden's secretary and I turned, too, and stood thus till the soft tap-tap of the woman's heels informed us she had left the death-house. We followed slowly, but ere we left the place of the condemned, I cast a last look at the prisoner. He was seated at the little table which, with a cot and chair, constituted the sole furniture of his cell. He sat with head bowed, elbow on knee, knuckles pressed against his lips, not crying, but staring dry-eyed straight ahead, as though he could already vision the long vistas of eternity into which the state would hurl him the next night. A long line of men in prison uniform marched through the corridor as we re-entered the main building of the penitentiary. Each bore an empty tin cup in one hand, an empty tin plate in the other. They were going to their evening meal. "'Would you care to see him eat?' the warden's secretary asked, as the files parted at the guard's horse, Gangway, and we walked between the rows of men. "'Mais non,' de Grandin answered. "'Me, I too desire to eat tonight, and the spectacle of men eating like caged brutes would of a certainty destroy my appetite.' Thank you for showing us about, monsieur. 
and please, I beg, do not report the guard's infraction of the regulations in taking down that screen. It was a work of mercy, no less, my friend. The miles clicked swiftly off on my speedometer as we drove along the homeward road. De Grandin was for the most part sunk in moody silence, lighting one evil-smelling French cigarette from the glowing stump of another, occasionally indulging in some half-articulate bit of highly individualized profanity. Once or twice he whipped the handkerchief from his left cuff and wiped his eyes half furtively. As we neared the outskirts of Harrisonville he turned to me. Small eyes blazing, thin lips retracted from small, even teeth. Hell and furies, and ten million small blue devils in the bargain, friend Trowbridge, he exclaimed. Why must it be? Is there no way that human justice can be vindicated without the punishment descending on the innocent no less than on the guilty? Me, I damn think. He turned away for a moment and, Mordieu, my friend, be careful. He clutched excitedly at my elbow with his left hand, while with the other he pointed dramatically toward the figure which suddenly emerged from the shadowy evergreens bordering the road, and flitted like a wind-blown leaf across the spot of luminance cast by my headlights. Cordia, she will not die of senility if she persists in such a way of walking, he continued, then interrupted himself with a shout as he flung both feet over the side of the car, and rushed down the road to grapple with the woman— whose sudden appearance had almost sent us skidding into the wayside ditch. Nor was his intervention a split second too soon, for even as he reached her side the mysterious woman had run to the center of the highway bridge and was drawing herself up, preparatory to leaping over the parapet to the rushing stream which foamed among a bed of jagged rocks some fifty feet below. "'Stop it, mademoiselle! Desist!' he ordered sharply, seizing her shoulders in his small, strong hands and dragging her back from her perilous perch by main force. She fought like a cornered wildcat. Let me go, she raged, struggling in the little Frenchman's embrace, then, finding her efforts to break loose of no avail, writhed suddenly around and clawed at his cheeks with desperation-strengthened fingers. Let me go. I want to die. I must die. I will die, I tell you. Let me go. De Grandin shifted his grip from her shoulders to her wrists and shook her roughly, as a terrier might shake a rat. Silence, mademoiselle. Be still, he ordered curtly. Cease this business of the monkey at once, or pas dieu. He administered another vigorous shake. I shall be forced to tie you. I added my efforts to his grasping the struggling woman by the elbows and forcing her into the twin shafts of light thrown by the car's driving lamps. Stooping, the Frenchman retrieved her hat and placed it on her dark head at a decidedly rakish angle, then regarded her speculatively a moment. "'Will you promise to restrain yourself if we release you, mademoiselle?' he asked after a few seconds' silent scrutiny. The girl, she was little more, regarded us sullenly a moment then burst into a sharp, cacinating laugh. "'You've just postponed it for a while,' she answered with a shrug of her narrow shoulders. "'I'll kill myself as soon as you leave me anyway. You might as well have saved yourselves the trouble.' "'Hm?' de Grandin murmured. "'Exactly. Precisely. Quite so, mademoiselle. I had that very thought in mind. And it is for that reason that we shall not leave you for a little so small moment. Pains of a dyspeptic pig, are we then murderers?' But of course not. Tell us where you live, and we shall do ourselves the honor of escorting you there. She faced us with quivering nostrils and heaving tumultuous bosom, anger flashing from her eyes, a diatribe of invective seemingly ready to spill from her parted lips. She had a rather pretty high-bred face, unnaturally large, dark eyes, seeming larger because of the violet half-moons under them death-pale skin, contrasting sharply with the little tendrils of dark curling hair, which hung about her cheeks beneath the rim of her wide leghorn hat. There was something vaguely familiar about her features, about the soft, throaty contralto of her voice, about the way she moved her hands to emphasize her words. I drew my brows together in an effort at remembrance, even as de Grandin spoke. Mademoiselle, he told her with a bow, you are too beautiful to die accordingly. Ah, parbleu, I know you now. 
It is the lady of the prison, my good Trowbridge. He turned to me, wonder and compassion struggling for the mastery of his face. But certainly, to her, your change of dress deceived me at the first mapuve. He drew away a pace, regarding her intently. I take back my remark, he admitted slowly. You have an excellent reason for desiring to be rid of this cruel world of men and man-made justice, mademoiselle. Nor am I any stupid moralistic fool who would deny you such poor consolation as death may bring. But, he made a deprecating gesture, this is not the time, nor the place, nor manner, mademoiselle. It were a shame to break your lovely body on those rocks down there. And have you thought of this? There is a poor one's body to be claimed and given decent burial when the debts of justice have been paid. Cannot you wait until that has been done, then? Justice! cried the woman in a shrill, hard voice. Justice! It's the most monstrous miscarriage of justice there ever was. It's murder, I tell you, willful murder, and undoubtlessly, he assented in a soothing voice. But what is one to do? The law's decree, the law, she scoffed. Here's one time where the strength of sin really is the law. Law's supposed to punish the guilty and protect the innocent, isn't it? Why doesn't the law let Lani go and take that red-handed murderer who did the killing in his place? Because the law says a wife can't testify against her husband. Because a perjured villain's testimony has sent a blameless man to death. That's why. De Grandin turned a fleeting glance on me, and made a furtive, hardly noticeable gesture toward the car. But certainly, mademoiselle, he nodded, the laws of men are seldom perfect. Will not you come with us? You shall tell us your story in detail. And if there is aught that we can do to aid you, please be assured that we shall do it. At any rate, if you will give consideration to your plan to kill yourself, and having talked with us, still think you wish to die, I promise to assist you even in that. We are physicians, and we have easily available some medicines, which will give you swift and painless release, nor need any one be the wiser. You consent? Good. Excellent. Bien. If you please, mademoiselle. He bowed with courtly, continental courtesy as he assisted her into my car. She sat between us, her hands lying motionless and flaccid, palms upward in her lap. There was something monotonous, flat and toneless in her deep and rather husky voice as she began her recitation. I had heard women charged with murder testifying in their own defense in just such voices. Emotion played upon too harshly and too long results in a sort of anesthesia, and emphasis becomes impossible. My name's Beth Cardner, Elizabeth Cardner, she began without preliminary. I am the wife of Lawrence Cardner, the sculptor. You know him? No? No matter. I am twenty-nine years old and have been married three years. My husband and I have known each other since childhood. Our families had adjoining houses in the city and adjoining country places at Seagird. My husband and I, and his twin brother Alonzo, played together on the beach and in the ocean in the summer, and went to school together in the winter, though the boys were two grades above me being three years older. They looked so much alike that no one but their family and I who was with them so much that I was almost like a sister, could tell them apart. And Lonnie was always getting into trouble for things which Larry did. Sometimes they'd change clothes, and one would go to call on the girl with whom the other had an engagement, and no one ever knew the difference. They never fooled me, though. I could usually tell them by a slight difference in their voices. But if I weren't quite sure, there was one infallible clue. Lonnie had a little scar behind his left ear. I struck him there with a sand spade when he was six and I was three. He and Larry had been teasing me, and I flew into a fury. He happened to be nearer and got the blow. I was terribly frightened after I'd done it, and cried far more than he did. The wound wasn't really serious, but it left a little white scar, not more than half an inch in length, which never disappeared. So when the boys would try to play a joke on me, I'd make them let me turn their ears forward. Then I could be certain which was Lonnie and which Larry. When the war came and the boys were seventeen, both were wild to go. 
but their father wouldn't let them. Finally, Larry ran away and joined the Canadians. They weren't particular in checking up on ages in Canada those days. Before Larry had been gone three weeks, his brother joined him, and they were both assigned to the same regiment. Larry was given a lieutenancy shortly after he joined up, and Lonnie was made a subaltern before they sailed for France. Both boys were slightly gassed at the Second Battle of the Marne, and were in recuperation camp until the termination of hostilities. They came back together, in uniform, of course, in nineteen, and I was in a perfect frenzy of hero worship. I fell madly in love with both of them. Both loved me, too, and each asked me to marry him. It was hard to choose between them, but Lonnie, the one I'd marked with my spade when we were kids, was a little sweeter, a little gentler than his brother, and finally I accepted him. Larry showed no bitterness, and the three of us continued as close, firm friends, even after the engagement, as we'd been before. Lonnie was determined to become a painter, while Larry had ambitions to become a sculptor, and they went off to Paris for a year of study together as always. We were to be married when they returned, and Larry was to be best man. We'd hoped to have a June wedding, but the boys' studies kept them abroad till mid-August, so we decided to postpone it till Thanksgiving Day, and both the boys came down to Seagirt to spend the remainder of the season. There was a girl named Charlotte Day stopping at a neighbor's house, a lovely creature, exquisitely made with red-gold hair and topaz eyes and skin as white as milk. Larry seemed quite taken with her, and she with him, and Lonnie and I began to think that he'd found consolation there. We even wished, in that romantic way young lovers have, that Larry'd hurry up and pop the question so we could have a double wedding in November. You remember I told you our houses stood beside each other. We'd always been so intimate that I'd been like a member of the Cardiner family, even before I was engaged to Lonnie. We never thought of knocking on each other's doors, and if I wanted anything from the Cardiners or they wanted anything from our house, we were as apt to enter through one of the French windows opening on the verandas as we were to go through the front door. One evening, after Lonnie and I had said good night, I happened to remember that I'd left a book in the Cardiner library, and I especially wanted that book early next morning, for it had a recipe for Sally Lunn in it and I wanted to get up early and make some as a surprise for Lonnie next morning at breakfast. So I just ran across the intervening lawn and up the veranda steps, intent on going through the library window, getting the book, and going back to bed without saying anything to anybody. I'd just mounted the steps and started down the porch toward the library when Lonnie loomed up in front of me. He'd slipped on his pajamas and beach robe and had been sitting on a porch rocker. Beth! he exclaimed in a sort of nervous, almost frightened way. "'Why, yes, it's I,' I answered, putting my hand in his and continuing to walk toward the library window. "'You mustn't come any farther,' he suddenly told me, dragging me to a stop by the hand which he'd been holding. "'You must go back, Beth.' "'Why, Lonnie?' I exclaimed in amazement. Being told I couldn't go and come at will in the Cardiner house was like being slapped in the face.' "'You must go back, please,' he answered in a sort of embarrassed, stubborn way. "'Please, Beth, I can't explain, dear, but please go quickly.' There was nothing else to do, so I went. I couldn't speak, and I didn't want him to see me crying and know how much he'd hurt me. I didn't go back to my room. Instead, I walked across the stretch of lawn behind the house, down to the beach, and sat there on the sand. It was a bright September night— and the full moon made it almost light as day, so I couldn't help seeing what followed. I had sat there on the beach for fifteen minutes, possibly when I happened to look back. The boys' rooms opened on the side veranda, and to reach the library one had to pass them. Part of the porch was full-roofed and consequently in shadow. The remainder was roofed with slats like a pergola, and the moonlight illuminated it almost as brightly as it did the beach and the back lawn. As I glanced back across my shoulder, I saw two figures emerge from one of the French windows leading to the boys' rooms, which one I couldn't be sure, but it looked like Lonnie's. One was a man in pajamas and beach robe. The other was a woman, clothed only in a light nightdress, kimono, and sandals. I sat there in a sort of stupor, too surprised and horrified to move or make a sound, and as I looked, the moonlight glinted on the girl's gold hair. 
It was Charlotte Day. While I sat watching them, I saw him take her in his arms and kiss her. Then she ran down the steps with a little laugh, calling back across her shoulder, See you in the morning, Lonnie. Lonnie, I couldn't believe it. There must be some mistake. The twins were still as like as reflections in a mirror. People were always mistaking them, but see you in the morning, Lonnie, kept dinning in my brain, like the surging of the surf at my feet. The world seemed crumbling into dust beneath me, while that endless laughing refrain kept singing in my ears. See you in the morning, Lonnie. The man on the porch stood looking after the retreating figure of the girl as she ran across the lawns to the house where she was stopping, then drew a pack of cigarettes and a lighter from the pocket of his robe. As he bent to light the cigarette, he turned toward the ocean and saw me sitting on the sand. Next instant he turned and fled, ran headlong to the window of his room, and disappeared in the darkness. What I had seen made me sick, actually physically sick. I wanted to run into the house and fling myself across my bed and cry my heart out, but I was too weak to rise, so I just slumped down on the sand, buried my face in my arms, and began to cry. I didn't know how long I'd been lying there, praying that my heart would actually break and that I'd never see another sunrise when I felt a hand upon my shoulder. Why, Beth, somebody said, whatever is the matter? It was one of the boys, which one I couldn't be sure, and he was dressed in corduroy slacks, a sweater, and a cap. The bearhead craze hadn't struck the country in those days. Who are you? I sobbed, for my eyes were full of tears and I couldn't see very plainly. Is it Larry or... Larry, it is, old thing, he assured me with a laugh. Old Lawrence in the flesh and blood, ready to do his Boy Scout's good daily deed by comforting a lady in distress. I've been taking a little tramp down the beach, looking at the moon and feeling grand and lonesome and romantic, and I come home to find you crying here, as if these sands didn't get enough salt water every day. Where's Lonnie? Lonnie, I began, but he cut in before I had a chance to finish. Don't tell me you two have quarreled. Why, this was to have been his big night. One of his big nights. The old cuss intimated that he'd be able to bear my absence with true Christian fortitude this evening, as he had some very special spooning to do. So I sought consolation of the Titian-haired Charlotte, only to be told that she too had a heavy date. Ergo, as we used to say at college, here is Lawrence by his loan, after walking over ten miles of beach and looking over several thousand miles of ocean. Want to go for a swim before you turn in? Go get your bathing clothes. I'll be with you in a jiff. He turned to run toward the house, but I called him back. Larry, I asked. You're sure Lonnie hinted that he'd like to be alone tonight? Certain sure. Honest true. Black and blue cross my heart and hope to die, he answered. The old duffer almost threw me out bodily. He was so anxious to see me go. And Charlotte, I persisted. Did she say what, with whom? her engagement for this evening was? Why, no, he answered. I say, see here, old girl, you're not getting green-eyed, are you? Why, you know there's only one woman in the world for Lonnie, and— Is there? I interrupted grimly. I'll say there is, and you're it, spelled with a capital I, just as Charlotte is the one for me. Have I your blessing when I ask her to be Mrs. Lawrence Gardner tomorrow, Beth? I'd have done it tonight if she hadn't put me off. I couldn't stand it. Lonnie had betrayed us both, made a mockery of the love I'd given him, and debauched the girl his brother loved. Before I realized it, I'd sobbed the whole tale out on Larry's shoulder, and before I was through we were holding each other like a pair of lost babes in the wood, and Larry was crying as hard as I. He was the first to recover his poise. No use crying over a tin of spoiled beans, as we used to say in the army, he told me. He and Charlotte can have each other if they want. I'm through with her, and him too, the two-faced, double-crossing swine. Keep your tail up, old girl. Don't let him know you know how much he's hurt you. Don't let him know you know about it at all. Just give him back his ring and let him go his way without an explanation. Will you take the ring back to him now? I asked. Surest thing, he promised. But don't ask me to make explanations. I'm digging out tomorrow. Off to Paris the day after. Goodbye, old dear, and better luck next time. 
I was up early next morning, too. By sunrise, I was back in Harrisonville, breaking every speed regulation on the books on the drive up from Seagirt. By noon, I had my application filed for a passport. Three days later, I sailed for England on the Vauban. An aunt of mine was married to a London barrister, and I stopped with her a while. Lonnie wrote me every day at first, but I sent his letters back unopened. Finally, he came to see me, but I wouldn't meet him. He came back twice, but before he could call the third time, I packed and rushed off to the country. Larry wrote me frequently, and from him I learned that Lonnie had joined the Spanish Foreign Legion, which was fighting the rifts, later that he had been discharged and was making quite a name for himself as a painter of Oriental landscapes. He did some quite good portraits, too, and was almost famous when I came back to America after being four years abroad. Lonnie tried to see me, but I managed to avoid him, except at parties when there were others about, and finally he stopped annoying me. Three years ago I was married to Larry Cardner, but Lonnie wasn't our best man. Indeed, we had a very quiet wedding, timed to take place while he was away. Larry seemed to have forgotten all his rancor against Lonnie, and Lonnie was at our house a great deal. I avoided him at first, but gradually his old sweetness and gentleness won me back, and though I could never quite forget his perfidy to me, somehow I think that I forgave him. He was a changed man, madame, de Grandin asked softly, as the woman halted in her narrative and sat passively, staring sightlessly ahead, hands folded motionless in her lap. No, she answered in that oddly uninflected tone. He was less changed than Larry, a little older, a little more serious, perhaps, but still the same sweet, ingenuous lad I'd known and loved so long ago. Larry had become quite grey. Early greyness runs in the Cardiner family, while Lonnie had only a single grey streak running backward from his forehead, where a riff sabre had slashed his scalp. He'd picked up an odd trick, too, of brushing his moustache ever so lightly with his bent forefinger when he was puzzled. He explained this by the fact that most of the officers in the Spanish Legion wore full moustaches, different from the close-cropped ones affected by the British, and that he'd followed the custom but never quite got used to the extra hair on his face. Now, though he'd gone back to the clipped moustache of his young manhood, the Legion mannerism persisted. I can see him now, when he and Larry were having an argument over some point of art technique, and Larry got the best of it. He was always cleverer than Lonnie. How he'd raise his bent finger, and brush first one side of his moustache, then the other. Hmm, de Grandin commented and as he did so unconsciously raised his hand to tweak the needle-pointed ends of his own trimly waxed weak blonde moustache. One quite understands, madame. And then? Larry had done well with his art, she answered. He'd had some fine commissions and executed all successfully, but somehow he seemed changing. For one thing, since prohibition, he'd taken to drinking rather heavily. "'said he had to do it entertaining business prospects, "'though that was no excuse for his consuming a bottle of port "'and half a pint of whiskey nearly every evening after dinner. "'Quel magnifique!' de Grandin broke in softly. "'Then, pray, proceed, madame. "'He was living beyond our means, too. "'As soon as he began to be successful, "'he discarded the studio at the house "'and rented a pretentious one downtown.' Often he spent the night there, and though I didn't actually know it for a fact, I understood he often gave elaborate parties there at night, parties which cost a lot more than we could afford. I never understood it, for Larry didn't take me into his confidence at all. But early this spring he seemed desperately in need of money. He tried to borrow everywhere, but no one would lend to him. Finally he went to his father. Mr. Cardner was a queer man. Easy going in most ways, but very hard in others. He absolutely refused to lend Larry a cent, but offered to advance him what he needed on his share of his inheritance. He'd made a will in which the boys were co-legatees, each to have one half the estate, you see. Larry accepted eagerly, then went back for several more advances, until his share was almost dissipated. Then she paused, not in a fit of weeping, not even with a sob, but rather as though she had come to an impasse. Yes, madame. Then? 
the Grandin prompted softly. Then came the scandal. Mr. Cardner was found dead, murdered, in his library one morning, slashed and cut almost to ribbons with a painter's palette knife. The second man who answered the door the night before they found him was a new servant, but he had seen Larry several times and Lonnie once. He testified that Lonnie came to the house about ten o'clock, quarreled violently with his father, and left in a rage twenty minutes or half an hour later. He identified Lonnie positively by the gray streak in his hair, which was otherwise dark brown, and by the fact that he brushed his mustache nervously with the knuckle of his right forefinger, both when he demanded to see his father and when he left. After Lonnie had gone, the servant went to the library but found the door locked and received no answer to his rapping. He thought Mr. Cardiner was in a rage, as he had been on several occasions when Larry had called so he made no attempt to break into the room. But next morning, when they found Mr. Cardner hadn't slept in his bed and the library door was still locked, they broke in and found him murdered. Hmm? de Grandin murmured noncommittally. And were there further clues, madame? Yes, unfortunately. On the library table, so plainly marked in blood that it could not be mistaken, was the print of Lonnie's whole left hand. Not just a fingerprint, but the entire palm and fingers. Also on the pallet knife with which the killing had been done. They found Lonnie's fingerprints. Hmm, repeated Jules de Grandin. He was at pains to put the noose around his neck, this one. So it seemed, agreed our passenger. Lonnie denied being at his father's house that night, or any night within a month, but there was no way he could prove an alibi. He lived alone having his studio in his house, and his servants, a man and wife, went home every night after dinner. They weren't there the night of the murder, of course. Then there was that handprint and those finger marks upon the knife. Eh bien, madame, de Grandin answered. That is the hardest nut of all to crack, the deepest river of them all to ford. Human witnesses may lie, human memories may fail or be woefully inexact, but fingerprints, handprints, no, it is not so. Me, I was too many years associated with the service sûreté not to learn as much. What laymen commonly deride as circumstantial evidence is the best evidence of them all. I would rather base a case on it than on the testimony of a hundred human witnesses, all of whom might be either honestly mistaken or most unmitigated liars. If you can but explain away— I can, the girl broke in with her first show of animation. Listen, last year, six months before the murder, three months before Larry made his first request for funds from his father, he began making a collection of casts of famous hands as a hobby. When he told Lonnie he wanted to include his among them, Lonnie nearly went into hysterics at the idea. But he consented to let Larry take a cast. I don't know much about such things, but isn't it customary to take such impressions directly in Plaster of Paris? Plaster of Paris, but certainly— the Frenchman answered with a puzzled frown. Why is it that you ask? Because Larry took the impression of his brother's hands in gelatin. Grand Dieu des artichauts! exclaimed de Grandin. In gelatine! Oh, never to be sufficiently anathematized treachery! One begins to see the glimmer of a little so small gleam of light in this dark case, madame. Say on. I shake, parbleu, I quiver with attention. For the first time she looked directly at him, nodding her small head. At the trial Larry admitted that he'd had advances from his father, but declared he'd gotten them for Lonnie. He proved it, too. Proved it? de Grandin echoed. How do you mean, madame? Just what I say. The cancelled checks were shown in court by Mr. Cardner's executor, and every one of them had been endorsed and cashed by Lonnie. Lonnie swore Larry asked him to cash them for him so that no one could trace the money, because he was afraid of attachment proceedings. But Larry denied this under oath and offered his bank books in substantiation of his claim. None of them showed deposits of any such amounts as he'd had from his father. De Grandin clutched his little hands to fists and beat the knuckles against his temples. Mon Dieu, he moaned. This case will be the death of me, madame. See if I apprehend you rightly. It appeared to those who sat in court, 
he checked the items off upon his fingers, that Monsieur Lawrence, at the risk of incurring paternal displeasure, secured loan after loan on his inheritance, ostensibly for himself, but actually for his brother. He proves he turned his father's loans intact over to Monsieur Alonso. His brother says he cashed the checks and gave the cash back. This is denied. Furthermore, proof, or rather lack of proof, that the brother ever banked such sums is offered. Sitting as we do behind the scenes, we may suspect that Monsieur Lawrence is indulging in double dealing. But did we sit out in the theatre as did that judge and jury? Should we not have been fooled as well? I think so. What makes you sure that they were wrong and we are right, madame? I do not cast aspersion on your intuition. I merely ask to know. I have proof, she answered levelly. When Lani had been sentenced and the governor refused to intervene, even to commute his sentence to life imprisonment, it seemed to me that I'd go wild. All these years I'd thought I hated Lani for what he did that night so long ago. When I finally brought myself to see and talk with him, I thought the hatred had lulled to mere resentment, passive dislike. I was wrong. I never hated Lonnie. I'd always loved him, only I loved my foolish, selfish pride more. What if he did? What if he and Charlotte Day— Oh, you understand. Lots of men, most men, I suppose, have affairs before marriage, and their wives and the world think nothing of it. Why should I have set myself up as the exception and demanded greater purity in the man I took to husband than most wives ask or get? When I realized there was no hope for Lonnie, I was nearly frantic, and last night after dinner I begged Larry to try to think of some way we could save him. He'd been drinking more than ever lately. Last night he was sottish, beastly. Why should I try to save the poor fool? he asked. Do you think I've been to all the trouble to put him where he is just to pull him out? Then, drunkenly, boastfully, he told me everything. It wasn't Lonnie whom I'd seen with Charlotte Day that night at Seagirt. It was Larry. When Lonnie said good night to me and went into the house, he heard Larry and Charlotte in Larry's room, which was next to his. He knocked upon the door and demanded that Larry take her out of there at once, even threatening to tell their father if his order weren't obeyed immediately. Larry tried to argue, but finally agreed for he seemed frightened when Lonnie threatened to tell Mr. Cardner. Lonnie, furious with his brother and the day girl, came out on the veranda to see that Charlotte actually left, and was sitting there when I came up the porch to get the cookbook. He wanted to spare me the humiliation of seeing Larry that way, and demanded that I go back at once. The poor lad was so anxious to help me that his manner was unintentionally rough. I'd just been gone a moment when Larry and Charlotte came out. Larry saw me crying on the sand, and the whole scheme came to him like an inspiration. "'Call me Lonnie,' he whispered to Charlotte as they said good night. And the spiteful little minx did it. Then he rushed back to his room, pulled outdoor clothes on over his pajamas, and made a circuit of the house, waiting in the shadows till he saw me bow my head upon my arm, then running noiselessly across the lawn and beach, till he was beside me and ready to play his little comedy. He hated Lonnie for taking me away from him, and you know how the old proverb says, those whom we have injured are those whom we hate most? His hatred seemed to grow and grow as time went on. Finally he evolved this scheme to murder Lonnie. After he'd made the gelatin mold of Lonnie's hands, he made a rubber casting from it, like a rubber stamp, you know, and then began importuning his father for money. Each time he'd get a check, he'd have Lonnie cash it for him and put the money in some secret place. Finally, exactly as he'd planned, his father refused to advance him any more, and they quarreled. Then, knowing that the butler, who had known them both since they were little boys, would be away that night, he stained his hair to imitate Lonnie's, called at the house, and impersonated his brother. When his father demanded what he meant by the masquerade, he answered calmly that he'd come to kill him, and intended Lonnie should be executed for the crime. He stabbed his father with a pallet knife he'd stolen from Lonnie's studio almost a year before, hacked and slashed the body savagely, and made a careful print of the rubber hand in blood on the library table. Lonnie's left-handed, you know, and it was the print of his left hand they found on the table, and the prints of his left fingers, which were found marked in blood upon the handle of the knife. Now Larry wins either way. 
Lonnie can't take his legacy under his father's will, for he's been convicted of murdering him. Therefore he can't make a will and dispose of his half of the estate. Larry takes Lonnie's share as his father's sole surviving next of kin capable of inheriting. And he's already got most of his own through the advances he's received and hidden away. A wife can't testify against her husband in a criminal case. But even if I could repeat what he's confessed to me in court, who'd believe me? He need only deny everything. And I'd not only be ridiculed for inventing such a fantastic story, but publicly branded as my brother-in-law's mistress as well. Larry told me that last night, when I threatened to repeat his story to the governor. And Lonnie agreed with him today. Oh, it's dreadful. Ghastly, hideous. An innocent man's going to a shameful death for a crime he didn't commit, and a perfidious villain who admits the crime goes scot-free, enjoying his brother's heritage and gloating over his immunity from punishment. There isn't any God, of course. If there were, he'd never let such things occur. But there ought to be a hell, somewhere, where such things can be adjusted. Madame, de Grandin returned evenly. Do not be deceived. God is not made mock of, even by such scheming clever rogues as him to whom you're married. Furthermore, it is possible that we need not wait the flames of hell to furnish an adjustment of this matter. But what can you or any one do? the girl demanded. No one will believe me. This story is so utterly bizarre. It is certainly decidedly unusual, de Grandin answered noncommittally. Oh, you think that I've invented it too? She wailed despairingly. Oh, God, if there is a God, help. Please help us in our trouble. Quickly, friend Trowbridge, de Grandin cried. Assist me with her. She has swooned. We drew up at my door even as he spoke, and the girl's form trailing between us ascended the steps, let ourselves in and hastened to the consulting room. The Frenchman eased our light burden down upon the divan while I got sal volatile and aromatic ammonia. Madame, de Grandin told her when she had recovered consciousness, you must let us take you home. Home? she echoed almost vaguely, as though the word were strange to her. I haven't any home. The house where he lives isn't home to me, nor is... Nevertheless, madame... It is to that house which you must let us take you. It would be too much to ask that you dissemble affection for one who did so vile a thing, but you can at least pretend to be reconciled to making the best of your helplessness. Please, madame, I beg it of you. But why? she asked wonderingly. I only promise to delay my suicide till Lani is... till he doesn't need me any more. Must I endure the added torture of spending my last few hours with him? Must my agony be intensified by having him gloat over Lonnie's execution? Oh, he'll do it. Never doubt that. I know him. Perhaps, madame, it may be that you shall see that which will surprise you before this business is finished, the Frenchman interrupted. I cannot surely promise anything. That would be too cruel. But be assured that I shall do my utmost to establish justice in this case. How? I do not surely know, but I shall try. Attend me carefully. He crossed the office, rummaged in the medicine cabinet a moment, then returned with a small file in his hand. Do you know what this is? he asked. No, she said wonderingly. It is mercuric cyanide, a poison infinitely stronger and more swift in action than potassium cyanide or mercuric chloride, commonly called corrosive sublimate. You could not buy it. The law forbids its sale to laymen, yet here it is. A little, so small pinch of this white powder on your tongue, and poof, unconsciousness and almost instant death. You want him, eh? Oh, yes, yes. She stretched forth eager hands, like a child begging for a sweetmeat. Very good. You shall go home and hide your intentions as ably as you can. You shall be patient under cruelty. You shall make no bungling effort to destroy yourself like that we caught you at tonight. Meanwhile, we shall do what we can for you and Monsieur Lonnie. If we fail, Madame, this little bottle shall be yours when you demand it of me. Do you agree? Yes, 
she responded. Then falteringly, as though assenting to her own execution, I'm ready to go any time you wish to take me. Cardiner's big house was dark when we arrived, but our companion nodded understandingly. He's probably in the library, she informed us. It's at the back and you can't see the lights from here. Thank you so much for what you've done and what you've promised. Good night. She alighted nimbly and held her hand out in farewell. De Grandin raised her fingers to his lips and, It may well be that we must see your husband upon business, madame, he whispered. When is he most likely to be found at home? Why, he'll probably be here till noon tomorrow. He's usually a late riser. Bien, madame, it may be that we shall be forced to put him to the inconvenience of rising earlier than usual. He answered enigmatically as he brushed her fingers with his lips again. Now what the devil are you up to? I demanded reproachfully as we drove away. You know there's nothing you can do for that poor chap in jail, or for that woman either. It was cruel to hold out hope to Grandin. Even your promise of the poison is unethical. You're making yourself an accessory before the fact to homicide by giving her that cyanide and dragging me into it, too. We'll be lucky if we see the end of this affair without landing in prison. I think not, he denied. I scarcely know how I shall go about it, but I propose a gamble in souls, my friend. Perhaps, with Hussein Obeid's assistance, we may yet win. Who the deuce is Hussein Obeid? Another friend of mine, he answered cryptically. You have not met him, but you will. Will you be good enough to drive into East Melton Street? I do not know the number, but I shall surely recognize the house when we arrive. East Melton Street was one of those odd forgotten backwaters common to all cities, where a heterogeneous foreign population has displaced the ancient quality who once inhabited the brownstone-fronted houses. Italians, Poles, Hungarians, with a sprinkling of other European miscellany dwelt in Melton Street, each nationality occupying almost definite portions of the thoroughfare, as though their territories had been meted out to them. Far toward the water end, where rotting piers projected out into the oily waters of the bay, and the far from pleasant odors of trash-laden barges were wafted landward on every puff of superheated summer breeze, was the Syrian quarter. Here Greeks, Armenians, Arabians, a scattering of Persians, and a horde of indeterminate mixed breeds of the Levant lived in houses which had once been mansions, but were now so sunk in disrepair that the wonder was they had not been condemned long since. Here and there was a house which seemed relatively untenanted, being occupied by no more than ten or a dozen families, but for the most part the places swarmed with patently unwashed humanity. Children whose extreme vocality seemed matched only by their total unacquaintance with soap and water, sharing steps, windows, and iron-slatted fire escapes with slattern women of imposing avoirdupois, arrayed in soiled white nightgowns and unlaced shoes shockingly run over at the heels. De Grandin called a halt before a house set back in what had been a lawn between a fly-blown restaurant where coatless men played dominoes and consumed great quantities of heavy, deadly-looking food, and a billiard academy where rat-faced youths in corset-waisted trousers knocked balls about or perused blatantly colored foreign magazines. The house before which we drew up was so dark I thought it tenantless at first. But as we mounted the low step which stood before its door, I caught a subdued gleam of light from its interior. A moment we paused, inhaling the unpleasant perfume of the dark and squalid street, while de Grandin pulled vigorously at the brass bell knob set in the stone coping of the doorway. It looks as though nobody's home, I hazarded as he rang and rang again, but... Salam alaikum, a soft voice whispered, and the door was opened not wide, but far enough to permit our entrance, by a diminutive individual in black satin waistcoat, loose bloomer-like trousers, and a red tarbouche several sizes too large for him. Aleichum salam, de Grandin answered, returning the salute the other made. We should like to see your uncle on important business, 
Is he to be seen? Bisai, the other answered in a high-pitched, squeaking voice, and hurried down the darkened hall toward the rear of the house. Is your friend his uncle? I asked curiously, for the fellow was somewhere between sixty-five and seventy years of age, rather well advanced to possess an uncle, it seemed to me. The little Frenchman chuckled. By no means, he assured me. Uncle is a euphemism for master with these people, and used in courtesy to servants. I was about to request further information when the little old man returned and beckoned us to follow him. Salam, Hussein Obeid, de Grandin greeted as we passed through a curtained doorway. Es salat we salam alaik. Peace be with thee and the glory. A portly, bearded man in flowing robe of striped linen, red tarbouche, and red Morocco slippers rose from his seat beside the window, touching forehead, lips, and breast with a quick gesture as he crossed the room to take de Grandin's outstretched hand. This, I learned, as the Frenchman introduced us formally, was Dr. Hussein Obeid, one of the world's ten greatest philosophers, and a very special friend of Jules de Grandin's. Dr. Obeid was a big man, not only stout but tall and strongly built, with massive, finely chiseled features, and a curling square-cut beard of black, which gave him somewhat the appearance of an Assyrian Androsphinx. The room in which we sat was as remarkable in appearance as its owner. It was thirty feet at least in length, being composed of the former front and back parlors of the old house, the partitions having been knocked out. Casement windows glazed with richly painted glass opened on a small backyard charmingly planted with grass and flowering shrubs. Three electric fans kept the air pleasantly in motion. Persian rugs were on the polished floor, and the place was dimly lighted by two lamps with pierced brass shades of Turkish fashion. The furniture was an odd conglomeration— lacquered Chinese pieces mingling with eastern ottomans, like enormously overgrown boudoir cushions, with here and there a bit of Indian caneware. Upon a stand was an aquarium in which swam several goldfish of the most gorgeous coloring I'd ever seen, while near the opened windows stood what looked like an ancient refectory table with bits of chemical apparatus scattered over it. The walls were lined from floor to ceiling with bookcases laden with volumes in unfamiliar bindings and glassed-in cabinets in which was ranged a miscellany of unusual objects. Mummified heads, hands, and feet. Bits of clay inscribed with cuneiform characters. Odd weapons and utensils of ancient make fit to be included in the exhibitions of our best museums. A human skeleton, completely articulated, leered at us from a corner of the room. Such was the rest room and workshop of Dr. Hussein Obeid, one of the world's ten greatest philosophers. De Grandin lost no time in coming to the point. Briefly he narrated Beth Cardner's story, beginning with our first glimpse of her in the penitentiary, and ending with our leaving her upon her doorstep. Once years ago, my friend, he finished, on the ancient Jebel Druz, the stronghold of that strange and mystic people who acknowledge neither Turk nor Frenchman as their overlord, I saw you work a miracle. Do you recall? A prisoner had been taken and— I recall perfectly, our host cut in, his deep voice fairly booming through the room. Yes, I remember it well, but it is not well to do such things promiscuously, my little one. The ineffable one has his own plans for our goings and our comings. To gamble in men's souls is not a game which men should play at. Misère de Dieu, de Grandin cried. This is no petty game, I ask, that you should play, mon vieux. Madame Cardner, her plight is pitiful, I grant. But women's hearts have broken in the past, and they will break till time shall be no more. No, it is not for her I ask this thing, but for the sake of justice. Shall ninety million times damned perfidy vaunt itself in pride at the expense of innocence? Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord, truly. But consider. Does he not ever act through human agencies when he performs his miracles? Damn, yes! If there were any way this poor one's innocence could be established, even after death, I should not be here. 
but as it is, he is enmeshed in webs of treachery. No sixty times accursed reasonable man could be convinced he did not do that murder, and the so puerile Anglo-Saxon law, of which the British and Americans prate so boastfully, has its hard rules of evidence which forever bar the truth from being spoken. This monstrous great injustice must not, cannot, be allowed, my friend. Dr. Obeid stroked his black beard thoughtfully. I hesitate to do it, he replied. But for you, my little birdling, and for justice, I shall try. Triomphe! de Grandin cried, rising from his chair and bounding across the room to seize the other in his arms and kiss him on both cheeks. Ah, Satan, thou art stalemated! "'Tomorrow we shall make a monkey of your plans "'and of the plans of that so evil man "'who did your work by damn.' "'Abruptly he sobered. "'You will go with us tomorrow morning?' he demanded. "'Dr. Obeid inclined his head in acquiescence. "'Tomorrow morning,' he replied. "'Then the diminutive, wrinkle-bitten nephew "'who performed the doctor's household tasks "'appeared with sweet black coffee.' and execrable little tarts compounded of pistachio nuts, chopped dates, and melted honey, and we drank and ate and smoked long amber-scented cigarettes, until the tower clock of the nearby Syrian Catholic Church beat out the quarter hour after midnight. It was shortly after ten o'clock next morning when we called at Cardiner's. Dr. Obeid, looking more imposing, if possible, in a suit of silver-gray corduroy and a wide-brimmed black felt hat than he had in eastern robes, towered a full head above de Gronda and six inches over me, as he stood between us and beat a soft tattoo on the porch floor with the ferrule of his ivory-headed cane. It was a most remarkable piece of personal adornment, that cane, longer by a half-foot than the usual walking-stick, it was more like the exaggerated staffs borne by gentlemen of the late Georgian period than any modern cane, and its carven ivory top was made to simulate a serpent's head, scales being reproduced with startling fidelity to life, and little beads of some green-colored stone jade, I thought, being inlaid for the eyes. The wood of the staff was a kind which I could not classify. It was a vague, indefinite color, something between an olive green and granite gray, and overlaid with little intersecting lines, which might have been an imitation of a reptile's scales, or might have been a part of the strange wood's odd grain. We should like to see Monsieur Cardner, began de Grandin, but for once he failed to keep control of the situation. Tell him Dr. Obeid desires to talk with him, broke in our companion in his deep commanding voice. At once, please. He's at breakfast now, sir, the servant answered. If you'll step into the drawing-room and— At once, Hussein Obeid repeated, not with emphasis, but rather inexorably, as one long used to having his orders obeyed immediately and without question. Yes, sir, the butler returned, and led us toward the rear of the house. Striped awnings kept the late summer sun from the breakfast-room's open windows— where a double row of scarlet geranium tops stood nodding in the breeze. At the end of the polished mahogany table in the centre of the room, a man sat facing us, and it needed no second glance to tell us he was Lawrence Cardiner. Line for line and feature for feature, his face was the duplicate of that of the prisoned man whom we had seen the day before. Even the fact that his upper lip was adorned by a close-cropped moustache, while the prisoner was smooth-shaven and his hair was iron-gray, while the convict's close-clipped hair was brown, did not affect the marked resemblance to any degree. "'What the dev he began as the servant ushered us into the room, but Dr. Obeid cut his protest short. "'We are here to talk about your brother,' he announced. "'Huh?' An ugly, sneering smile gathered at the corners of Cardiner's mouth. "'You are, eh? Well?' He pushed the blue willow club plate laden with mutton chops and scrambled eggs away from him and picked up a slice of buttered toast. "'Get on with it,' he ordered. "'You wish to talk about my brother?' "'And you,' Dr. Obeid supplied. "'It is not too late for you to make amends?' 
Amends? The other echoed, amusement showing in his eyes, as he dropped a lump of sugar into his well-creamed coffee and stirred it with his spoon. Amends, repeated Obeid. You still may go before the governor and— Oh, so that's it, eh? My precious wife's been talking to you. Poor dear, she's a little touched, you know. He tapped himself upon the temple significantly. Used to be fearfully stuck on Lani in the old days, and— My friend, Obeid broke in, it is of your immortal soul that we must talk, not of your wife. Is it possible that you will let another bear the stigma of your guilt? Your soul? Cardiner laughed shortly. My soul, is it? he answered. Don't bother about my soul. If you're so much interested in souls, you'd better skip down to Trenton and talk to Lonnie. He's got one now, but he won't have it long. Tonight they're going to... His voice trailed off to nothingness, and his eyes widened as he slowly and deliberately put his spoon down in its saucer. Not fear, but something like a compound of despair and resignation showed in his face as he stared in fascination at Hussein Obeid. I turned to glance at our companion, and a startled exclamation leaped involuntarily to my lips. The big, Semitic-featured face had undergone a startling transformation. The complexion had altered from swarthy tan to pasty gray. The eyes had started from their sockets, white, globular, expressionless as peeled onions. I had seen such horrible protrusion of the optics in corpses far gone in putrefaction, when tissue gas was bloating features out of human semblance. But never had I seen a thing like this in a living countenance. Dr. Obeid's lips were moving, but what he said I could not understand. It was a low, monotonous, sing-song chant in some harsh and guttural language, rising and falling alternately with a majesty and power, like the surging of a wind-swept sea upon the sands. How long he chanted, I have no idea. It might have been a minute, it might have been an hour, for the clock of eternity seemed stopped as the sonorous voice boomed out the harsh, compelling syllables. But finally it was finished and I felt de Grandin's hand upon my arm. "'Come away, my friend,' he whispered in an awestruck tone. "'The cards are dealt and on the table. The first part of our game of souls is started. Prie Dieu that we shall win.' Alonzo Cardiner was sitting at the little table in his cell, not playing cards, although a pack rested beside the Bible on the clean-scrubbed wood, but merely sitting as though lost in thought his elbow on his knee, head propped upon his hand. He did not look up as we came abreast of him, but just sat there staring straight ahead. Monsieur, de Grandin hailed. Monsieur Lonny! The prisoner looked up, but there was no change of expression in his dull and apathetic face. We are come from her, from Madame Beth, the Frenchman added softly. The change which overspread the prisoner's face was like a miracle. It was young again and bright with eagerness, like a lad in love when someone brings him tidings of his sweetheart. "'You've come from her?' he asked incredulously. "'Tell me, is she well? Is she—' "'She is well, mon pauvre, and happier since she has told her story to us. We came upon her yesternight by chance, and she has told us all. Now she asks that we should come to you and bid you be of cheer. Cardiner laughed shortly with harsh mirthlessness. Rather difficult, that, for a man in my position, he rejoined. But— My brother, Dr. Obeid's deep voice lowered to a whisper, but still powerful as the muted rumbling of an organ's bass, broke in upon his bitter speech. You must not despair. Are you afraid to die? Die? A spasm as of pain twitched across the convict's face. No, sir, I don't think so. I've faced death many times before and never was afraid of it. But leaving Beth now when I've just found her again is what hurts most. It's impossible, of course, but if I could only see her once again... You shall. Hussein Obeid promised. Little brother, be confident. That door through which you go tonight is the entrance to reunion with the one you love. 
It is the portal to a new and larger life, and beyond it waits your loved one. Grey-faced horror spread across the prisoner's countenance. You... you mean she's already dead? he faltered. Oh, Beth, my girl, my dear, my dearest dear. She is not dead. She is alive and well, and waiting for you. Obeid's deep, compelling voice cut in. Just beyond that door she waits, my little one. Keep up your courage. You shall surely find her there. Oh? Light seemed to dawn upon the prisoner. You mean that she'll destroy herself to be with me? No, no, she mustn't do it. Suicide's a sin, a deadly sin. I'm going innocent to death. God will judge my innocence, for he knows all. But if she were to kill herself, perhaps we should be separated forever. Tell her that she mustn't do it. Tell her that I beg that she will live until her time has come, and that she'll not forget me while she's waiting. For I'll be waiting, too. Look at me, commanded Obeid suddenly, so suddenly that the frantic man forgot his fears and stopped his protestations short to look with wonder-widened eyes at Hussein Obeid. The Oriental raised his staff and held it toward the wire screen the guards had placed before the cell and as he held it out, it moved. Before our eyes that staff of carven wood and ivory became a living, moving thing, twining itself about the doctor's wrist, rearing its head, and darting forth its bifurcated tongue. Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, murmured Hussein Obeid, then launched into a low-voiced, vibrant cantillation, while the vivified staff writhed and turned its scaly head in cadence to the chant. He did not distort his features as when he cast a spell upon the prisoner's brother, but his face was pale as chiseled marble, and down his high, wide, sloping forehead ran rivulets of sweat as he put the whole force of his soul and mighty body behind the invocation which he chanted. The look upon the convict's face was mystifying. Twin fires, as of a fever, burned in the depths of his cavernous eyes, and his features writhed and twisted as though his soul were racked by the travail of spiritual childbirth. Beth, he whispered hoarsely. Beth! I turned apprehensively toward the prison guard who sat immediately behind us. That he had not cried out at the animation of Obeid's staff and the low-toned invocation of the Oriental ere this surprised me. What I saw surprised me more. The man lounged in his chair, his features dull and disinterested, a look of utter boredom on his face. He saw nothing, heard nothing, noticed nothing. Until tonight, then, little brother, Hussein Obeid was saying softly, Remember and be brave. She will be awaiting you. Come, ordered Jules de Grandin, tugging at my sleeve. The dice are cast. We must wait to read the spots before we can know surely whether we have won. They led him in to die at twenty minutes after ten. Permission to attend the execution had been difficult to get, but Jules de Grandin, with his tireless energy and infinite resource, had obtained it. Hussein Obeid, the little Frenchman, and I accepted seats at the far end of the stiff-backed church-like pew reserved for witnesses, and I felt a shiver of sick apprehension ripple down my spine as we took our places. To watch beside the bed of one who dies when medical science has exhausted its resources is heartbreaking. But to sit and watch a life snuffed out, to see a strong and healthy body turned to so much clay within the twinkling of an eye, that is horrifying. The executioner, a lean, cadaverous man who somehow reminded me of a disillusioned evangelist, stood in a tiny alcove to the left of the electric chair. A heavy piece of oaken furniture raised one low step above the tiled floor of the chamber. The assistant warden and the prison doctor stood between the chair and entrance to the death room, and although this was no novelty to him, I saw the medic finger nervously at the stethoscope which hung about his neck as though it were a badge of office. A partly folded screen at the farther corner of the room obscured another doorway. 
but as we took our seats, I caught a glimpse of a wheeled stretcher with a cotton sheet lying neatly folded on it. Beyond, I knew, waited the autopsy table and the surgeon's knife when the prison doctor had pronounced the execution a success. I breathed a strangling, gasping sigh as a single short imperative tap sounded on the panels of the painted door which led to the death chamber. Silently, on well-oiled hinges, the door swung back, and Alonzo Cardiner stood in readiness to meet the great adventure. His cotton shirt was open at the throat. The right leg of his trousers had been slit up to the knee. As the pitiless white light struck on his head, I saw a little spot was shaved upon his scalp. To right and left were prison guards who held his elbows lightly. Another guard brought up the rear. The chaplain walked before, his prayer book open. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Cardiner's eyes were wide and rapt. The fingers of his right hand closed, not convulsively, but tenderly, as though he took and held another's hand in his. His lips moved slightly, and though no sound came from them, we saw them form a name. Beth. They led him to the chair, but he did not seem to see it. They had to help him up the one low step, his last step in the world, or he would have stumbled on it, for his eyes were gazing down an endless vista where he walked at peace with his beloved, hand in hand. But as they snapped the heavy straps about his waist and wrists and ankles and set the leather helmet on his head, a sudden change came over him. He struggled fiercely at the bonds which held him in the chair and though his face was almost hidden by the deadly headgear clamped upon his skull, his lips were unobscured, and from them came a wailing cry of horrified astonishment. "'Not me!' he screamed. "'Not me! Lonnie, I'm—' Notebook open and pencil poised, as though to make a memorandum, the prison doctor stood before the chair. Now, as the convict screamed in frenzied fear, the pencil tilted forward, as though the doctor wrote— a sudden, sharp, strange whining sounded. Something throbbed and palpitated agonizingly, like stifled heartbeats. The ghastly, pleading cry was checked abruptly as the prisoner's body started up and forward, as though it sought to burst the leathern bonds which held it. The chin and lips went from pale gray to dusky red, like the face of one who holds his breath too long. The hands, fluttering futilely a moment since, were taut and rigid on the chair arms. A moment, or eternity of this, then the grating jar of metal against metal as the switch was thrown and the current was shut off. The straining body dropped back limply in the chair. Again the doctor's pencil tilted forward. Again the whining whirr and the flaccid body started forward, all but bursting through the broad, strong straps which harnessed it into the chair. Then absolute flaccidity, as the current was withdrawn again. The doctor put his book and pencil by and stepped up quickly to the chair. Putting back the prisoner's open shirt, he wore no undershirt, he pressed his stethoscope against the reddened chest exposed to view, listened silently, then, crisp and businesslike, announced his verdict. I pronounce this man dead. White uniformed attendants took the limp form from the chair, wrapped it quickly in a sheet, and wheeled it off to the autopsy table. We signed the roll of witnesses and hurried from the prison, and— Drive, my friend. Drive as though the fiends of fury rode the wind behind us, ordered Jules de Grandin. We must arrive at Madame Cardner's without delay. Right away, immediately, at once. Beth Cardiner met us at the door, the pallor of her face intensified by the sable hue of the black velvet pajamas which she wore. It happened at twenty minutes after ten, she told us as we filed silently into the hall. De Grandin's small eyes rounded with astonishment as he looked at her. Precisément, madame, he acknowledged. But how is it you know? A puzzled look spread on her face as she replied, of course I couldn't sleep, who could in such circumstances, and I kept looking at the clock and saying to myself, What are they doing to my poor boy now? Is he still in the same world with me? 
when I seemed to hear a sort of drumming, whirring noise, something like the deafening vibration you sometimes hear when riding in a motor car. And then a sudden, sharp, agonizing pain shot through me from my head to feet. It was like fire rushing through my veins, burning me to ashes as it ran, and everything went red, then inky black before my eyes. I felt as if I stifled. No, not that. Rather as though every nerve and muscle in my body were suddenly cramping into knots, and at the same time there was a terrible sensation of something from inside me being snatched away in one cruel wrench, as though my heart were dragged out of my breast with a pair of dreadful tongs that burned and seared, even as they tore my quivering body open. If it had lasted, I'd have died, but it left as quickly as it came, and there I was, faint, weak, and numb, but suffering no pain, staggering to the window and gasping for breath. As I reached the window, I looked up, and a shooting star fell across the sky. I knew then, Lonnie was no longer in the same world with me. I was lonely, so utterly devastatingly lonely that I thought my heart would break. I've never had a child, but if I had one and it died, I think that I'd feel as I felt the instant that I saw that falling star. Then, she paused, and again that puzzled, wondering look crept into her eyes. Then something... Something inside me, like a voice heard in a dream, seemed to say insistently, Go to Larry! Go to Larry! I didn't want to go. I didn't want to see him or be near him. I loathed the very thought of him. But that strange, compelling voice kept ordering me to go. So I went. Larry was sitting in the big chair he always uses in the library. His head had fallen back, and his hands were gripping the arms till the fingertips bit into the upholstery. His mouth was slightly open, and his face was pale as death. I noticed as I crossed the room that his feet were well apart, but both flat to the floor. It was— Her voice sank to a husky, frightened whisper. It was as if he were sitting in the death chair, and had just been executed. Um, and did you touch him, madame? de Grandin asked. Yes, I did, and his hands were cold clammy. He was dead. Oh, thank God he was dead. He murdered his poor brother just as surely as he killed his father, but he'll never live to boast of it. He died just as Lonnie did in the chair. Only it wasn't human injustice that took his perjured life away. It was the even-handed judgment of just heaven. And I'm glad. I'm glad. Do you hear me? I'm glad enough to rush out in the street and tell it to the world, to shout it from the housetops. De Grandin cast a sidelong glance at Hussein Obeid, who nodded silently. Perfectly, madame. One understands, the Frenchman answered. Will you go with us and show us the body? It would be of interest. Yes, yes, I'll show you. I'll be glad to show you, she broke in shrilly. Come, this way, please. Grey-faced, hang-jawed, pale and flaccid as only the dead can be, Lawrence Cardiner sat slumped in the big chair beside the book-strewn table. I glanced at him and nodded briefly. No use to make a further examination. No doctor, soldier, or embalmer need be introduced to death. He knows it at a glance. But Hussein Obeid was not so easily assured. Crossing the room, he bent above the corpse, staring straight into the glazed and sightless eyes and murmuring a sort of chanting invocation. Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahman. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, in the name of the one true God. He drew a little packet from his waistcoat pocket, broke the seal which closed it, and dusted a pinch of whitish powder into the palm of his right hand, then rubbed both hands together quickly, as though laving them with soap. In the shadow where he stood we saw his hands begin to glow, as though they had been smeared with phosphorus. But gradually the glow became a quick and flickering faint blue light, which grew and grew in power, till it darted wisps of bluish flame from palms and fingertips. He grasped his serpent-headed staff between his glowing hands, and instantly the thing became alive, waving slowly to and fro, 
darting forth its lambent tongue to touch the dead man's eyes and lips and nostrils. He threw the staff upon the floor, and instantly it was a thing of wood and ivory once again. Now he pressed fire-framed hands upon the corpse's brow, then bent and ran them up and down the length of the slack limbs, finally poising them above the dead man's omphalos. The flame which flickered from his hands curved downward like a blue-green waterfall of fire, which seemed to be absorbed by the dead body as water would be soaked in thirsty soil. And now the flaccid, flabby limbs seemed to tighten, to stretch out jerkily, uneasily, as though awaking from a long, uncomfortable sleep. The lolling head began to oscillate upon the neck, the slack jaw closed, the eyes, a moment since glassy with the vacant stare of death, gave signs of unmistakable vitality. A shrill, sharp cry broke from Beth Cardner. "'He's alive!' she screamed, horror and heart-sick disappointment in her voice. "'Oh, he's alive!' She turned reproachful, tear-dimmed eyes on Hussein Obeid. "'Why did you revive him?' she asked accusingly. "'He might have died if you hadn't—' Her voice broke, smothered in a storm of sobs. Thus far the vibrant hatred of the murderer and her exultation over the swift retribution which had overtaken him had kept her nerve from snapping. Now the realization that the man whose perfidy had betrayed her trust and her lover's life was still alive broke down her resistance, and she fell, half fainting on the couch, buried her face in a pillow, and gave herself up bodily to retching lamentation. Madame! De Grandin's voice was sharp, peremptory. Madame Beth, come here! The woman raised her tear-scarred face and looked at him in wonder. Come here quickly, if you please, and tell me what it is you see, he ordered again. She rose, mechanically like one who walks in sleep, and approached the semi-conscious man who slouched in the big chair. Behold, observe, voila! the Frenchman ordered, leaning down and bending Cardiner's left ear forward. There, plainly marked and unmistakable, imprinted on the skin above the retrahens aurem, was a small white cicatrix, a quarter inch or so in length. Oh! It was a strangling, gasping cry, such as a patient undergoing unanesthetized edentation might give. Wonder was in it, and something like fright as well. The little Frenchman raised his hand for silence. "'He's coming too, madame,' he warned in a soft whisper. Life indeed had come back to the shell above which Dr. Obeyid had chanted. Little by little the dread contours of death had receded, and as the hands lost their rigor and lay half open on the chair arms, we saw the fingers flexing and extending in an easier, more lifelike motion. "'Jodo!' whispered Cardiner rolling his head listlessly from side to side, like one who seeks to rouse himself from an unpleasant dream. "'Jodo!' she repeated in an awed and breathless whisper. "'He never called me that. Way back when we were children, Lonnie and I gave each other intimate names, and I never told mine to a soul, not my parents nor my husband. How—' "'Jodo! Beth, dear!' the half-unconscious man repeated, his fingers searching gropingly for something. "'Are you here? I can't see you, dear, but—' "'Lonnie!' Incredulous, unbelieving joy was in the woman's tones, and— "'Beth! Beth, dearest!' Cardiner started forward, eyes opening and closing rapidly, as though he had come suddenly from darkness into light. "'Beth, they told me you'd be waiting for me. Are you really here?' Here, yes, my dear, my very dearest, I am here, she cried, and sank down to her knees, gathering his head to her bosom and rocking gently back and forth, as though it were a nursing baby. Oh, my dear, my dear, however did you come? I'm dead, he queried timidly. Is this heaven, or heaven? Yes, if I and all my love can make it so, my darling. Beth Cardiner broke in, and stopped his wondering queries with her kisses. Now, what the devil does it mean? 
I asked, as we drove slowly home after taking Dr. Obeid to his house in Melton Street. Jules de Grandin raised his elbows, brows, and shoulders in a shrug, which seemed to say there are some things even a Frenchman cannot understand. You know as much as I, my friend, he returned. You saw it with your own two eyes. What more is there which I can tell you? A lot of things, I countered. You said yourself that once before you'd seen— Assuredly I had, he acquiesced. Me, I see many things, but do I know their meaning? Not always. Par exemple, I say to you, friend Trowbridge, I would that you should drive me here or there, and though you put your foot on certain things and wiggle certain others with your hands, I do not know what you are doing or why you do it. I only know that the car moves, and that we arrive at length where I have wished to go. You comprehend? No, I don't, I answered testily. I'd like to know how it comes that Lawrence Cardner, who, as we know, was a thoroughgoing villain if ever there was one, exchanged or seemed to exchange personalities with the brother whom he sent to death in the electric chair at the very moment of that brother's execution, and how that scar appeared upon his head. His wife vouched for the fact that it wasn't there before. The little Frenchman twisted the needle points of his sharply waxed, wheat blonde moustache until I thought that he would surely prick his finger on them. I cannot say, he answered thoughtfully, because I do not know. The Arabs have a saying that the soul grows on the body like a flower on the stalk. They may be right, who knows? What is the soul? Who knows again? Is it that vague, indefinite thing which we call personality? Perhaps. Suppose it is. Let us assume the flower analogy again. Let us assume that as the skilful gardener takes the blossom from the living rose and grafts it on the living dogwood tree, and thereby makes a rose tree. One skilled in metaphysics can take the soul from out a body at the instant of dissolution, and transplant it to another body from which the soul has just decamped, and thereby create a new and different individual, composed of two distinct parts, a soul, or personality if you please, and a body, neither of which was originally complementary to the other. It sounds strange, insane, but so would talk of total anesthesia or radio have sounded two hundred years ago. As for the scar, that is comparatively simple. You've seen persons under hypnotism lose every drop of blood from one arm or hand, or become completely anemic in one side of the face. You know from medical history, though you may not have seen it, that certain hysterical religious persons develop what are called stigmata, simulations of the bleeding wounds of the Saviour or the martyred saints. That is mental in inception, but physical in manifestation, n'est-ce pas? Why then could not an outward and physical sign of personality be transferred as easily as the inward and spiritual reality? Pardieu, I damn think that it could. But will this spiritual graft endure? I wondered. Will this transformation of Larry Cardner into Lonnie Cardner last? Le bon Dieu knows, he answered. Me, I most greatly hope so. If it does not, I shall have to make my promise good and give her that mercuric cyanide. Time will tell. Time did. A year had passed, and the final summer hop was being given at the Sedgemoor Country Club. The white walls of the clubhouse shone like an illuminated monument in the dusky blue of the late September night. Lights blazed from every window, and colored globes decorated the overhanging roofs of the broad verandas which stretched along the front and rear of the building. In the grounds, Chinese lanterns gleamed with rose, blue, violet, and jade, rivaling the brilliance of the summer stars. Jazz blared from the commodious ballroom and echoed from the big yellow and red striped marquee set up by the first green. Jules de Grandin and I sat on the front piazza and rocked comfortably in wide wicker chairs, the ice cubes in our tall glasses clinking pleasantly. Mon Dieu, my friend, the Frenchman exclaimed enthusiastically. This, uh, what do you call him? Julip? He is divine, magnificent, he is superb. I would I had a tub full of him in which to drown my few remaining sorrows. He sucked appreciatively at the twin straws, thrust between the feathery mint stalks, 
then abruptly, Moldomavi, my friend, look, behold them, he pointed up excitedly. From where we sat, a little balcony projecting from the upper floor was plainly in our line of vision. As the little Frenchman pointed, I saw a man arrayed in summer dancing clothes step out upon the platform and light a cigarette. As he snapped his lighter shut, he raised his left hand and brushed his short, close-cropped moustache with the knuckle of his bent forefinger. He blew a long cone of grey smoke between his lips and turned to someone in the room behind him. As the light struck on his face, I recognized him. It was Lawrence Cardner beyond a doubt, but Lawrence Cardner strangely altered. His hair, once iron-gray, was now almost uniformly brown, save where a single streak of white ran, plume-like, backward from his forehead. A woman joined him on the balcony. She was tall, slender, dark, her little piquant face framed in clusters of curling ringlets. Her lips were red and smiling, her lovely arms and shoulders were exposed by the extreme décolleté of her white crepe evening gown. I knew her, Beth Cardner, but a different woman from the one whose suicide we had balked twelve months before. This Beth was younger, more girlish in face and carriage, and plainly she was happy. He turned and offered her his case, then as she chose a cigarette extended his lighter. She drew the smoke into her lungs, expelled a fine stream from her mouth, then tossed the cigarette away. As it fell to earth in a gleaming, fiery arc, the man tossed his out after it and put his hands upon her shoulders. Her own white hands, fluttering like homing doves, flew upward, clasped about his neck, and drew his face to hers. Their lips approached and merged in a long, rapturous kiss. Tête bleue, my friend. De Grandin cried. I damn think I can keep my mercuric cyanide. She has no use for it, that one. He rose, a thought unsteadily, and beckoned me. Come, let us leave them to each other and their happiness, he ordered. Me, I very greatly desire several more of those so noble mint juleps. Yes. The Thing in the Fog Tiens, on such a night as this the devil must congratulate himself. Jules de Grandin forced his chin still deeper in the upturned collar of his trench coat, and bent his head against the whirls of chilling mist, which eddied upward from the bay in token that autumn was dead, and winter come at last. Congratulate himself? I asked in amusement, as I felt before me for the curbstone with the ferrule of my stick. Why? Why? Par Dieu, because he sits at ease beside the cosy fires of hell, and does not have to feel his way through this eternally to be execrated fog. If we had but the sense— Pardon, monsieur, one of us is very clumsy, and I do not think that it is I. He broke off sharply, as a big young man, evidently carrying a heavier cargo of ardent spirits than he could safely manage, lurched against him in the smothering mist then caromed off at an unsteady angle to lose himself once more in the enshrouding fog. Dolt, the little Frenchman muttered peevishly. If he cannot carry liquor, he should abstain from it. Me, I have no patience with these. Grand Dieu, what is that? Somewhere behind us, hidden in the curtains of the thick grey vapour, there came a muffled exclamation, half of fright, half of anger, the sound of someone fighting threshingly with something else, and a growling, snarling noise, as though a savage dog had leapt upon its prey, and having fleshed its teeth was worrying it. Then, help! The cry was muffled, strangled, but laden with a weight of helpless terror. Hold fast, my friend, we come! de Grandin cried, and guided by the sounds of struggle, breasted through the fog as if it had been water, brandishing his silver-headed sword-stick before him as a guide and a defense. A score of quick steps brought us to the conflict. Dim and indistinct as shadows on a moonless night, two forms were struggling on the sidewalk, a large one lying underneath, while over it, snarling savagely, was a thing I took for a police dog, which snapped and champed and worried at the other's throat. Help! 
called the man again, straining futilely to hold the snarling beast away, and turning on his side, the better to protect his menaced face and neck. Cordieu, a war-dog! exclaimed the Frenchman. Stand aside, friend Trowbridge, he is savage, this one. Mad, perhaps, as well. With a quick whipping motion, he ripped the chilled steel blade from the barrel of his stick, and, point advanced, circled round the struggling man and beast, approaching with a cautious, cat-like step, as he sought an opportunity to drive home the sword. By some uncanny sense the snarling brute divined his purpose, raised its muzzle from its victim's throat, and backed away a step or two, regarding de Grandin with a stare of utter hatred. For a moment I thought I caught the smoldering glare of a pair of fire-red eyes, burning through the fog folds as incandescent charcoal might burn through a cloth, and— A dog? Non, par Dieu! It is— began the little Frenchman, then checked himself abruptly as he lunged out swiftly with his blade, straight for the glaring fiery eyes which glowered at him through the mist. The great beast backed away with no apparent haste, yet quickly enough to avoid the needle-point of Jules de Grandin's blade. And for an instant I beheld a row of gleaming teeth bared savagely beneath the red eye's glare. Then, with a snarling growl which held more defiance than surrender in its throaty rumble, the brute turned lithely, dodged and made off through the fog, disappearing from sight before the clicking of its nails against the pavement had been lost to hearing. "'Look to him, friend Trowbridge,' de Grandin ordered, casting a final glance about us in the mist before he put his sword back in its sheath. "'Does he survive, or is he killed to death?' "'He's alive, all right.' I answered, as I sank to my knees beside the supine man. But he's been considerably chewed up, bleeding badly. We'd best get him to the office and patch him up before— What, what was it? Our mangled patient asked abruptly, rising on his elbow and staring wildly round him. Did you kill it? Did it get away? Do you think it had hydrophobia? Easy on, son, I soothed, locking my hands beneath his arms and helping him to rise. It bit you several times, but you'll be all right as soon as we can stop the bleeding. Here. I snatched a handkerchief from the breast pocket of my dinner coat and pressed it into his hand. Hold this against the wound while we're talking. No use trying to get a taxi tonight. The driver had never find his way about. I live only a little way from here, and we'll make it nicely if you'll lean on me. So that's it. The young man leaned heavily upon my shoulder and almost bore me down, for he weighed a good fourteen stone, as we made our way along the vapor-shrouded street. "'I say, I'm sorry I bumped into you,' the youngster apologized as de Grandin took his other arm and eased me somewhat of my burden. "'Fact is, I'd taken a trifle too much and was walking on a side hill when I passed you.' He pressed the already reddened handkerchief closer to his lacerated neck as he continued with a chuckle. Maybe it's a good thing I did at that, for you were within hearing when I called, because you'd stopped to cuss me out. You may have right, my friend, de Grandin answered with a laugh. A little drunkenness is not to be deplored, and I doubt not you had reason for your drinking. Not that one needs a reason, but— A sudden shrill, sharp cry for help cut through his words followed by another call which stopped half-uttered on a strangled, agonizing note. Then in a moment the muffled echo of a shot, another, and immediately afterward the shrilling signal of a police whistle. "'Tête bleu this night is full of action as a pepper-pot is full of spice!' exclaimed de Grandin, turning toward the summons of the whistle. "'Can you manage him, friend Trowbridge? If so, I—' pounding of heavy boots on the sidewalk straight ahead, told us that the officer approached, and a moment later his form, bulking gigantically in the fog, hove into view. "'Did any of yous see?' he started, then raised his hand in half-formal salute to the visor of his cap as he recognized de Grandin. "'I don't suppose you saw a darg come running by this way, sir?' he asked. "'I was walking up the street a moment since.' getting ready to report at the box when I heard a filly calling for help, and what should I see next but the biggest, ugliest beast of a dog ye ever clapped your eyes upon, a worrying at the poor lad's throat. I was close to it as I'm standing to you, sir, pretty near, and I shot at it twice, 
but I'm damned if I didn't miss both times, slick as a whistle, and me holding a pistol expert's medal from the department, too. Hm? Mm? de Grandin murmured. And the unfortunate man beset by this great beast your bullets failed to hit, what of him? Glory be to God! I plumb forgot him! the policeman confessed. You see, sir, I was that overcome with shame, as the fellow says, when I realised I'd missed the beast that had run after it, hoping I'd find it again, and maybe put a slog into it this time, so... Quite, sir, one understands, de Grandin interrupted. But let us give attention to the man. The beast can wait until we find him, and... Mon Dieu, it is as well you did not stay to give him the first aid, my friend. Your efforts would have been without avail. His case demands the coroner's attention. He did not understate the facts. Stretched on his back, hands clenched to fists, legs slightly spread, one doubled partly under him, a man lay on the sidewalk. Across the white expanse of evening shirt, his opened coat displayed there spread a ruddy stickiness, while his starched white linen collar was already sopping with the blood which oozed from his torn and mangled throat. Both external and anterior jugulars had been ripped away by the savagery which had torn the integument of the neck to shreds, and so deeply had the ragged wound gone that a portion of the hyoid bone had been exposed. A spate of blood had driveled from the mouth, staining lips and chin, and the eyes, forced out between the lids, were globular and fixed and staring, though the film of death had hardly yet had time to set upon them. Holy Mother! cried the officer in horror as he looked upon the body. Sure it were a hound from the devil's own kennels done this, sir. I think that you have right, de Grandin nodded grimly. Call the department, if you will be so good. I will stand by the body. He took a kerchief from his pocket and opened it, preparatory to veiling the poor mangled face, which stared appealingly up at the fog-bound night, but— My God, it's suffrage! the young man at my side exclaimed. I left him just before I blundered into you, and— Oh! What could have done it? The same thing which almost did as much for you, monsieur, the Frenchman answered in a level, toneless voice. You had a very narrow escape from being even as your friend, I do assure you. You mean that dog? He stopped, incredulous, eyes fairly starting from his face— as he stared in fascination at his friend's remains. The dog, yes, let us call it that, de Grandin answered. But, but, the other stammered, then with an incoherent exclamation which was half sigh, half groaning hiccup, slumped heavily against my shoulder and slid unconscious to the ground. De Grandin shrugged in irritation. Now we have two of them to watch, he complained. "'Do you recover him as quickly as you can, my friend, while I—' He turned his back to me, dropped his handkerchief upon the dead man's face, and bent to make a closer examination of the wounds in the throat. I took the handkerchief from my overcoat pocket, ran it lightly over the trunk of a leafless tree which stood beside the curb, and wrung the moisture from it on the unconscious man's face and forehead. Slowly he recovered, gasped feebly, then with my assistance got upon his feet keeping his back resolutely turned to the grisly thing upon the sidewalk. "'Can you help me to your office?' he asked slowly, breathing heavily between the words. I nodded, and we started toward my house, but twice we had to stop. For once he became sick, and I had to hold him while he retched with nausea, and once he nearly fainted again leaning heavily against the iron balustrade before a house while he drew great gulps of chilly, fog-soaked air into his lungs. At last we reached my office, and helping him up to the examination table I set to work. His wounds were more extensive than I had at first supposed. A deep cut, more like the raking of some heavy blunt-pointed claw than a bite, ran down his face from the right temple almost to the angle of the jaw and two deep parallel scores showed on his throat above the collar. A little deeper, a little more to one side, and they would have nicked the interior jugular. About his hands were several tears, as though they had suffered more from the beast's teeth than had his face and throat, 
and as I helped him with his jacket, I saw his shirt front had been slit, and a long raking cut scored down his chest, the animal's claws having ripped through the stiff, starched linen as easily as though it had been muslin. The problem of treatment puzzled me. I could not cauterize the wounds with silver nitrate, and iodine would be without efficiency if the dog were rabid. Finally, I compromised by dressing the chest and facial wounds with potassium permanganate solution and using an electric hot point on the hands, applying laudanum immediately as an anodyne. And now, young fellow, I announced as I completed my work, I think you could do nicely with a tot of brandy. You were drunk enough when you ran into us, heaven knows, but you're cold sober now, and your nerves have been badly jangled, so... So you would be advised to bring another glass. De Grandin's hail sounded from the surgery door. My nerves have been on edge these many minutes, and in addition I am suffering from an all-consuming thirst, my friend. The young man gulped the liquor down in one tremendous swallow, seeing which de Grandin gave a shudder of disgust. Drinking fifty-year-old brandy was a right with him, and to bolt it as if it had been common bootlegged stuff was grave impropriety, almost sacrilege. Doctor, do you think that dog had hydrophobia? Our patient asked, half diffidently. He seemed so savage. Hydrophobia is the illness human beings have when bitten by a rabid dog or other animal, monsieur. De Grandin broke in with a smile. The beast has rabies. The human victim develops hydrophobia. However, if you wish, we can arrange for you to go to Mercy Hospital early in the morning to take the Pasteur treatment. It is effective and protective if you are infected, quite harmless if you are not. Thanks, replied the youth. I think we'd better for... Monsieur, the Frenchman cut him short again. Is your name Maxwell by any chance? Since I first saw you, I have been puzzled by your face. Now I remember. I saw your picture in Le Journal this morning. Yes, said our visitor. I'm John Maxwell, and since you saw my picture in the paper, you know that I'm to marry Sarah Lee on Saturday. So you realize why I'm so anxious to make sure the dog didn't have hydro... rabies, I mean. I don't think Sally'd want a husband she had to muzzle for fear he'd bite her on the ankle when she came to feed him. The little Frenchman smiled acknowledgment of the other's pleasantry, but though his lips drew back in the mechanics of a smile, his little round blue eyes were fixed and studious. "'Tell me, monsieur,' he asked abruptly, "'how came this dog to sit upon you in the fog tonight?' Young Maxwell shivered at the recollection. "'Hanged if I know,' he answered. "'You see, the boys gave me a farewell bachelor dinner at the Carteret this evening,' and there was the usual amount of speech-making and toast-drinking, and by the time we broke up I was pretty well paralyzed, able to find my way about, but not very steadily, as you know. I said good night to the bunch at the hotel, and started out alone, for I wanted to walk the liquor off. You see, a flush suffused his blonde, good-looking face. Sally said she'd wait up for me to telephone her, just like old married folks, and I didn't want to talk to her while I was still thick-tongued. Ray Suffrage, the chap who, the one you saw later, sir, decided he'd walk home too and started off in the other direction, and the rest of them left in taxis. I'd walked about four blocks and was getting so I could navigate pretty well when I bumped into you, then brought up against the railing of a house, while I was hanging on to it trying to get steady on my legs again. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, came that big police dog and jumped on me. It didn't bark or give any warning till it leaped at me, then it began growling. I flung my hands up, and it fastened on my sleeve, but luckily the cloth was thick enough to keep its teeth from tearing my arm. I never saw such a beast. I've had a tussle or two with savage dogs before, and they always jumped away and rushed in again each time I beat them off, but this thing stood on its hind legs and fought me, like a man. When it shook its teeth loose from my coat sleeve, it clawed at my face and throat with its forepaws. That's where I got most of my mauling, and kept snapping at me all the time. Never backed away or even sank to all fours once, sir. I was still unsteady on my legs, and the brute was heavy as a man, so it wasn't long before it had me down. Every time it bit at me, I managed to get my arms in its way, so it did more damage to my clothes than it did to me with its teeth, 
but it surely clawed me up to the queen's taste, and I was beginning to tire when you came running up. It would have done me as it did poor suffrage in a little while, I'm sure. He paused a moment, then with a shaking hand poured out another drink of brandy and tossed it off at a gulp. I guess I must have been drunk, he admitted with a shamefaced grin, for I could have sworn the thing talked to me as it growled. Eh? The devil. Jules de Grandin sat forward suddenly, eyes wider and rounder than before, if possible, the needle points of his tightly waxed wheat blonde moustache twitching like the whiskers of an irritated tomcat. What is it that you say? Hold on, the other countered, quick blood mounting to his cheeks. I didn't say it. I said it seemed as if its snarls were words. Precisément, exactement, quite so, returned the Frenchman sharply. And what was it that he seemed to snarl at you, monsieur? Quickly, if you please. Well, I was drunk, I admit, but... Ten thousand small blue devils, we bandy words. I have asked you a question. Have the courtesy to reply, monsieur. Well, it sounded, sort of, as if it kept repeating Sally's name like this. He gave an imitation of a throaty, growling voice. Sara Lee, Sara Lee, you'll never marry Sara Lee. <laughs> Ever hear anything so nutty? I reckon I must have had Sally in my mind subconsciously while I was having what I thought was my death struggle. It was very quiet for a moment. John Maxwell looked half sullenly, half defiantly from de Grandin to me. De Grandin sat as though lost in contemplation, his small eyes wide and thoughtful, his hands twisting savagely at the waxed ends of his moustache the tip of his patent leather evening shoe beating a devil's tattoo on the white-tiled floor. At length, abruptly, Did you notice any smell, any peculiar odor, when we went to Monsieur Maxwell's rescue this evening, friend Trowbridge? He demanded. Why? I bent my brows and wagged my head in an effort at remembrance. Why, no, I didn't. I stopped, while somewhere from the file-cases of my subconscious memory came a hint of recollection. Soldier's Park, a damp and drizzling day, the open-air dens of the menagerie. Wait, I ordered, closing both eyes tightly while I bade my memory catalogue the vague, elusive scent. Then, yes, there was an odor I've noticed at the zoo in Soldier's Park. It was the smell of the damp fur of a fox or wolf. De Grandin beat his small white hands together softly, as though applauding at a play. Capital perfect, he announced. I smelt it too when first we did approach, but our senses play strange tricks on us at times, and I needed the corroboration of your nose's testimony, if it could be had. Now, he turned his fixed unwinking stare upon me as he asked, have you ever seen a wolf's eyes, or a dog's, at night? Yes, of course, I answered wonderingly. Très bien, and they gleamed with a reflected greenness, something like Madame Pussy's, only not so bright, n'est-ce pas? Yes. Très bon. Did you see the eyes of what attacked Monsieur Maxwell this evening? Did you observe them? I should say I did, I answered, for never would I forget those fiery, glaring orbs. They were red, red as fire. Oh, excellent friend Trowbridge. Oh, prince of all the recollectors of the world, de Grandin cried delightedly. Your memory serves you perfectly, and upholds my observations to the full. Before I guessed, I said to me, Jules de Grandin, you are generally right, but once in many times you may be wrong. See what friend Trowbridge has to say. And you, Pablo, you said the very thing I needed to confirm me in my diagnosis. Monsieur, he turned to Maxwell with a smile. You need not fear that you have hydrophobia, no. You were very near to death, a most unpleasant sort of death, but not to death by hydrophobia. More bleu, that would be an added refinement which we need not take into consideration. Whatever are you talking about? I asked in sheer amazement. You ask me if I noticed the smell that beast gave off and if I saw its eyes. Then tell Mr. Maxwell he needn't fear he's been inoculated. Of all the hair-brained— 
he turned his shoulders squarely on me and smiled assuringly at Maxwell. "'You said that you would call your amoureuse tonight, monsieur. Have you forgotten?' he reminded, then nodded toward the phone. The young man picked the instrument up, called a number and waited for a moment. Then, "'John speaking, honey,' he announced as we heard a subdued click sound from the monophone. Another pause, in which the buzzing of indistinguishable words came faintly to us through the quiet room. Then Maxwell turned and motioned me to take up the extension phone. "'And please come right away, dear,' I heard a woman's voice plead as I clapped the instrument against my ear. "'No, I can't tell you over the phone, but I must see you right away, Johnny. I must. You sure you're all right? Nothing happened to you?' "'Well,' Maxwell temporized. I'm in pretty good shape, everything considered. I had a little tussle with a dog, but... A dog? Stark, incredulous horror sounded in the woman's fluttering voice. What sort of dog? Oh, just a dog, you know, not very big and not very little, sort of betwixt and between, and... You're sure it was a dog? Did it look like a... a police dog, for instance? Well, now you mention it, it... Did look something like a police dog, or Collie, or Airedale, or something, but... John, dear, don't try to put me off that way. This is terribly, dreadfully important. Please hurry over. No, don't come out at night. Yes, come at once, but be sure not to come alone. Have you a sword, or some sort of steel or iron weapon you can carry for defense when you come? Young Maxwell's face betrayed bewilderment. A sword? he echoed. What do you think I am, dear, a knight of old? No, I haven't a sword to my name, not even a jackknife, but... I say, there's a gentleman I met tonight who has a bully little sword. May I bring him along? Oh, yes, please do, dear. And if you can get someone else, bring him too. I'm terribly afraid to have you venture out tonight, dearest, but I have to see you right away. All right, the young man answered. I'll pop right over, honey. As he replaced the instrument, he turned bewilderedly to me. "'Wonder what the deuce got into Sally?' he asked. "'She seemed all broken up about something, and I thought she'd faint when I mentioned my set-to with that dog. What's it mean?' Jules de Grandin stepped through the doorway connecting surgery with consulting room, where he had gone to listen to the conversation from the desk extension. His little eyes were serious, his small mouth grimly set. Monsieur, he announced gravely, it means that Mademoiselle Sarah knows more than any of us what this business of the devil is about. Come, let us go to her without delay. As we prepared to leave the house, he paused and rummaged in the hall coat closet, emerging in a moment, balancing a pair of blackthorn walking sticks in his hands. What? I began, but he cut me short. These may prove useful he announced, handing one to me, the other to John Maxwell. If what I damn suspect is so, he will not greatly relish a thwack from one of these upon the head. No, the thorn bush is especially repugnant to him. <laughs> I should think it would be particularly repugnant to anyone, I answered, weighing the naughty bludgeon in my hand. By the way, who is he? Mademoiselle Sarah will tell us that, he answered enigmatically. Are we ready? Bon, let us be upon our way. The mist which had obscured the night an hour or so before had thinned to a light haze, and a drizzle of rain was commencing as we set out. The Lee House was less than half a mile from my place, and we made good time as we marched through the damp, cold darkness. I had known Joel Lee only through having shared committee appointments with him in the local Republican organization and at the Archdeaconry. He had entered the Consular Service after being retired from active duty with the Marine Corps following a surgeon's certificate of disability, and at the time of his death two years before had been rated as one of the foremost authorities on Near East commercial conditions. Sarah, his daughter, whom I had never met, was by all accounts a charming young woman, equally endowed with brains, beauty, and money, and keeping up the family tradition in the big house in Tuscarora Avenue, where she lived with an elderly maiden aunt as duenna. 
Lee's long residence in the East was evidenced in the furnishings of the long old-fashioned hall, which was like a royal antechamber in miniature. In the softly diffused light from a brass-shaded Turkish lamp, we caught gleaming reflections from heavily carved blackwood furniture and the highlights of a marvelously inlaid Indian screen. A carved table flanked by dragon chairs stood against the wall. The floor was soft as new-mown turf with rugs from China, Turkey, and Kurdistan. "'Miss Sarah's in the library,' announced the negro butler who answered our summons at the door, and led us through the hall to the big high-ceilinged room where Sarah Lee was waiting. Books lined the chamber's walls from floor to ceiling on three sides. The fourth wall was devoted to a bulging bay window which overlooked the garden. Before the fire of cedar logs was drawn a deeply padded divan, while flanking it were great armchairs upholstered in red leather. The light which sifted through the meshes of a brazen lampshade disclosed a tabaret of Indian mahogany on which a coffee service stood. Before the fire the mistress of the house stood waiting us. She was rather less than average height, but appeared taller because of her fine carriage. Her mannishly close-cropped hair was dark and inclined toward curliness, but as she moved toward us I saw it showed bronze glints in the lamplight. Her eyes were large, expressive, deep hazel, almost brown, but for the look of cynicism, almost hardness around her mouth, she would have been something more than merely pretty. Introductions over, Miss Lee looked from one of us to the other with something like embarrassment in her eyes. If she began, but de Grandin divined her purpose and broke in. Mademoiselle, a short time since we had the good fortune to rescue monsieur your fiancé from a dog which I do not think was any dog at all. That same creature, I might add, destroyed a gentleman who had attended monsieur Maxwell's dinner within ten minutes of the time we drove it off. Furthermore, monsieur Maxwell is under the impression that this dog thing talked to him while it sought to slay him. From what we overheard of your message on the telephone, we think you hold the key to this mystery. You may speak freely in our presence, for I am Jules de Grandin, physician and occultist, and my friend Dr. Trowbridge has most commendable discretion. The young woman smiled, and the transformation in her taut, strained face was startling. Thank you, she replied. If you're an occultist, you will understand, and neither doubt me nor demand explanations of things I can't explain. She dropped cross-legged to the hearth rug, as naturally as though she were more used to sitting that way than reclining in a chair, and we caught the gleam of a great square garnet on her forefinger as she extended her hand to Maxwell. Hold my hand while I'm talking, John, she bade. It may be for the last time. Then, as he made a gesture of dissent, abruptly, I cannot marry you, or anyone, she announced. Maxwell opened his lips to protest, but no sound came. I stared at her in wonder, trying futilely to reconcile the agitation she had shown when telephoning with her present deadly apathetic calm. Jules de Grandin yielded to his curiosity. Why not, mademoiselle? he asked. "'Who has forbid the bans?' "'She shook her head dejectedly and turned a sad-eyed look upon him as she answered. "'It's just the continuation of a story which I thought was a closed chapter in my life.' "'Nestling her cheek against young Maxwell's hand, then. "'It began when father was attached to the consulate in Smyrna,' she continued. "'France and Turkey were both playing for advantage, and father had to find out what they planned.' So he had to hire secret agents. The most successful of them was a young Greek named George Athanasakos, who came from Crete. Why he should have taken such employment was more than we could understand, for he was well-educated, apparently a gentleman, and always well supplied with money. He told us he took the work because of his hatred of the Turks, and as he was always successful in getting information, father didn't ask questions. When his work was finished, he continued to call at our house as a guest, and I... I really didn't love him. I couldn't have. It was just infatuation, meeting him so far from home, and the water and that wonderful Smyrna moonlight, and... Perfectly, mademoiselle, 
One fully understands, de Grandin supplied softly as she paused, breathless. And then? Maybe you never succumbed to moonlight and water and strange romantic poetry and music, she half whispered, her eyes grown wider at the recollection. But I was only seventeen, and he was very handsome, and, and he swept me off my feet. He had the softest, most musical voice I've ever heard, and the things he said sounded like something written by Byron at his best. One moonlit night when we'd been rowing, he begged me to say I loved him, and, and I did. He held me in his arms and kissed my eyes and lips and throat. It was like being hypnotized and conscious at the same time. Then, just before we said good night, he told me to meet him in an old garden on the outskirts of the city, where we sometimes rested when we'd been out riding. The rendezvous was made for midnight, and though I thought it queer that he should want to meet me at that time in such a place, well, girls in love don't ask questions, you know. At least I didn't. There was a full moon the next night, and I was fairly breathless with the beauty of it all when I kept the tryst. I thought I'd come too early, for George was nowhere to be seen when I rode up. But as I jumped down from my horse and looked around, I saw something moving in the laurels. It was George, and he'd thrown a cape or cloak of some sort of fur across his shoulders. He startled me dreadfully at first, for he looked like some sort of prowling beast, with the animal's head hanging half down across his face, like the beaver of an ancient helmet. It seemed to me, too, that his eyes had taken on a sort of sinister greenish tinge, but when he took me in his arms and kissed me I was reassured. Then... He told me he was the last of a very ancient clan, which had been wiped out warring with the Turks, and that it was a tradition of their blood that the woman they married take a solemn oath before the nuptials could be celebrated. Again, I didn't ask questions. It all seemed so wonderfully romantic, she added with a pathetic little smile. He had another skin cloak in readiness and dropped it over my shoulders, pulling the head well forward above my face like a hood. Then he built a little fire of dry twigs and threw some incense on it. I knelt above the fire and inhaled the aromatic smoke, while he chanted some sort of invocation, in a tongue I didn't recognize, but which sounded harsh and terrible, like the snarling of a savage dog. What happened next I don't remember clearly, for that incense did things to me. The old garden where I knelt seemed to fade away, and... In its place appeared a wild and rocky mountain scene, where I seemed walking down a winding road. Other people were walking with me, some before, some behind, some beside me, and all were clothed in cloaks of hairy skin like mine. Suddenly, as we went down the mountainside, I began to notice that my companions were dropping to all fours, like beasts. But somehow it didn't seem strange to me, for without realizing it, I was running on my hands and feet, too. Not crawling, you know, but actually running like a dog. As we neared the mountain's foot, we ran faster and faster. By the time we reached a little clearing in the heavy woods, which fringed the rocky hill, we were going like the wind, and I felt myself panting, my tongue hanging from my mouth. In the clearing, other beasts were waiting for us. One great hairy creature came trotting up to me and I was terribly frightened at first, for I recognized it as a mountain wolf. But it nuzzled me with its black snout and licked me, and somehow it seemed like a caress. I liked it. Then it started off across the unplowed field, and I ran after it, caught up with it, and ran alongside. We came to a pool, and the beast stopped to drink, and I bent over the water, too, lapping it up with my tongue. Then I saw the images in the still pond, and almost died of fright, for the thing beside me was a mountain wolf, and I was a she-wolf. My astonishment quickly passed, however, and somehow I didn't seem to mind having been transformed into a beast, for something deep inside me kept urging me on, on to something I didn't quite know what. When we'd drunk, we trotted through a little patch of woodland, and suddenly my companion sank to the ground in the underbrush, and lay there, red tongue lolling from its mouth, 
green eyes fixed intently on the narrow winding path beside which we were resting. I wondered what we were waiting for, and half rose on my haunches to look, but a low warning growl from the thing beside me warned that something was approaching. It was a pair of farm laborers, Greek peasants I knew them to be by their dress, and they were talking in low tones and looking fearfully about as though they feared an ambush. When they came abreast of us, the beast beside me sprang. So did I. I'll never forget the squeaking scream the nearer man gave as I leaped upon him, or the hopeless terrified expression in his eyes as he tried to fight me off. But I bore him down, sank my teeth into his throat, and began slowly tearing at his flesh. I could feel the blood from his torn throat welling up in my mouth, and its hot saltiness was sweeter than the most delicious wine. The poor wretch's struggles became weaker and weaker, and I felt a sort of fierce elation. Then he ceased to fight, and I shook him several times as a terrier shakes a rat. And when he didn't move or struggle, I tore at his face and throat and chest till my hairy muzzle was one great smear of blood. Then all at once it seemed as though a sort of thick white fog were spreading through the forest, blinding me and shutting out the trees and undergrowth and my companion beasts, even the poor boy whom I had killed. And there I was, kneeling over the embers of the dying fire in the old Smyrna garden, with the clouds of incense dying down to little curly spirals. George was standing across the fire from me, laughing, and the first thing I noticed was that his lips were smeared with blood. Something hot and salty stung my mouth, and I put my hand up to it. When I brought it down, the fingers were red, with a thick, sticky liquid. I think I must have started to scream, for George jumped over the fire and clapped his hand upon my mouth. Ugh, I could taste the blood more than ever then, and whispered, Now you are truly mine, star of the morning. Together we have ranged the woods in spirit as we shall one day in body. O oh, true mate of a true Vricolacas! Vrikolakas is a Greek word hard to translate into English. Literally it means the restless dead, but it also means a vampire or a werewolf. And the Vrikolakas are the most dreaded of all the host of demons with which Greek peasant legends swarm. I shook myself free from him. Let me go. Don't touch me. I never want to see you again, I cried. Nevertheless you shall see me again, and again and again, star of the sea he answered with a mocking laugh. You belong to me now, and no one shall take you from me. When I want you, I will call, and you will come to me for. He looked directly into my eyes, and his own seemed to merge and run together, like two pools of liquid, till they were one great disk of green fire. Thou shalt have no other mate than me, and he who tries to come between us dies. See, I put my mark upon you. He tore my riding shirt open and pressed his lips against my side, and next instant I felt a biting sting as his teeth met in my flesh. See? With a frantic, wrenching gesture, she snatched at the low collar of her red silk lounging pajamas, tore the fabric asunder, and exposed her ivory flesh. Three inches or so below her left axilla, in direct line with the gently swelling bulge of her firm high breast, was a small whitened cicatrix, and from it grew a little tuft of long grayish-brown hair, like hairs protruding from a mole, but unlike any body hairs which I had ever seen upon a human being. "'Grand Dieu!' exclaimed de Grandin softly. "'Poil de loup!' "'Yes!' she agreed in a thin, hysterical whisper. It's wolf's hair, I know. I cut it off and took it to a biochemist in London, and he assured me it was unquestionably the hair of a wolf. I've tried and tried to have the scar removed, but it's useless. I've tried cautery, electrolysis, even surgery, but it disappears for only a little while then comes again. For a moment it was still as death in the big dim-lighted room. The little French gilt clock upon the mantelpiece ticked softly, quickly, like a heart that palpitates with terror, 
and the hissing of a burning resined log seemed loud and eerie as night wind whistling round a haunted tower. The girl folded the torn silk of her pajama jacket across her breast and pinned it into place. Then simply, desolately, as one who breaks the news of a dear friend's death, So I cannot marry you, you see, John dear, she said. Why? asked the young man in a low, fierce voice. Because that scoundrel drugged you with his devilish incense and made you think you'd turned into a wolf? Because, because I'd be your murderess if I did so, she responded quiveringly. Don't you remember? He said he'd call me when he wanted me, and anyone who came between him and me would die. He's come for me. He's called me, John. It was he who attacked you in the fog tonight. Oh, my dear, my dear, I love you so, but I must give you up. It would be murder if I were to marry you. Nonsense, began John Maxwell brusquely. If you think that man can... Outside the house, seemingly from underneath the library's bow window, there sounded in the rain-drenched night a wail, long-drawn, pulsating, doleful as the cry of an abandoned soul. <coughs> it rose and fell quavered and almost died away, then resurged with increased force. <coughs> the woman on the hearth-rug cowered like a beaten beast, clutching frantically with fear-numbed fingers at the drugget's pile, half crawling, half writhing toward the brass bars where the cheerful fire burned brightly. Oh, she whimpered as the mournful ululation died away. That's he. He called me once before today. Now he's come again, and— Mademoiselle, restrain yourself. De Grandin's sharp, whip-like order cut through her mounting terror and brought her back to something like normality. You are with friends, he added in a softer tone. Three of us are here, and we are a match for any sacré loup-garou that ever killed a sheep or made night hideous with his howling. Parbleu, but I shall say damn yes. Did I not, all single-handed, already put him to flight once to-night? But certainly. Very well, then. Let us talk this matter over calmly. For, with the suddenness of a discharged pistol, a wild, vibrating howl came through the window once again. It rose against the stillness of the night, diminished to a moan, then suddenly crescendoed upward from a moan to a wail, from a wail to a howl, despairing, pleading, longing as the cry of a damned spirit, fierce and wild as the rally-call of the fiends of hell. Son du diable, must I suffer interruption when I wish to talk? Son de tous les saints, it is not to be borne, de Grandin cried furiously, and cleared the distance to the great bay window in two agile cat-like leaps. Allez! he ordered sharply, as he flung the casement back and leaned far out into the rainy night. Be off, before I come down to you. You know me, eh? A little while ago you dodged my steel, but— A snarling growl replied, and in the clump of rhododendron plants which fringed the garden we saw the baleful glimmer of a pair of fiery eyes. Pablo, you dare defy me, me, the little Frenchman cried, and vaulted nimbly from the window. "'landing sure-footed as a panther on the rain-soaked garden mould, "'then charging at the lurking horror as though it had been harmless as a kitten. "'Oh, he'll be killed! "'No mortal man can stand against a Vricolacas! cried Sara Lee, "'wringing her slim hands together in an agony of terror. "'Oh, God in heaven, spare!' "'A fusillade of crackling shots cut through her prayer, "'and we heard a short, sharp yelp of pain— then the voice of Jules de Grandin hurling imprecations in mingled French and English. A moment later, "'Give me a hand, friend Trowbridge,' he called from underneath the window. "'It was a simple matter to come down, but climbing back is something else again.' "'Merci,' he acknowledged as he regained the library and turned his quick, elfin grin on each of us in turn. Dusting his hands against each other, to clear them of the dampness from the window sill, he felt for his cigarette case, chose a Maryland, and tapped it lightly on his fingernail. Tiens, I damn think he will know his master's voice in future, that one, 
he informed us. I did not quite succeed in killing him to death, unfortunately, but I think that it will be some time before he comes and cries beneath this lady's window again. Yes, had the sale poltron but had the courage to stand against me, I should certainly have killed him, but as it was, he spread his hands and raised his shoulders eloquently. It is difficult to hit a running shadow, and he offered little better mark in the darkness. I think I wounded him in the left hand, but I cannot surely say. He paused a moment, then, seeming to remember, turned again to Sara Lee with a ceremonious bow. Pardon, mademoiselle, he apologized. You were saying, when we were so discourteously interrupted. He smiled at her expectantly. Dr. de Grandin. Wondering incredulity was in the girl's eyes and voice as she looked at him. You shot him, wounded him. Perfectly, mademoiselle. He patted the waxed ends of his moustache with affectionate concern. My marksmanship was execrable, but at least I hit him. That was something. But in Greece, they used to say, I've always heard that only silver bullets were effective against a Vrikolakas, either silver bullets or a sword of finely tempered steel, so... Ah, bah! he interrupted with a laugh. What did they know of modern ordnance, those old-time ritualists? Silver bullets were decreed because silver is a harder metal than lead, and the olden guns they used in ancient days were not adapted to shoot balls of iron. The pistols of today shoot slugs encased in cupronickel, far harder than the best of iron, and with a striking force undreamed of in the days when firearms were a new convention. Tiens, had the good St. George possessed a modern military rifle, he could have slain the dragon at his leisure while he stood a mile away. Had Saint Michel a machine gun, his victory over Lucifer could have been accomplished in thirty seconds by the watch. Having delivered himself of this scandalous opinion, he reseated himself on the divan and smiled at her, for all the world like the family cat which has just breakfasted on the household canary. And how was it that this so valiant runner away from Jules de Grandin announced himself to you, mademoiselle? he asked. I was dressing to go out this morning, she replied. When the phone rang and when I answered it, no one replied to my hello. Then, just as I began to think they'd given someone a wrong number and was about to put the instrument down, there came one of those awful wailing howls across the wire. No word at all, sir. Just that long-drawn, quavering howl, like what you heard a little while ago. You can imagine how it frightened me. I'd almost managed to put George from my mind, telling myself that the vision of lycanthropy which I had in Smyrna was some sort of hypnotism, and that there really weren't such things as werewolves, and even if there were, this was practical America, where I needn't fear them. Then came that dreadful howl, the sort of howl I'd heard— and given in my vision in the Smyrna garden. And I knew there are such things as werewolves, and that one of them possessed me, soul and body, and that I'd have to go to him if he demanded it. Most of all, though, I thought of John, for if the werewolf were in America, he'd surely read the notice of our coming marriage, and the first thing I remembered was his threat to kill anyone who tried to come between us. She turned to Maxwell with a pensive smile. You know how I've been worrying you all day, dear, she asked. How I begged you not to go out to that dinner tonight, and when you said you must, how I made you promise that you'd call me as soon as you got home, but on no account to call me before you were safely back in your apartment. I've been in a perfect agony of apprehension all evening, she told us. And when John called from Dr. Trowbridge's office, I felt as though a great weight had been lifted from my heart. And did you try to trace the call? the little Frenchman asked. Yes, but it had been dialed from a downtown pay station, so it was impossible to find it. De Grandin took his chin between thumb and forefinger, and gazed thoughtfully at the tips of his patent leather evening shoes. Hmm, he murmured. Then, what does he look like, this so gallant persecutor of women, mademoiselle? He is handsome, you have said which is of interest, certainly, but not especially instructive. Can you be more specific? Since he is a Greek, one assumes that he is dark, but— No, he's not, she interrupted. His eyes are blue, and his hair is rather light, though his beard— 
he used to wear one, though he may be smooth-shaven now, is quite dark, almost black. Indeed, in certain lights it seems to have an almost bluish tinge. Ah, so? Une barbe bleue? de Grandin answered sharply. One might have thought as much. Such beards, ma chère, are the sign manual of those who traffic with the devil. Gilles de Retz, the vilest monster who ever cast insult on the human race by wearing human form, was light of hair and blue-black as to beard. It is from him we get the most unpleasant fairy tale of blue beard, though the gentleman who dispatched his wives for showing too much curiosity was a lamb and suckling dove beside the one whose name he bears. Very well. Have you a photograph of him by any happy chance? No. I did have one, but I burned it years ago. A pity, mademoiselle. Our task would be made easier if we had his likeness as a guide. But we shall find him otherwise. How? asked Maxwell and I in chorus. There was a time, he answered, when the revelations of a patient to his doctor were considered privileged communications. Since prohibition came to blight your land, however, and the gangster's gun has written history in blood, the physicians are required to note the names and addresses of those who come to them with gunshot wounds, and this information is collected by the police each day. Now we know that I have wounded this one. He will undoubtedly seek medical assistance for his hurt. Voila, I shall go down to the police headquarters, look upon the records of those treated for injuries from bullets, and by a process of elimination we shall find him, you apprehend? But suppose he doesn't go to a physician, young Maxwell interposed. In that event we have to find some other way to find him, de Grandin answered with a smile. But that is a stream which we shall cross when we have arrived upon its shore. Meantime, he rose and bowed politely to our hostess, it is getting late, mademoiselle, and we have trespassed on your time too long already. We shall convoy Monsieur Maxwell safely home, and see him lock his door, and if you will keep your doors and windows barred, I do not think that you have anything to fear. The gentleman who seems also to be a wolf has his wounded paw to nurse, and that will keep him busy the remainder of the night. With a movement of his eyes he bade me leave the room, following closely on my heels and closing the door behind him. If we must separate them, the least which we can do is give them twenty little minutes for good night, he murmured as we donned our Mackintoshes. Twenty minutes? I expostulated. Why, he could say good night to twenty girls in twenty minutes. We oui, da, certainement. Or a hundred, he agreed. But not to the one girl, my good friend. Ah, bah, friend Trowbridge, did you never love? Did you never worship at the small white feet of some beloved woman? Did you never feel your breath come faster and your blood pound wildly at your temples as you took her in your arms and put your lips against her mouth? If not, grand Dieu d'époque, then you have never lived at all, though you be older than Methuselah. Running our quarry to earth proved a harder task than we had anticipated. Daylight had scarcely come when de Grandin visited the police but for all he discovered he might have stayed at home. Only four cases of gunshot wounds had been reported during the preceding night, and two of the injured men were Negroes, a third a voluble but undoubtedly Italian laborer who had quarreled with some fellow countrymen over a card game, while the fourth was a thin-faced, tight-lipped gangster who eyed us saturninely and murmured, Never mind who'd done it. I'll be seeing him evidently under the misapprehension that we were emissaries of the police. The next day and the next produced no more results. Gunshot wounds there were, but none in the hand, where de Grandin declared he had wounded the nocturnal visitant, and though he followed every lead assiduously, in every case he drew a blank. He was almost beside himself on the fourth day of fruitless search. By evening I was on the point of prescribing triple bromides, for he paced the study restlessly, snapping his fingers, tweaking the waxed ends of his moustache till I made sure he would pull the hairs loose from his lip, and murmuring appalling blasphemies in mingled French and English. At length, when I thought that I could stand his restless striding no longer, diversion came in the form of a telephone call. He seized the instrument peevishly, but no sooner had he barked a sharp, Allô? 
Then his whole expression changed, and a quick smile ran across his face, like sunshine breaking through a cloud. But certainly, of course, assuredly, he cried delightedly. Then to me, your hat and coat, friend Trowbridge, and hurry, pour l'amour dans tes tards, they are marrying. Marrying? I echoed wonderingly. Who? Who but Mademoiselle Sarah and Monsieur Jean Parbleu? He answered with a grin. Oh, la la, at last they show some sense, these ones. He had broken her resistance down, and she consents. Werewolf or no werewolf? Now we shall surely make the long nose at that sacre singe who howled beneath her window when we called upon her. The ceremony was to be performed in the sacristy of St. Barnabas's church, for John and Sarah, shocked and saddened by the death of young Fred Suffrage, who was to have been their best man, had recalled the invitations, and decided on a private wedding with only her aunt and his mother present, in addition to de Grandin and me. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this company, to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, began the rector, Dr. Higginbotham, who, despite the informality of the occasion, was attired in all the panoply of a high church priest, and accompanied by two gorgeously accoutred and greatly interested choir boys, who served as acolytes. Into this holy estate these two persons come now to be joined. If any man can show just cause why they should not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter forever hold his peace. Jeez! exclaimed the choir youth who stood upon the rector's left, letting fall the censer from his hands and dodging nimbly back as from a threatened blow. The interruption fell upon the solemn scene like a bombshell at a funeral, and one and all of us looked at the cowering youngster, whose eyes were fairly bulging from his face, and whose ruddy countenance had gone a sickly, pasty gray, so that the thick-strewn freckles started out in contrast, like spots of rouge upon a corpse's pallid cheeks. Why, William, Dr. Higginbotham began in a shocked voice, but, Rat, tat, tat, sounded the sudden sharp clatter of knuckles against the window pane, and for the first time we realized it had been toward this window the boy had looked when his sacrilegious exclamation broke in on the service. Staring at us through the glass, we saw a great gray wolf. Yet it was not a wolf for about the lupine jaws and jowls was something hideously reminiscent of a human face. And the greenish, phosphorescent glow of those great glaring eyes had surely never shown in any face, animal or human. As I looked, breathless, the monster raised its head, and strangling horror gripped my throat with fiery fingers as I saw a human-seeming neck beneath it. Long and grisly thin it was, corded and sinewed like the desiccated gula of a lich, and like the face covered with a coat of grey-brown fur. Then a hand, hair covered like the throat and face, slim as a woman's, or a mummy's, but terribly misshapen, fingers tipped with blood-red talon nails, rose up and struck the glass again. My scalp was fairly crawling with sheer terror, and my breath came hot and sulphurous in my throat, as I wondered how much longer the frail glass could stand against the impact of those bony hair-gloved hands. A strangled scream behind me sounded from Sarah's aunt, Miss Lee, and I heard the muffled thud as she toppled to the floor in a dead faint. But I could no more turn my gaze from the horror at the window than the fascinated bird can tear its eyes from the serpent's numbing stare. Another sighing exclamation, and another thudding impact. John Maxwell's mother was unconscious on the floor beside Miss Lee, but still I stood and stared in frozen terror at the thing beyond the window. Dr. Higginbotham's teeth were chattering, and his ruddy, plethoric countenance was death-gray as he faced the staring horror, but he held fast to his faith. Coniorote, sceleratissime, abire ad tuum locum, he began the sonorous Latin exorcism, signing himself with his right hand, and advancing his pectoral cross toward the thing at the window with his left. I exorcise thee, most foul spirit, creature of darkness. The corners of the wolf-thing's devilish eyes contracted in a smile of malevolent amusement, 
and a rim of scarlet tongue flicked its black muzzle. Dr. Higginbotham's exorcism, bravely begun, ended on a wheezing, stifled syllable, and he stared in round-eyed fascination, his thick lips blue with terror, opening and closing, but emitting no sound. Son d'un cochon, not that way, monsieur, this, cried Jules de Grandin, and the roar of his revolver split the paralysis of quiet which had gripped the little chapel. A thin silvery tinkle of glass sounded as the bullet tore through the window, and the grisly face abruptly disappeared. But from somewhere in the outside dark there echoed back a braying howl which seemed to hold a sort of obscene laughter in its quavering notes. Sapristi! Have I missed him? de Grandin asked incredulously. No matter, he's gone. On with the service, monsieur le curé, I do not think we shall be interrupted further. No! Dr. Higginbotham backed away from Sarah Lee as though her breath polluted him. I can perform no marriage until that thing has been explained. Someone here is haunted by a devil, a malign entity from hell, which will not heed the exorcism of the church, and until I'm satisfied concerning it, and that you're all good Christians, there'll be no ceremony in this church. Eh bien, monsieur, who can say what constitutes a good Christian? De Grandin smiled unpleasantly at Dr. Higginbotham. Certainly one who lacks in charity as you do cannot be competent to judge. Have it as you wish. As soon as we have recovered these fainting ladies we shall leave, and may the devil grill me on the grates of hell if ever we come back until you have apologized. Two hours later, as we sat in the Lee Library, Sarah dried her eyes and faced her lover with an air of final resolution. You see, my dear, it's utterly impossible for me to marry you, or anyone, she said. That awful thing will dog my steps, and— My poor sweet girl, I'm more determined than ever to marry you, John broke in. If you're to be haunted by a thing like that, you need me every minute, and— Bravo, applauded Jules de Grandin. Well said, mon vieux, but we waste precious time. Come, let us go. Where? asked John Maxwell, but the little Frenchman only smiled and shrugged his shoulders. To Maidstone Crossing, quickly, if you please, my friend, he whispered when he had led the lovers to my car and seen solicitously to their comfortable seating in the tonneau. I know a certain justice of the peace there, who would marry the witch of Endor to the Emperor Nero, though all the wolves which ever plagued Red Riding Hood forbade the bands, provided only we supply him with sufficient fee. Two hours' drive brought us to the little hamlet of Maidstone Crossing, and de Grandin's furious knocking on the door of a small cottage evoked the presence of a lank, lean man, attired in a pair of corduroy trousers drawn hastily above the folds of a canton flannel nightshirt. A whispered colloquy between the rustic and the slim, elegant little Parisian. Then, "'Okay, Doc,' the Justice of the Peace conceded. "'Bring him in. I'll marry him and—' "'Hey, Samuel!' he called up the stairs. "'Come on down and bring your shotgun. "'There's a wedding going to be pulled off, "'and they tell me some fresh guys may try to interfere.' "'Samuel, a lank, lean youth whose costume duplicated that of his father, "'descended the stairway grinning, "'an automatic shotgun cradled in the hollow of his arm. "'Do you expect any real rough stuff?' he asked. "'Seems like they're apt to try and set a dog on them his father answered, and the younger man grinned cheerfully. "'Dogs, is it?' he replied. "'Dogs is my dish. Go on, Pap, do your stuff. Good luck, folks,' he winked encouragingly at John and Sarah, and stepped out on the porch, his gun in readiness. "'Do you take this here woman for your lawful wedded wife?' the justice inquired of John Maxwell, and when the latter answered that he did, "'And do you?' "'Take this here now, man, to be your wedded husband?' he asked Sarah. "'I do,' the girl responded in a trembling whisper, and the roaring bellow of a shotgun punctuated the brief pause before the squire concluded. "'Then by the virtue of the authority vested in me by the law and constitution of this state, I do declare you man and wife, and whoever says that you ain't married lawfully is a danged liar,' he added as a sort of afterthought. What was it that you shot at, Samuel? 
asked the justice, as, enriched by fifty dollars, and grinning appreciatively at the evening's profitable business, he ushered us from the house. "'Turned if I know, Pap,' the other answered. "'Looked kind of funny to me. He was about a head taller than me, and I'm six foot two, and thin as Job's turkey hen to boot. His clothes looked skin-tight on him, and he had on a cap or something with a peak that stuck out over his face. I first seen him coming up this road, kind of looking this way and that, like as if he weren't quite certain of his way. Then, all of a sudden, he kind of stopped and threw his head back, like a dog sniffing the air, and started to go down on his all fours, like he was going to sneak up on the house. So I hauls off and lets him have a tickle of buckshot. Don't know whether I hit him or not, and I'll bet he don't neither. He sure didn't waste no time stopping to find out. Could he run? I'm telling you, that fellow must be in Harrisonville by now, if he kept on going like he started. Two days of feverish activity ensued. Last-minute traveling arrangements had to be made, and passports for John Maxwell and wife, Harrisonville, New Jersey, USA, obtained. De Grandin spent every waking hour with the newly married couple, and even insisted on occupying a room in the Lee house at night but his precautions seemed unnecessary, for not so much as a whimper sounded under Sarah's window. And though the little Frenchman searched the garden every morning, there was no trace of unfamiliar footprints, either brute or human, to be found. Looks as if Sally's Greek boyfriend knows when he's licked, and has decided to quit following her about. John Maxwell grinned, as he and Sarah, radiant with happiness, stood upon the deck of the Ile de France, one hopes so, de Grandin answered with a smile. Good luck, mes amis, and may your lune de miel shine as brightly throughout all your lives as it does this night. La lune? Ah, he repeated half musingly, half with surprise, as though he just remembered some important thing which had inadvertently slipped his memory. May I speak a private warning in your ear, friend Jean? He drew the bridegroom aside and whispered earnestly a moment. Oh, bosh, the other laughed as they rejoined us. That's all behind us, doctor, you'll see. We'll never hear a sound from him. He's got me to deal with now, not just poor Sarah. Bravely spoken, little cabbage, the Frenchman applauded. Bon voyage. But there was a serious expression on his face as we went down the gangway. What was the private warning you gave John? I asked as we left the French line piers. He didn't seem to take it very seriously. No, he conceded. I wish he had, but youth is always brave and reckless in its own conceit. It was about the moon. She has a strange influence on lycanthropy. The werewolf metamorphoses more easily in the full of the moon than at any other time, and those who may have been affected with his virus, though even faintly, are most apt to feel its spell when the moon is at the full. I warned him to be particularly careful of his lady on moonlit nights, and on no account to go anywhere after dark unless he were armed. The werewolf is really an inferior demon, he continued, as we boarded the Hoboken ferry. Just what he is we do not know with certainty, though we know he has existed from the earliest times, for many writers of antiquity mention him. Sometimes he is said to be a magical wolf who has the power to become a man. More often he is said to be a man who can become a wolf at times, sometimes of his own volition, sometimes at stated seasons, even against his will. He has dreadful powers of destructiveness, for the man who is also a wolf is ten times more deadly than the wolf who is only a wolf. He has the wolf's great strength and savagery, but human cunning with it. At night he quests and kills his prey, which is most often his fellow man, but sometimes sheep or hares, or his ancient enemy, the dog. By day he hides his villainy, and the location of his lair, under human guise. However, he has this weakness. Strong and ferocious, cunning and malicious as he is, he can be killed as easily as any natural wolf. A sharp sword will slay him. A well-aimed bullet puts an end to his career. The wood of the thorn-bush and the mountain-ash are so repugnant to him that he will slink away if beaten or merely threatened with a switch of either. Weapons efficacious against an ordinary physical foe are potent against him, 
while charms and exorcisms, which would put a true demon to flight, are powerless. You saw how he mocked at Monsieur Higginbotham in the sacristy the other night, by example. But he did not stop to bandy words with me, or no. He knows that I shoot straight and quick, and he had already felt my lead on one occasion. If young friend Jean will always go well armed, he has no need to fear. But if he be taken off his guard, eh bien, we cannot always be on hand to rescue him, as we did the night when we first met him. No, certainly. But why do you fear for Sarah? I persisted. I hardly know, he answered. Perhaps it is that I have what you Americans so drolly call the hunch. Werewolves sometimes become werewolves by the aid of Satan, that they may kill their enemies while in lupine form, or satisfy their natural lust for blood and cruelty while disguised as beasts. Some are transformed as the result of a curse upon themselves or their families. A few are metamorphosed by accident. These are the most unfortunate of all. In certain parts of Europe, notably in Greece, Russia, and the Balkan states, the very soil seems cursed with lycanthropic power. There are certain places where, if the unwary traveller lies down to sleep, he is apt to wake up with the curse of werewolfism on him. Certain streams and springs there are, which, if drunk from, will render the drinker liable to transformation at the next full moon, and regularly thereafter. You will recall that in the dream, or vision, which Madame Sarah had while in the Smyrna garden so long ago, she beheld herself drinking from a woodland pool. I do not surely know, my friend, I have not even good grounds for suspicion, but something, something which I cannot name, tells me that in some way this poor one, who is so wholly innocent, has been branded with the taint of lycanthropy. How it came about I cannot say, but— My mind had been busily engaged with other problems, and I had listened to his disquisition on lycanthropy with something less than full attention. Now— Suddenly aware of the thing which puzzled me, I interrupted. "'Can you explain the form that the werewolf, if that's what it was, took on different occasions? The night we met John Maxwell, he was fighting for his life with as true a wolf as any there are in the zoological gardens. O'Brien, the policeman, saw it too, and shot at it after it had killed Fred Suffrage. It was a sure enough wolf when it howled under Sarah's window and you wounded it. Yet, when it interrupted the wedding, it was an awful combination of wolf and man, or man and wolf, and the thing the justice's son drove off with his shotgun was the same, according to his description. Surprisingly, he did not take offense at my interruption. Instead, he frowned in thoughtful silence at the dashboard lights a moment, then, Sometimes the werewolf is completely transformed from man to beast, he answered. Sometimes he is a hideous combination of the two, but always he is a fiend incarnate. My own belief is that this one was only partly transformed when we last saw him, because he had not time to wait complete metamorphosis. It is possible he could not change completely, too, because— He broke off and pointed at the sky significantly. Well, I demanded, as he made no further effort to proceed. No, it is not well. He denied. But it may be important. Do you observe the moon tonight? Why, yes. What quarter is it in? The last. It's waning fast. Precisément. As I was saying, it may be that his powers to metamorphose himself were weakened because of the waning of the moon. Remember, if you please, his power for evil is at its height when the moon is at the full, and as it wanes, his powers become less and less. At the darkening of the moon he is at his weakest, and then is the time for us to strike, if only we could find him. But he will lie well hidden at such times, never fear. He is clever with a devilish cunningness, that one. Oh, you're fantastic, I burst out. You say so, having seen what you have seen. Well, I'll admit we've seen some things which are mighty hard to explain, I conceded. But, but we are arrived at home. Monsieur and Madame Maxwell are safe upon the ocean, and I am vilely thirsty, he broke in. Come, let us take a drink and go to bed, my friend. With midwinter came John and Sarah Maxwell back from their honeymoon in Paris and on the Riviera. 
A week before their advent, notices in the society columns told of their homecoming, and a week after their return, an engraved invitation apprised de Grandin and me that the honour of our presence was requested at a reception in the Lee Mansion, where they had taken residence. And please come early and stay late. There are a million things I want to talk about, Sarah penciled at the bottom of our card. Jules de Grandin was more than usually ornate on the night of the reception. His London-tailored evening clothes were knife-sharp in their creases. About his neck hung the insignia of the Légion d'Honneur, a row of miniature medals, including the French and Belgian war crosses, the Médaille Militaire and the Italian Medal of Valor, decorated the left breast of his faultless evening coat. His little wheat-blond moustache was waxed to needle sharpness, and his sleek blond hair was brilliantined and brushed till it fitted flat upon his shapely little head as a skull-cap of beige satin. Lights blazed from every window of the house as we drew up beneath the porte-cochere. Inside all was laughter, staccato conversation, and the odd, not unpleasant odor rising from the mingling of the hundred or more individual scents affected by the women guests. Summer was still near enough for the men to retain the tan of mountain and seashore on their faces, and for a velvet vestige of veneer of painfully acquired sun-tan to show upon the women's arms and shoulders. We tendered our congratulations to the homing newlyweds. Then de Grandin plucked me by the sleeve. "'Come away, my friend,' he whispered in an almost tragic voice. "'Come quickly, or these thirsty ones will have drunk up all the punch containing rum and champagne, and left us only lemonade.' The evening passed with pleasant swiftness, and guests began to leave. "'Where's Sally? Seen her?' asked John Maxwell, interrupting a rather Rabelaisian story which de Grandin was retailing with gusto to several appreciative young men in the conservatory. "'The Carter Brooks are leaving, and—' De Grandin brought his story to a close with the suddenness of a descending theatre curtain, and a look of something like consternation shone in his small round eyes. "'She is not here,' he asked sharply. "'When did you last see her?' "'Oh,' John answered vaguely, "'just a little while ago. We danced the Blue Danube together. Then she went upstairs for something, and—' "'Quick, swiftly,' de Grandin interrupted. "'Pardon, monsieur.' He bowed to his late audience, and, beckoning me, strode toward the stairs. "'I say, what's the rush?' began John Maxwell, but— "'Every reason under heaven,' the Frenchman broke in shortly. "'To me. "'Did you observe the night outside, friend Trowbridge?' "'Why, yes,' I answered. "'It's a beautiful moonlit night, almost bright as day, and—' "'And there you are for the love of ten thousand pigs,' he cut in. Oh, I am the stupid-headed fool, me. Why did I let her from my sight? We followed in wondering silence as he climbed the stairs, hurried down the hall toward Sarah's room, and paused before her door. He raised his hand to rap, but the portal swung away, and a girl stood staring at us from the threshold. Did it pass you? she asked, regarding us in wide-eyed wonder. Pardon, mademoiselle? de Grandin countered. What is it that you ask? Why, did you see that lovely collie? It, cher Dieu. The words were like a groan upon the little Frenchman's lips as he looked at her in horror. Then, recovering himself, Proceed, mademoiselle. It was of a dog you spoke. Yes, she returned. I came upstairs to freshen up, and found I'd lost my compact somewhere, so I came to Sally's room to get some powder. She'd come up a few moments before, and I was positive I'd find her here. But, she paused in puzzlement a moment, then, but when I came in there was no one here. Her dress was lying on the chaise longue there, as though she'd slipped it off, and by the window, looking out with its paws up on the sill, was the loveliest silver collie. I didn't know you had a dog, John, she turned to Maxwell. When did you get it? It's the loveliest creature. But it seemed to be afraid of me, for when I went to pat it, it slunk away and before I realized it had bolted through the door which I'd left open. It ran down the hall. A dog? John Maxwell answered bewilderedly. We haven't any dog, Nell. It must have been— Never mind what it was, de Grandin interrupted as the girl went down the hall. 
and as she passed out of hearing, he seized us by the elbows and fairly thrust us into Sarah's room, closing the door quickly behind us. What? began John Maxwell, but the Frenchman motioned him to silence. Behold, regard each item carefully, stamp them upon your memories, he ordered, sweeping the charming chamber with his sharp, stock-taking glance. A fire burned brightly in the open grate, parchment-shaded lamps diffused soft light. Upon the bed there lay a pair of rose-silk pajamas, with a sheer crepe negligee beside them. A pair of satin mules were placed, toes in upon the bedside rug. Across the chaise longue was draped, as though discarded in the utmost haste, the white satin evening gown that Sarah had worn. Upon the floor beside the lounge were crumpled wisps of ivory crepe de chine, her bandeau and trunks. Sarah, being wholly modern, had worn no stockings, but her white and silver evening sandals lay beside the lingerie, one on its sole, as though she had stepped out of it, the other on its side, gaping emptily, as though kicked from her little pink and white foot in panic haste. There was something ominous about that silent room. It was like a body from which the spirit had departed, still beautiful and warm, but lifeless. Huh, Maxwell muttered. The devil knows where she's gone. He knows very, exceedingly well, I have no doubt, de Grandin interrupted. But we do not. Now, uh, 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 uh. His exclamation rose steadily, thinning to a sharpness like a razor's cutting edge. What have we here? Like a hound upon the trail, guided by a scent alone, he crossed the room and halted by the dressing table. Before the mirror stood an uncorked flask of perfume, lovely thing of polished crystal decorated with silver basket work. From its open neck there rose a thin but penetrating scent, not wholly sweet nor wholly acrid, but a not unpleasant combination of the two as though musk and flower scent had each lent it something of their savours. The little Frenchman put it to his nose, then set it down with a grimace. Name of an Indian pig! How comes this devil's brew here? he asked. Oh, that? Maxwell answered. Hanged if I know, some unknown admirer of Sally's sent it to her. It came today, all wrapped up like something from a jeweler's. Rather pleasant smelling, isn't it? De Grandin looked at him as Torquemada might have looked at one accusing him of loving Martin Luther. "'Did you, by any chance, make use of it, monsieur?' he asked in an almost soundless whisper. "'I? Good Lord, do I look like the sort of he-thing who'd use perfume?' the other asked. "'Bien, I did but ask to know,' de Grandin answered as he jammed the silver-mounted stopper in the bottle and thrust the flask into his trousers' pocket. "'But where the deuce is Sally?' the young husband persisted. "'She's changed her clothes, that's certain. "'But what did she go out for? "'And if she didn't go out, where is she?' "'Ah, uh, it may be that she had a sudden feeling of faintness "'and decided to go out into the air,' the Frenchman temporized. "'Come, monsieur, the guests are waiting to depart, and you must say adieu. "'Tell them that your lady is indisposed. "'Make excuses, tell them anything, but get them all out quickly.' We have work to do. John Maxwell lied gallantly, de Grandin and I standing at his side to prevent any officious dowager from mounting the stairs and administering homemade medical assistance. At last, when all were gone, the young man turned to Jules de Grandin, and— Now, out with it, he ordered gruffly. I can tell by your manner something serious has happened. What is it, man? What is it? De Grandin patted him upon the shoulder with a mixture of affection and commiseration in the gesture. Be brave, mon vieux, he ordered softly. It is the worst. He has her in his power. She has gone to join him. For, pitié de Dieu, she has become like him. What? What? The husband quavered. You mean that she... That Sally, my Sally, has become a where His voice balked at the final syllable, but de Grandin's nod confirmed his guess. Alas, you have said it, my poor friend, he murmured pitifully. 
But how? When? I thought surely we'd driven him off. The young man faltered, then stopped, horror choking the words back in his throat. Unfortunately, no, de Grandin told him. He was driven off, certainly, but not diverted from his purpose. Attend me. From his trousers' pocket he produced the vial of perfume, uncorked it, and let its scent escape into the room. You do recognize it, eh? he asked. No, I can't say I do, Maxwell answered. Do you, friend Trowbridge? I shook my head. Very well. I do, to my sorrow. He turned once more to me. The night Monsieur and Madame Maxwell sailed upon the Ile de France, you may recall I was explaining how the innocent became werewolves at times, he reminded. Yes, and I interrupted to ask about the different shapes that thing assumed, I nodded. You interrupted then, he agreed soberly. But you will not interrupt now. Oh, no, you will listen while I talk. I had told you of the haunted dells where travellers may unknowingly become werewolves, of the streams from which the drinker may receive contagion. But you did not wait to hear of Les Fleurs des Loups, did you? Fleur des Loups? Wolf flowers? I asked. Precisément, wolf flowers. Upon those cursed mountains grows a kind of flower which, plucked and worn at the full of the moon, transforms the wearer into a loup-garou. Yes, one of these flowers, known popularly as the fleur de sang, or blood flower because of its red petals, resembles the marguerite or daisy in form. The other is a golden yellow and is much like the snapdragon. But both have the same fell property. Both have the same strong, sweet, fascinating scent. This, my friends, he passed the open flagon underneath our noses, is a perfume made from the sap of those accursed flowers. It is the highly concentrated venom of their devilishness. One applying it to her person, anointing lips, ears, hair and hands with it as women won't, would as surely be translated into wolfish form as though she wore the cursed flower whence the perfume comes. Yes, that silver collie of which the young girl spoke, monsieur? He turned a fixed but pitying look upon John Maxwell. She was your wife, transformed into a wolf thing by the power of this perfume. Consider, can you not see it all? Balked but not defeated, the vile Vricolacas is left to perfect his revenge while you are on your honeymoon. He knows that you will come again to Harrisonville. He need not follow you. Accordingly, he sends to Europe for the essence of these flowers, prepares a filter from it, and sends it to Madame Sarah today. Its scent is novel, rather pleasing. Women like its strange, exotic scents. She uses it. Anon she feels a queerness. She does not realize that it is the metamorphosis which comes upon her. She only knows that she feels vaguely strange. She goes to her room. Perhaps she puts the perfume on her brow again, as women do when they feel faint. Then... Pardieu, then there comes the change all quickly, for the moon is full tonight, and the essence of the flowers very potent. She doffed her clothes, you think? Mais non, they fell from her. A woman's raiment does not fit on a wolf. It falls off from her altered form, and we find it on the couch and on the floor. That other girl comes to the room and finds poor Madame Sarah, transformed to a wolf, gazing sadly from the window, La pauvre, she knew too well who waited outside in the moonlight for her, and she must go to him. Her friend puts out a hand to pet her, but she shrinks away. She feels she is unclean, a thing apart, one of that multitudinous herd not yet made fast in hell, les loups-garous. And so she flies through the open door of her room. Flies where? Only le bon Dieu and the devil who is master of all werewolves knows. But we must find her. Maxwell wailed. We've got to find her. Where are we to look? De Grandin spread his hands and raised his shoulders. The city is wide, and we have no idea where this wolfman makes his lair. The werewolf travels fast, my friend. They may be miles away by now. I don't care a damn what you say. I'm going out to look for her, Maxwell declared as he rose from his seat and strode to the library table, from the drawer of which he took a heavy pistol. You shot him once and wounded him, so I know he's vulnerable to bullets. And when I find him... But certainly, the Frenchman interrupted, 
We heartily agree with you, my friend. But let us first go to Dr. Trowbridge's house, where we too may secure weapons. Then we shall be delighted to accompany you upon your hunt. As we started from my place, he whispered in my ear, Prepare the knockout drops as soon as we are there, friend Trowbridge. It would be suicide for him to seek that monster now. He cannot hit a barnside with a pistol, cannot even draw it quickly from his pocket. His chances are not one in a million if he meets the wolf, and if we let him go, we shall be playing right into the adversary's hands. I nodded agreement as we drove along, and when I'd parked the car I turned to Maxwell. Better come in and have a drink before we start, I invited. It's cold tonight, and we may not get back soon. All right, agreed the unsuspecting youth. But make it quick, I'm itching to catch sight of that damned fiend. When I meet him, he won't get off as easily as he did in his brush with Dr. de Grandin. Hastily I concocted a punch of Jamaica rum, hot water, lemon juice, and sugar, adding fifteen grains of chloral hydrate to John Maxwell's, and hoping the sugar and lemon would disguise its taste while the pungent rum would hide its odor. To our successful quest, de Grandin proposed, raising his steaming glass and looking questioningly at me for assurance that the young man's drink was drugged. Maxwell raised his goblet, but ere he set it to his lips there came a sudden interruption. An oddly whining, whimpering noise it was, accompanied by a scratching at the door, as though a dog were outside in the night and importuning for admission. Huh? De Grandin put his glass down on the hall table and reached beneath his left armpit, where the small but deadly Belgian automatic pistol nestled in its shoulder holster. Uh-huh. We have a visitor, it seems. To me, he bade. Open the door, wide and quickly, friend Trowbridge, then stand away, for I shall likely shoot with haste, and it is not your estimable self that I desire to kill. I followed his instructions. But instead of the grey horror I had expected at the door, I saw a slender canine form with hair so silver-grey that it was almost white, which bent its head and wagged its tail, and fairly fawned upon us as it slipped quickly through the opening, then looked at each of us in turn with great, expressive topaz eyes. "'Ah! Mon Dieu!' exclaimed the Frenchman, sheathing his weapon and starting forward. "'It is Madame Sarah!' Sally, cried John Maxwell incredulously, and at his voice the beast leaped toward him, rubbed against his knees, then rose upon its hind feet and strove to lick his face. Oi, oh, eh, quel dommage! De Grandin looked at them with tear-filled eyes. Then, your pardon, Madame Sarah, but I do not think you came to us without a reason. Can you lead us to the place where he abides? If so, we promise you shall be avenged within the hour. The silver wolf dropped to all fours again, and nodded its sleek head in answer to his question. Then, as he hesitated, came slowly up to him, took the cuff of his evening coat gently in its teeth, and drew him toward the door. Bravo, ma chère! Lead on, we follow! he exclaimed. Then, as we donned our coats, he thrust a pistol in my hand and cautioned, Watch well, my friend. She seems all amiable, but wolves are treacherous, man-wolves a thousand times more so. It may be he has sent her to lead us to a trap. Should anything untoward transpire, shoot first and ask your foolish questions afterward. That way you shall increase your chances of dying peacefully in bed. The white beast trotting before us, we hastened down the quiet, moonlit street. After forty minutes' rapid walk we stopped before a small apartment house. As we paused to gaze, the little wolf once more seized Jules de Grandin's sleeve between her teeth and drew him forward. It was a little house, only three floors high, and its front was zigzagged with iron fire escapes. No lights burned in any of the flats, and the whole place had an air of vacancy. But our lupine guide led us through the entranceway and down the ground-floor hall until we paused before the door of a rear apartment. De Grandin tried the knob cautiously, found the lock made fast, and after a moment dropped to his knees, drew out a ringful of fine steel instruments, and began picking the fastening as methodically as though he were a professional burglar. 
The lock was burglar-proof, but its makers had not reckoned with the skill of Jules de Grandin. Before five minutes had elapsed, he rose with a pleased exclamation, turned the knob, and thrust the door back. "'Hold her, friend Jean,' he bade John Maxwell, for the wolf was trembling with a nervous quiver, and straining to rush into the apartment. To me, he added, "'Have your gun ready, good friend Trowbridge, and keep by me. He shall not take us unawares.' Shoulder to shoulder we entered the dark doorway of the flat, John Maxwell and the wolf behind us. For a moment we paused while de Grandin felt along the wall. Then, click, the snapping of a wall switch sounded, and the dark room blazed with sudden light. The wolfman's human hours were passed in pleasant circumstances. Every item of the room proclaimed it the abode of one whose wealth and tastes were well matched. The walls were hung with light grey paper. The floor was covered with a Persian rug, and wide low chairs upholstered in long napped mohair invited the visitor to rest. Beneath the arch of a marble mantelpiece a wood fire had been laid, ready for the match, while upon the shelf a tiny French gilt clock beat off the minutes with sharp musical clicks. Pictures in profusion lined the walls. A landscape by an apt pupil of Corot, an excellent imitation of Botticelli, and above the mantel a single life-sized portrait done in oils. Every item of the portrait was portrayed with photographic fidelity, and we looked with interest at the subject, a man in early middle life, or late youth, dressed in the uniform of a captain of Greek cavalry. His cloak was thrown back from his braided shoulders, displaying several military decorations, but it was the face which captured the attention instantly making all the added detail of no consequence. The hair was light, worn rather long, and brushed straight back from a high, wide forehead. The eyes were blue and touched with an expression of gentle melancholy. The features were markedly oriental in cast, but neither coarse nor sensual. In vivid contrast to the hair and eyes was the pointed beard upon the chin, for it was black as coal, yet by some quaint combination of the artist's pigments it seemed to hide blue lights within its sable depths. Looking from the blue-black beard to the sad blue eyes, it seemed to me I saw a hint, the merest faint suggestion, of wolfish cruelty in the face. "'It is undoubtedly he,' de Grandin murmured as he gazed upon the portrait. "'He fits Madame Sarah's description to a nicety. But where is he in person?' We cannot fight his picture, no, of course not. Motioning us to wait, he snapped the light off and drew a pocket flashlight from his waistcoat. He tiptoed through the door, exploring the farther room by the beam of his searchlight, then rejoined us with a gesture of negation. He's not here, he announced softly. But come with me, my friends. I would show you something. He led the way to the adjoining chamber, which in any other dwelling would have been the bedroom. It was bare, utterly unfurnished, and as he flashed his light around the walls we saw, some three or four feet from the floor, a row of paw prints, as though a beast had stood upon its hind legs and pressed its forefeet to the walls, and the prints were marked in reddish smears. Blood. You see? he asked, as though the answer to his question were apparent. He has no bed, he needs none, for at night he is a wolf, and sleeps denned down upon the floor. Also, you observe, he has not lacked for provender. Le bon Dieu grant it was the blood of animals that stained his claws. But where is he? asked Maxwell, fingering his pistol. Shh! warned the Frenchman. I do not think that he is far away. The window, you observe her. Well, précisément, she is a scant four feet from the ground and overlooks the alley. Also, though she was once fitted with bars, they have been removed. Also again, the sash is ready raised. Is it not all perfect? Perfect for what? For him, parbleu, for the werewolf's entrances and exits. He comes running down the alley, leaps agilely through the open window, and voila, he is here. Or he leaps out into the alleyway with a single bound, and goes upon his nightly hunts. He may return at any moment. It is well that we await him here. The waiting minutes stretched interminably. 
The dark room where we crouched was lighted from time to time, then cast again into shadow, as the racing clouds obscured or unveiled the full moon's visage. At length, when I felt I could no longer stand the strain, the low harsh growl from our four-footed companion brought us sharply to attention. In another moment we heard the soft patter-patter, scratch-scratch, of a long-clawed beast running lightly on the pavement of the alleyway outside, and in a second more a dark form bulked against the window's opening and something landed upon the floor. For a moment there was breathless silence. Then, "'Bonsoir, Monsieur Lougarou, de Grandin greeted in a pleasant voice. "'You have unexpected visitors.' "'Do not move.' he added threateningly, as a hardly audible growl sounded from the farther corner of the room, and we heard the scraping of long nails upon the floor, as the wolf-thing gathered for a spring. "'There are three of us, and each one is armed. Your reign of terror draws to a close, monsieur.' A narrow, dazzling shaft of light shot from his pocket-torch, clove through the gloom, and picked the crouching wolf-thing's form out of the darkness. Fangs bared, Black lips drawn back in bestial fury, the gaunt gray thing was backed into the corner, and from its open jaws we saw a thin trickle of slabber mixed with blood. It had been feeding, so much was obvious. But what had been its food, I wondered with a shudder. It is your shot, friend Jean, the little Frenchman spoke. Take careful aim and do not jerk the pistol when you fire. He held his flashlight steadily upon the beast, and a second later came the roar of Maxwell's pistol. The acrid smoke stung in our nostrils, the reverberation of the detonation almost deafened us, and a little fleck of plaster fell down from the wall, where Maxwell's bullet was harmlessly embedded. Ten thousand stinking camels!' Jules de Grandin cried, but got no further, for with a maddened, murderous growl the wolfman sprang, his lithe body describing a graceful arc as it hurtled through the air, his cruel white fangs flashing terribly as he leaped upon John Maxwell and bore him to the floor before he could fire a second shot. Nom de Dieu de nom de Dieu de nom de Dieu! de Grandin swore, playing his flashlight upon the struggling man and brute and leaping forward, seeking for a chance to use his pistol. But to shoot the wolf would have meant that he must shoot the man as well, for the furry body lay upon the struggling Maxwell, and as they thrashed and wrestled on the floor, it was impossible to tell at times, in the uncertain light, which one was man and which was beast. Then came a deep, low growl of pent-up savage fury, almost an articulate curse, it seemed to me, and like a streak of silver-plated vengeance, the little she-wolf leaped upon the grey-brown brute, which growled and worried at the young man's throat. We saw the white teeth bared. We saw them flesh themselves in the wolf-thing's shoulder. We saw her loose her hold and leap back, avoiding the great wolf's counterstroke, then close with it again, sinking needle fangs in the furry ruff about its throat. The great wolf shook her to and fro, battered her against the walls and floor, as a vicious terrier mistreats a luckless rat. But she held on savagely, though we saw her left forepaw go limp and knew the bone was broken. De Grandin watched his chance, crept closer, closer, till he almost straddled the contending beasts. Then, darting forth his hand, he put his pistol to the tawny grey wolf's ear, squeezed the trigger, and leaped back. A wild, despairing wail went up. The great grey form seemed suddenly to stiffen, to grow longer, heavier, to shed its fur and thicken in limbs and body structure. In a moment, as we watched the horrid transformation, we beheld a human form stretched out upon the floor. The body of a handsome man, with fair hair and black beard, at the throat of which a slender, silver-gray she-wolf was worrying. "'It is over. Finished, little brave one,' de Grandin announced, reaching out a hand to stroke the little wolf's pale fur. "'Right nobly have you borne yourself this night, but we have much to do before our work is finished.' The she-wolf backed away but the hair upon her shoulders was still bristling, and her topaz eyes were jewel-bright with the light of combat. 
Once or twice, despite de Grandin's hand upon her neck, she gave vent to throaty growls, and started toward the still form which lay upon the floor in a pool of moonlight, another pool fast gathering beneath its head, where de Grandin's bullet had crashed through its skull and brain. John Maxwell moved and moaned a tortured moan, and instantly the little wolf was by his side, licking his cheeks with her pink tongue, emitting little pleading whines, almost like the whimpers of a child in pain. When Maxwell regained consciousness, it was pathetic to see the joy the wolf showed as he sat up and feebly put a groping hand against his throat. "'Not dead, my friend. You are not nearly dead,' "'Thanks to the bravery of your noble lady,' de Grandin told him with a laugh. Then to me. "'Do you go home with them, friend Trowbridge? "'I must remain to dispose of this,' he prodded the inert form with his foot. "'And we'll be with you shortly.' "'Be of good cheer, ma pauvre,' he told the she-wolf. "'You shall be soon released from the spell which binds you, I swear it, "'though never need you be ashamed of what you did this night.' whatever form you might have had while doing it. John Maxwell sat upon the divan, head in hands. The wolf crouched at his feet, her broken paw dangling pitifully, her topaz eyes intent upon his face. I paced restlessly before the fire. De Grandin had declared he knew how to release her from the spell. But what if he should fail? I shuddered at the thought. What booted it that we had killed the man-wolf if Sarah must be bound in wolfish form henceforth? Tiens, my friends, de Grandin announced himself at the library door. He took a lot of disposing of that one. First I had to clean the blood from off his bedroom floor. Then I must lug his filthy carcass out into the alley and dispose of it, as though it had been flung there from a racing motor. Tomorrow, I doubt not, the papers will make much of the mysterious murder. A gangster put upon the spot by other gangsters, they will say. And shall we point out their mistake? I damn think no. He paused with a self-satisfied chuckle. Then, Friend Jean, will you be good enough to go and fetch a négligé for Madame Sarah? He asked. Hurry, mon vieux, she will have need of it anon. As the young man left us, "'Quick, my friends,' he ordered. "'You, Madame Sarah, lie upon the floor before the fire thus. "'Bien. "'Friend Trowbridge, prepare bandages and splints for her poor arm. "'We cannot set it now, but later we must do so, certainly. "'Now, my little brave one,' he addressed the wolf again, "'this will hurt you sorely, but only for a moment.' "'Drawing a small flask from his pocket, "'he pulled the cork and poured its contents over her. It's holy water, he explained, as she whined and shivered as the liquid soaked into her fur. I had to stop to steal it from a church. A knife gleamed in the firelight, and he drove the gleaming blade into her head, drew it forth and shook it toward the fire, so that a drop of blood fell hissing in the leaping flames. Twice more he cut her with the knife, and twice more dropped her blood into the fire. Then... Holding the knife lightly by the handle, he struck her with the flat of the blade between the ears three times in quick succession, crying as he did so, "'Sarah Maxwell, I command that you once more assume your native form in the name of the Most Holy Trinity!' A shudder passed through the wolf's frame. From nose to tail tip she trembled, as though she lay in her death agony. Then suddenly her outlines seemed to blur. Pale fur gave way to paler flesh. Her dainty lupine paws became dainty human hands and feet. Her body was no more that of a wolf, but of a soft, sweet woman. But life seemed to have gone from her. She lay flaccid on the hearth rug, her mouth a little open, eyes closed, no movement of her breast perceptible. I looked at her with growing consternation, but— Quickly, my friends, the splints, the bandages— de Grandin ordered. I set the broken arm as quickly as I could, and as I finished, young John Maxwell rushed into the room. Sally! Beloved! He fell beside his wife's unconscious form, tears streaming down his face. Is she... is she... he began. 
but could not force himself to finish as he looked imploringly at Jules de Grandin. Dead? the little man supplied. By no means. Not at all, my friend. She is alive and healthy. A broken arm mends quickly, and she has youth and stamina. Put on her robe and bear her up to bed. She will do excellently when she has had some sleep. But first observe this, if you please, he added, pointing to her side. Where the cicatrix with its tuft of wolf hair had marred her skin, there was now only smooth, unspotted flesh. The curse is wholly lifted, he declared delightedly. You need no more regard it, except as an unpleasant memory. John, dear, we heard the young wife murmur as her husband bore her from the room. I've had such a terrible dream. I dreamed that I'd been turned into a wolf and— Come quickly, good friend Trowbridge. De Grandin plucked me by the arm. I too would dream. Dream of what? I asked him. Perchance of youth and love and springtime and the joys that might have been, he answered, something like a tremble in his voice. And then again, perchance of snakes and toads and elephants, all of most unauthentic color. Such things as one may see when he has drunk himself into the blissful state of delirium tremens. I do not surely know if I can drink that much, but may the devil bake me if I do not try. THE HAND OF GLORY 1. THE SHRIEKING WOMAN The tip of the morning to us, gentlemen. Officer Collins touched the visor of his cap as Jules de Grandin and I rounded the corner with none too steady steps. The night was cold, and our host's rum punch had a potency peculiarly its own, which accounted for our decision to walk the mile or so which stretched between us and home. Hola, mon brave! responded my companion, now as ever ready to stop and chat with any member of the gendarmerie. It is morning, you say? Ma foi, I had not thought it much past ten o'clock. Collins grinned appreciatively. There, uh, Dr. de Grandin, sir, he answered. With a bit of the crater the likes of that you've had, tis meself as wouldn't be bothering with the time of night either, for— His witticism died birth-strangled for even as he paused to guffaw at the intended thrust, there came stabbing through the pre-dawn calm a cry of such thin-edged, unspeakable anguish as I had not heard since the days when, as an intern, I rode an ambulance's tale, and amputations often had to be performed without the aid of anesthesia. "'Bon Dieu!' de Grandin cried, dropping my elbow and straightening with the suddenness of a coiled spring released from its tension. What is that, in pity's gracious name? His answer followed fast upon his question, as a pistol's crack succeeds the powder flash, for round the shoulder of the corner building came a girl on stumbling, fear-hobbled feet, arms spread, eyes wide, mouth opened for a scream which would not come, a perfect phantasm of terror. Here, here, now, what's up? demanded Collins gruffly, involuntary fright lending harshness to his tones. "'Tis a fine thing you're after doing, running through the straits in your nighties, scaring folks out of their seven senses, and—' The woman paid him no more heed than if he'd been a shadow, for her dilated eyes were blinded by extremity of fear, as we could see at a glance, and had de Grandin not seized her by the shoulder she would have passed us in her headlong, stumbling flight. At the touch of the Frenchman's hand she halted suddenly, swayed uncertainly a moment. Then, like a marionette whose strings are cut, she buckled suddenly, fell half kneeling, half sprawling to the sidewalk, and lifted trembling hands to him beseechingly. "'It was a fire!' she babbled thickly. "'A fire! Blazing, I tell you! And the door flew open when they held it out! They... they... oh! Whoa! Whoa! Her words degenerated into unintelligible syllables as the tautened muscles of her throat contracted with a nervous spasm, leaving her speechless as an infant, her thin face a white wedge of sheer terror. "'D.T.'s, sir,' asked Collins cynically, bending for a better view of the trembling woman. "'Hysteria,' denied de Grandin shortly. Then to me, "'Assist me, friend Trowbridge. 
She goes into the paroxysmal stage. As he uttered the sharp warning, the woman sank face downward to the pavement, lay motionless a moment, then trembled with convulsive shudders, the shudders becoming twitches and the twitches going into wild, abandoned gestures, horribly reminiscent of the reflex contortions of a decapitated fowl. Good Lord, I'll call the wagon, Collins offered, but a cab, and quickly, if you please, de Grandin countermanded. "'This is no time for making of arrests, my friend. "'This poor one's sanity may depend upon our ministrations.' "'Luckily a cruising taxi hove in sight even as he spoke, "'and with a hasty promise to inform police headquarters "'on the progress of the case, "'we bundled our patient into the vehicle "'and rushed at breakneck speed toward my office. "'Morphine, quickly, if you please.' De Grandin ordered, as he bore the struggling woman to my surgery, thrust her violently upon the examination table, and drew up the sleeve of her Georgette pajama jacket, bearing the white flesh for the caress of the mercy-bearing needle. Swabbing the skin with alcohol, I pinched the woman's trembling arm, inserted the hypopoint in the folded skin, and thrust the plunger home, driving a full three-quarter grain dose into her system. Then, with refilled syringe, "'stood in readiness to repeat the treatment if necessary. "'But the opiate took effect immediately. "'Almost instantly the clownish convulsions ceased. "'Within a minute the movements of her arms and legs "'had subsided to mere tremblings, "'and the choking anguished moans which had proceeded from her throat "'died to little childish whimpers. "'Ah, so,' de Grandin viewed the patient with satisfaction. "'She will be better now, I think.' Meantime, let us prepare some stimulant for the time of her awakening. She has been exposed, and we must see that she does not take cold. Working with the speed and precision of one made expert by long service in the war's field hospitals, he draped a steamer rug across the back of an easy chair in the study, mixed a stiff dose of brandy and hot water and set it by the open fire. Then, calm-eyed but curious, resumed his station beside the unconscious girl upon the table. We had not long to wait. The opiate had done its work quickly, but almost as quickly had found its antidote in the intensely excited nervous system of the patient. Within five minutes her eyelids fluttered, and her head rolled from side to side like that of a troubled sleeper. A little moan, half of discomfort, half involuntary protest at returning consciousness, escaped from her. You are in the office of Dr. Samuel Trowbridge, mademoiselle. De Grandin announced in a low, calm voice, anticipating the question which nine patients out of ten propound when recovering from a swoon. We found you in the street in a most deplorable condition and brought you here for treatment. You're better now? Good. Permettez-moi. Taking her hands in his, he raised her from the table, eased her to the floor, and his arms about her waist, guided her gently to the study, where, with the adeptness of a deck steward, he tucked the steamer rug about her feet and knees, placed a cushion at her back, and before she had a chance to speak, held the glass of steaming toddy to her lips. She drank the torrid liquid greedily, like a starving child gulping at a goblet of warm milk. Then, as the potent draught raced through her, leaving a faint flush on her dead pale cheeks, gave back the glass and viewed us with a pathetic, drowsy little smile. Thank you, she murmured. I... oh... I remember now. Abruptly her half-somnolent manner vanished and her hands clutched claw-like at the chair arms. It was a fire, she told us in a hushed, choking voice. It was blazing and... Mademoiselle, you will drink this if you please. Sharply, incisively, the Frenchman's command cut through her fearful utterance as he held forward a cordial glass half full of cloudy liquid. Startled but docile, she obeyed and a look of swift bewilderment swept across her pale, peaked features as she finished drinking. Why? she exclaimed. Why? Her voice sank lower, her lids closed softly, and her head fell back against the cushion at her shoulders. Voila! I feared that recollection might unsettle her and had it ready, he announced. Do you go up to bed, my friend? Me? I shall watch beside her, and should I need you I shall call. I'm inured to sleeplessness and shall not mind the vigil, but it is well that one of us has rest, for tomorrow, 
Eh bien, this poor one's case has the smell of herring on it, and I damn think that we shall have more sleepless nights than one before we see the end of it. Murmuring, I obeyed. Delightful companion, thoughtful friend, indefatigable co-worker that he was, Jules de Grandin possessed a streak of stubbornness beside which the most refractory mule ever sired in the state of Missouri was docility personified, and I knew better than to spend the few remaining hours of darkness in fruitless argument. 2. THE HAND OF GLORY A gentle murmur of voices sounded from the study when I descended from my room after something like four hours sleep. Our patient of the night before still sat swathed in rugs in the big wing chair, but something approximating normal color had returned to her lips and cheeks. And though her hands fluttered now and again in tremulous gesticulation as she talked, it required no second glance to tell me that her condition was far from bordering on nervous collapse, taut but not stretched dangerously near the snapping point, I diagnosed as I joined them. De Grandin reclined at ease across the fire from her, a pile of burned-out cigarettes in the ashtray beside him, smoke from a freshly lighted Maryland slowly spiraling upward as he waved his hand back and forth to emphasize his words. "'What you tell is truly interesting, mademoiselle,' he was assuring her as I entered the study. "'Trowbridge, mon vieux, this is Mademoiselle Wickwire. Mademoiselle, my friend and colleague, Dr. Samuel Trowbridge. Will you have the goodness to repeat your story to him? I would rather that he had it from your own lips.' The girl turned a wan smile toward me, and I was struck by her extreme slenderness. Had her bones been larger, she would have been distressfully thin." As it was, the covering of her slight skeletal structure was so scanty as to make her almost as ethereal as a sprite. Her hair was fair, her eyes of an indeterminate shade somewhere between true blue and amethyst, and their odd coloration was picked up and accentuated by a chaplet of purple stones about her slender throat, and the purple settings of the rings she wore upon the third finger of each hand. Limbs and extremities were fine-drawn as silver wire, and elongated to an extent which was just short of grotesque, while her profile was robbed of true beauty by its excessive clarity of line. Somehow she reminded me more of a statuette carved from crystal than of a flesh-and-blood woman, while the Georgette pajamas of sea-green, trimmed with amethyst, and the absurd little boudoir cap— which perched on one side of her fair head, helped lend her an air of tailor's dummy unreality. I bowed acknowledgment of de Grandin's introduction, and waited expectantly for her narrative, prepared to cancel ninety percent of all she told me as the vagary of an hysterical young woman. Dr. de Grandin tells me I was screaming that it was burning when you found me in the street last night. She began without preamble. It was. Eh? I ejaculated, turning a quick glance of inquiry on de Grandin. What? The hand? Bless my soul, the what? The hand, she returned, with perfect aplomb. Then, my father is Joseph Wickwire, former Horner Professor of Orientology and Ancient Religion at Dupuy University. You know his book, The Cult of the Witch in Assyria? I shook my head, but the girl, as though anticipating my confession of ignorance, went on without pause. I don't understand much about it, for father never troubled to discuss his studies with me, but from some things he's told me he became convinced of the reality of ancient witchcraft or magic some years ago, and gave up his chair at Dupuy to devote himself to private research. While I was at school he made several trips to the Near East— and last year spent four months in Mesopotamia, supervising some excavations. He came home with two big cases. They looked more like casket boxes than anything else, which he took to his study, and since then no one's been allowed in the room. Not even I or Fanny are made. Father won't permit anything, not even so much as a grain of dust to be taken from that room. And one of the first things he did after receiving those boxes was to have an iron-plated door made for the study, and have heavy iron bars fitted to all the windows. Lately, he's been spending practically all his time at work in the study, sometimes remaining there for two or three days at a time, refusing to answer when called to meals or to come out for rest or sleep. About a month ago, something happened which upset him terribly. I think it was a letter he received. 
though I'm not sure, for he wouldn't tell me what it was. But he seemed distracted, muttering constantly to himself, and looking over his shoulder every now and then, as though he expected someone, or something, to attack him from behind. Last week he had some workmen come and reinforce all the doors with inch-wide strips of cast iron. Then he had special combination locks fitted to the outside doors, and Yale locks to all the inside ones. And every night, just at dusk, he sets the combinations, and no one may enter or leave the house till morning. It's been rather like living in prison. More like a madhouse, I commented mentally, looking at the girl's thin face with renewed interest. Delusions of persecution on the part of the parent might explain abnormal behavior on the part of the offspring, if— the girl's recital broke in on my mental diagnosis. Last night I couldn't sleep. I'd gone to bed about eleven and slept soundly for an hour or so. Then suddenly I sat up, broad awake, and nothing I could do would get me back to sleep. I tried bathing the back of my neck with cologne, turning my pillows, even taking ten grains of alanol. Nothing was any good, so finally I gave up trying and went down to the library. There was a copy of Hallam's Constitutional History of England there and I picked that out as being the dullest reading I could find, but I read over a hundred pages without the slightest sign of drowsiness. Then I decided to take the book upstairs. Possibly, I thought, if I tried reading it in bed, I might drop off without realizing it. I'd gotten as far as the second floor, my room's on the third, and was almost in front of Father's study when I heard a noise at the front door. Any burglar who tries breaking into this house will be wasting his talents, I remember saying to myself, when just as though they were being turned by an invisible hand, the dials of the combination lock started to spin. I could see them in the light of the whole ceiling lamp, which Father insists always be kept burning, and they were turned not slowly, but swiftly, as though being worked by one who knew the combination perfectly. At the same time, the queerest feeling came over me. It was like one of those dreadful nightmares people sometimes have, when they're being attacked or pursued by some awful monster, and can't run or cry out, or even move. There I stood, still as a marble image, every faculty alert, but utterly unable to make a sound or move a finger, or even wink an eye. And as I watched in helpless stillness, the front door swung back silently, and two men entered the hall. One carried a satchel or suitcase of some sort. The other— She paused and caught her breath like a runner nearly spent, and her voice sank to a thin, harsh whisper. The other was holding a blazing hand in front of him. A what? I demanded incredulously. There was no question in my mind that the delusions of the sire were ably matched by the hallucinations of the daughter. A blazing Hand, she answered, and again I saw the shudder of a nervous chill run through her slender frame. He held it forward, like a candle as though to light his way. But there was no need of it for light, for the whole lamp has a hundred-watt bulb, and its luminance reached up the stairs and made everything in the upper passage plainly visible. Besides, the thing burned with more fire than light. There seemed to be some sort of wick attached to each of the fanned-out fingers, and these burned with a clear, steady blue flame, like blazing alcohol. It— But, my dear young lady, I expostulated, that's impossible. Of course it is, she agreed, with unexpected calmness. So is this. As the man with the blazing hand mounted the stairs and paused before my father's study, I heard a distinct click— and the door swung open, unlocked. Through the opening I could see Father standing in the middle of the room, the light from an unshaded ceiling lamp making everything as clear as day. On a long table was some sort of object, which reminded me of one of those little marble stones they put over soldiers' graves in national cemeteries, only it was grey instead of white, and a great roll of manuscript lay beside it. Father had risen and stood facing the door, with one hand resting on the table the other reaching toward a sawed-off shotgun, which lay beside the stone and manuscript. But he was paralyzed, frozen in the act of reaching for the gun, as I had been in the act of walking down the hall. His eyes were wide and set with surprise. No, not quite that. They were more like the painted eyes of a window figure in a store, utterly expressionless. 
and I remember wondering, in that odd way people have, of thinking of inconsequential things in moments of intense excitement, whether mine looked the same. I saw it all. I saw them go through the study's open door, lift the stone off the table, bundle up Father's manuscript and stuff everything into the bag. Then the man with the burning hand going last, walking backward and holding the thing before him, they left as silently as they came. The doors swung to behind them without being touched. The study door had a Yale snap lock in addition to its combination fastenings, so it was fastened when it closed, but the bolts of the safe lock on the front door didn't fly back in place when it closed. I don't know how long that strange paralysis held me after the men with the hand had gone. But I remember suddenly regaining my power of motion and finding myself with one foot raised. I'd been overcome in the act of stepping, and had remained helpless, balanced on one foot the entire time. My first act, of course, was to call Father, but I could get no response, even when I beat and kicked on the door. Then panic seized me. I didn't quite know what I was doing, but something seemed urging me to get away from that house as though it had been haunted, and the horrifying memory of that blazing hand with those combination-locked doors flying open before it came down on me like a cloud of strangling, smothering gas. The front door was still unfastened, as I've told you, and I flung it open, fighting for a breath of fresh outdoors air, and ran screaming into the street. You know the rest. You see? asked Jules de Gronda. I nodded understandingly. I saw only too well. A better symptomatized case of dementia precox it had never been my evil fortune to encounter. There was a long moment of silence, broken by de Gronda. Eh bien, mes amis, we make no progress here, he announced. Grant me fifteen small minutes for my toilette, mademoiselle, and we shall repair to the house of your father. There, I make no doubt, we shall learn something of interest concerning last night's so curious events. He was as good as his promise, and within the stipulated time had rejoined us, freshly shaved, washed, and brushed, a most agreeable odor of bath salts and dusting powder emanating from his spruce, diminutive person. Come, let us go he urged, assisting our patient to her feet and wrapping the steamer rug about her after the manner of an Indian's blanket. 3. The House of the Magician The front entrance of Professor Wickwire's house was closed, but unfastened when we reached our destination, and I looked with interest at the formidable iron reinforcements and combination locks upon the door. Thus far the girl's absurd story was borne out by facts, I was forced to admit, as we mounted the stairs to the upper floor where Wickwire had his barricaded sanctum. No answer coming to de Grandin's peremptory summons, Miss Wickwire tapped lightly on the iron-bound panels. Father, it is I, Diane, she called. Somewhere beyond the door we heard a shuffling step and a murmuring voice, then a listless fumbling at the locks which held the portal fast. The man who stood revealed as the heavy door swung back looked like a fundamentalist cartoonist's caricature of Charles Darwin. The pate was bald, the jaw bearded, the brows heavy and prominent, but where the great evolutionist's forehead bulged with an intellectual swell, this man's skull slanted back obliquely and the temples were flat rather than concave. Also, it required no second glance to tell us that the full beard covered a soft receding chin, and the eyes beneath the shaggy brows were weak with a weakness due to more than mere poor vision. He looked to me more like the sort of person who would spend spare time reading books on development of willpower and personality than poring over ponderous tomes on Assyriology. And though he seemed possessed of full dentition— he mumbled like a toothless ancient as he stared at us, feeble eyes blinking owlishly behind the pebbles of his horn-rimmed spectacles. Magna Mater, Tris Magistus, Salve! We caught the almost unintelligible Latin of his mumbled incantation. Father? Diane Wickwire exclaimed in distress. Father, here are... The man's head rocked insanely from side to side, as though his neck had been a flaccid cord, and— Magna Mater, 
he began again with a whimpering persistence. Monsieur, stop it. I command it, and I am Jules de Grandin. Sharply the little Frenchman's command rang out. Then, as the other goggled at him and began his muttered prayer anew, de Grandin raised his small gloved hand and dealt him a stinging blow across the face. Parbleu, I will be obeyed, me, he snorted wrathfully. Save your conjurations for another time, monsieur. At present we would talk with you. Brutal as his treatment was, it was efficacious. The blow acted like a douche of cold water on a swooning person, and Wickwire seemed for the first time to realize we were present. These gentlemen are doctors Trowbridge and de Grandin, his daughter introduced. I met them when I ran for help last night, and they took me with them. Now they're here to help you. Wickwire stopped her with uplifted hand. I fear there's no help for me, or you, my child, he interrupted sadly. They have the sacred meteorite, and it is only a matter of time till they find the word of power. Then, non d'un coq, monsieur, let us have things logically and in decent order, if you please, de Grandin broke in sharply. This sacred meteorite, this word of powerfulness, this so mysterious they who have the one and are about to have the other, in Satan's name, who and what are they? Tell us from the start of the beginning. We are intrigued, we are interested. Parbleu, we are consumed with the curiosity of a dying cat. Professor Wickwire smiled at him, the weary smile a tired adult might give a curious child. I fear you wouldn't understand, he answered softly. By blue, you do insult my credulity, monsieur, the Frenchman rejoined hotly. Tell us your tale, all, every little so small bit of it, and let us be the judges of what we shall believe. Me, I am an occultist of no small ability, and this so strange adventure of last night assuredly has the flavor of the superphysical. Yes, certainly. Wickwire brightened at the other's words. An occultist, he echoed. Then perhaps you can assist me. Listen carefully, if you please, and ask me anything which you may not understand. Ten years ago, while assembling data for my book on witchcraft in the ancient world, I became convinced of the reality of sorcery. If you know anything at all of medieval witchcraft, you realize that Diana was the patroness of the witches. Even in that comparatively late day, Burchard, Bishop of Worms, writing of sorcery, heresy, and witchcraft in Germany in the year 1000, says, Certain wretched women, seduced by the sorcery of demons, affirm that during the night they ride with Diana, goddess of the heathens, and a host of other women, and that they traverse immense spaces. Now Diana, whom most moderns look upon as a clean-limbed goddess of chastity, was only one name for the great female principle among the pantheon of ancient days. Artemis, or Diana, is typified by the moon, but there is also Hecate, goddess of the black and fearful night, queen of magic, sorcery, and witchcraft, deity of goblins and the underworld, and guardian of crossroads. She was another attribute of the same night goddess whom we know best today as Diana. But back of all the goddesses of night, whether they be styled Diana, Artemis, Hecate, Rhea, Astarte, or Ishtar, is the great mother. Magna Mater. The origin of her cult is so ancient that recorded history does not even touch it, and even oral tradition tells of it only by indirection. Her worship is so old that the Anatolian meteorite brought to Rome in 204 BC compares to it as Christian science or new thought compare an age with Buddhism. Piece by piece, I traced back the chain of evidence of her worship, and finally became convinced that it was not in Anatolia at all that her mother shrine was located, but in some obscure spot, so many centuries forgotten as to be no longer named, near the site of the ancient city of Uruk. An obscure Roman legionary mentions the temple where the goddess he refers to by the Syro-Phoenician name of Astarte was worshipped by a select coterie of adepts, both men and women, to whom she gave dominion over earth and sea and sky, power to raise tempests or to quiet them, to cause earthquakes, to cause fertility or sterility in men and beasts, or cause the illness or death of an enemy. 
They were also said to have the power of levitation, or flying through the air for great distances, or even to be seen in several places at the same time. This, you see, is about the sum total of all the powers claimed for witches and wizards in medieval times. In fine, this obscure goddess of our nameless centurion is the earliest ascertainable manifestation of the female divinity who governed witchcraft in the ancient world, and whose place has been usurped by the devil in Christian theology. But this was only the beginning. The Roman chronicler stated definitely that her idol was a stone from heaven, wrapped in an envelope of earth, and that no man durst break the tegument of the celestial stone for fear of rousing Astarte's wrath. Yet to him who had the courage to do so would be given the verbum magnum, or word of power, an incantation whereby all majesty, might, power, and dominion of all things visible and invisible would be put into his hands, so that he who knew the word would be, literally, emperor of the universe. As I said before, I became convinced of the reality of witchcraft, both ancient and modern, and the deeper I delved into the records of the past, the more convinced I was that the greatest claims made by latter-day witches were mere childish nonsense compared to the mighty powers actually possessed by the wizards of olden times. I spent my health and bankrupted myself seeking that nameless temple of Astarte. But at last I found it. I found the very stone of which the Roman wrote, and brought it back to America, here. Wickwire paused, breathing in laboured gasps, and his pale eyes shone with the quenchless ardour of the enthusiast, as he looked triumphantly from one of us to the other. Bien, monsieur, this stone of the old one is brought here. What then? De Grandin asked, as the professor showed no sign of proceeding further with his narrative. Eh? Oh, yes. Once more Wickwire lapsed into semi-somnolescence. Yes, I brought it back, and was preparing to unwrap it, studying my way carefully, of course, in order to avoid being blasted by the goddess's infernal powers when I broke the envelope. But... but they came last night and stole it. Bon sang d'un bon poisson. Must we drag information from you bit by little bit, monsieur? blazed the exasperated Jules de Grandin. Who was it pilfered your unmentionable stone? Kraus and Steinert stole it, Wickwire answered tonelessly. The German Illuminati, Hanoverians, whose researches paralleled mine in almost every particular and who discovered the approximate location of the mystic meteorite shortly after I did. Fortunately for me, their data were not so complete as mine, and they lost some time trying to locate the ancient temple. I had dug up the stone and was on my way home when they finally found the place. Can you imagine what it would mean to any mortal man to be suddenly translated into godhood, to sway the destinies of nations, of all mankind, as a wind sways a wheat field. If you can, you can imagine what those two adepts in black magic felt when they arrived and found the key to power gone and on its way to America in the possession of a rival. They sent astral messengers after me, first offering partnership, then when I laughed at them, making all manner of threats. Several times they attempted my life, but my magic was stronger than theirs, and each time I beat their spirit messengers off. Lately, though... Their emissaries have been getting stronger. I began to realize this when I found myself weaker and weaker after each encounter. Whether they have found new sources of strength, or whether it is because two of them work against me, I do not know. But I began to realize we were becoming more evenly matched, and it was only a matter of time before they would master me. Yet there was much to be done before I dared remove the envelope from that stone. To attempt it unprepared would be foolhardy. Such forces as would be unleashed by the cracking of that wrapping are beyond the scope of human imagining, and every precaution had to be taken. Any dunce can blow himself up handling gunpowder carelessly. Only the skilled artillerist can harness the explosive and make it drive a projectile to a given target. While I was perfecting my spiritual defences, I took all physical precautions— also barring my windows, and so securing my doors, 
that if my enemies gave up the battle of magic in disgust and fell back upon physical force, I should be more than a match for them. Then, because I thought myself secure, for a little time at least I overlooked one of the most elementary forms of sorcery, and last night they entered my house as though there had been no barriers, and took away the magic stone. With that in their possession I shall be no match for them. They will work their will on me, then overwhelm the world with the forces of their wizardry. If only— Excuse me, Professor, I broke in, for wild as his story was, I had become interested despite myself. What was the sorcery these men resorted to in order to force entrance? Your daughter told us something of a blazing hand, but— It was a hand of glory, he returned, regarding me with something of the look a teacher might bestow upon a backward schoolboy. One of the oldest, simplest bits of magic known to adepts. A hand, preferably the sinister, is cut from the body of an executed murderer, and five locks of hair are clipped from his head. The hand is smoked over a fire of juniper wood until it becomes dry and mummified. After this, the hair is twisted into wicks, which are affixed to the fingertips. If the proper invocations are recited, while the hand and wicks are being prepared, and the words of power pronounced when the wicks are lighted, no lock can withstand the light cast by the blazing glory hand, and— I remember him, de Grandin interrupted delightedly. Your so droll Abbe Barham tells of him in his exquisitely humorous poem. Now open lock to the dead man's knock, fly bolt and bar and band, nor move nor swerve joint, muscle or nerve, at the spell of the dead man's hand. Sleep all who sleep, wake all who wake, but be as the dead for the dead man's sake. Wickwire nodded grimly. There's a lot of truth in those doggerel rhymes, he answered. We laugh at the fairy story of Bluebeard today. But it was no joke in fifteenth century France when Bluebeard was alive and making black magic. Tu parles, mon vieux, agreed de Grandin, and excuse me, but you've spoken several times of removing the envelope from this stone, professor, I broke in again. Do you mean that literally, or literally? Wickwire responded. In Babylonia and Assyria, you know, all documents were clay tablets on which the cuneiform characters were cut while they were still moist and soft, and which were afterward baked in a kiln. Tablets of special importance, after having been once written upon and baked, were covered with a thin coating of clay, upon which an identical inscription was impressed, and the tablets were once more baked. If the outer writing were then defaced by accident, or altered by design, the removal of the outer coating would at once show the true text. Such a clay coating has been wrapped about the mystic meteorite of the great mother goddess, but even in the days of the Roman historian, most of the inscription had been obliterated by time. When I found it, I could distinguish only one or two characters, such as the double triangle signifying the moon, and the eight-pointed asterisks, meaning the lord of lords and god of gods, or lady of ladies and goddess of goddesses. These, I may add, were not in the Assyrian cuneiforms of 700 B.C., or even the archaic characters dating back to 2500, but the early, primitive cuneiform, which was certainly not used later than 4500 B.C., probably several centuries earlier. And how did you propose removing the clay integument without hurt to yourself, monsieur? de Grandin asked. Wickwire smiled, and there was something devilish, callous in his expression as he did so. "'Will you be good enough to examine my daughter's rings?' he asked. Obedient to his nodded command, the girl stretched forth her thin, frail hands, displaying the purple settings of the circlets which adorned the third finger of each. The stones were smoothly polished, though not very bright, and each was deeply incised with an inscription. "'It's the ancient symbol of the mother goddess. Wickwire explained, and signifies Royal Lady of the Night, Ruler of the Lights of Heaven, Mother of Gods, Men and Demons. Diane would have racked the envelope for me, for, 
only the hands of a virgin adorned with rings of amethyst, bearing the mother goddess's signet, can wield the hammer which can break that clay, and the maid must do the act without fear or hesitation, otherwise she will be powerless. Hmm? De Grandin twisted fiercely at his little blonde moustache. And what becomes of this ring-decorated virgin, monsieur? Again that smile of fiendish indifference transformed Wickwire's weak face into a mask of horror. She would die, he answered calmly. That, of course, is certain, but... Some lingering light of parental sanity broke through the look of wild fanaticism. Unless she were utterly consumed by the tremendous forces liberated when the envelope was cracked, I should have power to restore her to life, for all power, might, dominion, and majesty in the world would have been mine. Death should bow before me, and life should exist only by my sanction. I— You are a scoundrel and a villain and a most unpleasant species of a malodorous camel, cut in Jules de Grandin. Mademoiselle, you will kindly pack a portmanteau and come with us— we shall esteem it a privilege to protect you, till danger from those salbet who invaded your house last night is past. Without a word, or even a glance at the man who would have sacrificed her to his ambition, Diane Wickwire left the room, and we heard the clack-clack of her bedroom mules as she ascended to her chamber to procure a change of clothing. Professor Wickwire turned a puzzled look from de Grandin to me, then back to the Frenchman that we could not understand and sympathize with his ambition and condone his willingness to sacrifice his daughter's life never seemed to enter his mad brain. But me? What's to become of me? he whimpered. Eh bien, one wonders, answered Jules de Grandin. As far as I am concerned, monsieur, you may go to the devil, nor need you delay your departure in any wise out of consideration for my feelings. Mad, I diagnosed. Mad as hatters, both of them. The man's a potential homicidal maniac. Only heaven knows how long it'll be before we have to put the girl under restraint. De Grandin looked cautiously about. Then, satisfied that Diane Wickwire was still in the chamber to which she had been conducted by Nora McGuinness, my efficient household factotum, he replied, You think that story of the glory hand was madness, eh? Of course it was, I answered. What else could it be? Le bon Dieu knows, not I, he countered. But I would that you read this item in today's journal before consigning her to the madhouse. Picking up a copy of the morning paper, he indicated a boxed item in the center of the first page. Police are seeking the ghouls who broke in to James Gibson's funeral parlor, 1037 Ludlow Street, early last night, and stole the left hand from the body of Jose Sanchez, which was lying in the place awaiting burial today. Sanchez had been executed Monday night at Trenton for the murder of Robert Knight, caretaker in the closed Stepton's Iron Foundry last summer, and relatives had commissioned Gibson to bring the body to Harrisonville for interment. Gibson was absent on a call in the suburbs last night, and as his assistant, William Lowndes, was confined to bed at home by unexpected illness, had left the funeral parlor unattended, having arranged to have any telephone calls switched to his residence in Winthrop Street. On his return he found a rear door of his establishment had been jimmied, and the left hand of the executed murderer severed at the wrist. Strangely enough, the burglars had also shorn a considerable amount of hair from the corpse's head. A careful search of the premises failed to disclose anything else had been taken, and a quantity of money lying in the unlocked safe was untouched. Well, I exclaimed, utterly nonplussed, but... No, he denied shortly. It is not at all well, my friend. It is most exceedingly otherwise. It is fiendish. It is diabolical. It is devilish. There are determined miscreants against whom we have set ourselves, and I damn think that we shall lose some sleep ere all is done. Yes. 4. The Sending However formidable Professor Wickwire's rivals might have been, they gave no evidence of ferocity that I could see. 
Diane settled down comfortably in our midst, fitting perfectly into the quiet routine of the household, giving no trouble and making herself so generally agreeable that I was heartily glad of her presence. There is something comforting about the pastel shades of filmy dresses and white arms and shoulders gleaming softly in the candlelight at dinner. The melody of a well-modulated feminine voice, punctuated now and again with little rippling notes of quiet laughter, is more than vaguely pleasant to the bachelor ear. And as the time of our companionship lengthened, I often found myself wondering if I should have had a daughter such as this to sit at the table or before the fire with me, if fate had willed it otherwise, and my sole romance had ended elsewhere than an ivy-covered grave with low white headstone in St. Stephen's churchyard. One night I said as much to Jules de Grandin, and the pressure of his hand on mine was good to feel. Bien, my friend, he whispered. Who are we to judge the ways of heaven? The grass grows green above the lips you used to kiss. Me, I do not know if she I loved is in the world or gone away. I only know that never may I stand beside her grave and look at it, for in that cloistered cemetery no man may come, and... Eh, what is that? Un chaton? Outside the window of the drawing-room, scarce heard above the shrieking of the boisterous April wind, there sounded a plaintive mew, as though some feline wanderer begged entrance and a place before our fire. Crossing the room, I drew aside the casement curtain, staining my eyes against the murky darkness. Almost level with my own, two eyes of glowing green looked through the pane, and another pleading me all implored my charity. All right, pussy, come in, I invited, drawing back the sash to permit an entrance for the little waif, and through the opening jumped a plump, soft-haired Angora cat, black as Erebus, jade-eyed, velvet-pawed. For a moment it stood at gaze, as though doubtful of the worthiness of my abode to house one of its distinction. Then, with a satisfied little cat chuckle, it crossed the room, furry tail waving jauntily, came to halt before the fire and curled up on the hearth rug, where, with paws tucked demurely in and tail curled about its soft body, it lay blinking contentedly at the leaping flames and purring softly. A saucer of warm milk further cemented cordial relations, and another member was added to our household personnel. The little cat, on which we had bestowed the name of Eric Bright Eyes, at once attached himself to Diane Wickwire, and could hardly be separated from her. Toward de Grandin and me it showed disdainful tolerance. For Nora McGuinness it had supreme contempt. It was the twenty-ninth of April, a raw, wet night, when the thermometer gave the lie to the calendar's assertion that spring had come. Three of us, de Grandin, Diane, and I sat in the drawing-room. The girl seemed vaguely nervous and distraught, toying with her coffee-cup, puffing at her cigarette, grinding out its fire against the ashtray, then lighting another almost instantly. Finally she went to the piano and began to play. For a time she improvised softly, white fingers straying at random over the white keys, then, as though led by some subconscious urge for the solace of ecclesiastical music, she began the opening bars of Gunno's Sanctus. Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. The music ended on a sharply dissonant note, and a gasp of horrified surprise broke the echoing silence as the player lifted startled fingers from the keys. We turned toward the piano and... Mon Dieu! exclaimed de Grandin. Hell is unchained against us. The cat, which had been contentedly curled up on the piano's polished top, had risen and stood with arched back, bristling tail, and gaping blood-red mouth, gazing from blazing ice-green eyes at Diane, with such a look of murderous hate as made the chills of sudden blind, unreasoning fear run rippling down my spine. Eric! Eric Bright Eyes. Diane extended a shaking hand to soothe the menacing beast, and in a moment it was its natural, gentle self again, its back still arched, but arched in seeming playfulness, rubbing its fluffy head against her fingers and purring softly with contented friendliness. And did the horrid music hurt its eardrums? Well, Diane won't play it any more. 
the girl promised, taking the jet-black ball of fur into her arms and nursing it against her shoulder. Shortly afterward she said good night, and the cat still cuddled in her arms went up to bed. I hardly like the idea of her taking that brute up with her, I told de Grandin. It's always seemed so kind and gentle, but, well, I laughed uneasily. When I saw it snarling at her just now, I was heartily glad it wasn't any bigger. Hmm, returned the Frenchman, looking up from his silent study of the fire. One wonders. Wonders what? Much, by blue. Come, let us go. Where? Upstairs, Cordieu, and let us step softly while we are about it. De Grandin in the lead, we tiptoed to the upper floor and paused before the entrance to Diane's chamber. From behind the white enameled panels came the sound of something like a sob. Then, in a halting, faltering voice, Amen. Evil from us deliver but temptation into not us lead, and us against trespass who those forgive we as... Grand Dieu, la prière renversée! De Grandin cried, snatching savagely at the knob and dashing back the door. Diane Wickwire knelt beside her bed, purple-ringed hands clasped before her, tears streaming down her cheeks, while slowly, haltingly, like one wrestling with the vocables of an unfamiliar tongue, she painfully repeated the Lord's Prayer backward. And on the counterpane, its black muzzle almost forced against her face, crouched the black cat. But now its eyes were not the cool jade green which we had known. They were red as embers of a dying fire when blown to life by some swift draught of air, and on its feline face, in hellish parody of humanity, there was a grin, a smile as cold and menacing, yet wicked and triumphant, as any medieval artist ever painted on the lips of Satan. We stood immovable a moment taking in the tableau with a quickening gaze of horror. Then, "'Say it, mademoiselle, say it after me, properly,' commanded Jules de Grandin, raising his right hand to sign the cross above the girl's bowed head, and beginning slowly and distinctly. "'Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.' A terrifying screech, a scream of unsupportable agony, as though it had been plunged into a blazing fire, broke from the cowering cat-thing on the bed. Its reddened eyes flashed savagely, and its gaping mouth showed gleaming knife-sharp teeth as it turned its gaze from Diane Wickwire and fixed it on de Grandin. But the Frenchman paid no heed. "'And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen.' He finished the petition, and Diane prayed with him. Catching her cue from his slowly spoken syllables, she repeated the prayer word by painful word, and at the end collapsed, a whimpering flaccid thing against the bedstead. But the cat? It was gone. As the girl and Frenchman reached Amen, the beast snarled savagely, gave a final spiteful hiss, and whirled about and bolted through the open window vanishing into the night from which it had come a week before, leaving but the echo of its menacing sibilation and the memory of its dreadful transformation as mementos of its visit. In heaven's name, what was it? I asked breathlessly. A spy, he answered. It was ascending, my old one, an emissary from those evil ones to whom we stand opposed. A uh, ascending? Perfectly. Assist me with Mademoiselle Diane, and I shall elucidate. The girl was sobbing bitterly, trembling like a wind-shaken reed, but not hysterical, and a mild sedative was sufficient to enable her to sleep. Then, as we once more took our seats before the fire, de Grandin offered, I did not have suspicion of the cat, my friend. He seemed a natural animal, and as I like cats, I was his friend from the first. Indeed, it was not until tonight, when he showed aversion for the sacred music, that I first began to realize what I should have known from the beginning. He was ascending. Yes, you've said that before, I reminded him. But what the devil is ascending? The crystallized, physicalized desires and passions of a sorcerer, or wizard, he returned. 
somewhat as the medium builds a semi-physical, semi-spiritual body out of that impalpability which we call psychoplasm or ectoplasm, so the skilled adept in magic can evoke a physical-seeming entity out of his wicked thoughts and send it where he will to do his bidding and work his evil purposes. Those ones against whom we are pitted, those burglar thieves who entered Monsieur Wickwire's house with their accursed glory hand and stole away his unnameable stone of power, are no good, my friend. No, certainly. On the contrary, they are all bad. They are drunk with lust for the power which they think will come into their hands when they have stripped the wrapping off that unmentionable stone. They also know, I should say, that Wickwire, may he eat turnips and drink water throughout eternity, had ordained his daughter for the sacrifice, had chosen her for the role of envelope stripper off for that stone, and they accordingly desire to avail themselves of her services. To that end, they evoke that seeming cat and send it here, and it did work their will, conveyed their evil suggestions to the young girl's mind. She, who is all innocent of any knowledge of witchery or magic-mongering, was to be perverted, and right well the work was done. For tonight, when she knelt to say her prayers, she could not frame to pronounce them aright, but was obliged perforce to pray which fashion Which fashion but certainly, of course, those who have taken the vows of witchhood and signed their names in Satan's book of blackness are unable to pray like Christians from that time forward. They must repeat the holy words in reverse. Mademoiselle Diane, she is no professed witch, but I greatly fear she is infected by the virus. Already she was unable to pray like others, though when I said the prayer aright she was still able to repeat it after me. Now, is there any way we can find these scoundrels and free Diane? I interrupted. Not for a moment did I grant his premises, but that the girl was suffering some delusion I was convinced. Possibly it was long-distance hypnotic suggestion, but whatever its nature, I was determined to seek out the instigators and break the spell. For a moment he was silent, pinching his little pointed chin between a thoughtful thumb and forefinger and gazing pensively into the fire. At length, Yes, he answered. We can find the place where they lair, my friend. She will lead us to them. She? How? Exactement. Tomorrow is May Eve, witch night, Walpurgisnacht. Of all the nights which go to make the year, they are most likely to try their deviltry then. It was not for nothing that they sent their spy into this house and established rapport with Mademoiselle Diane. Oh, no. They need her in their business, and I think that all unconsciously she will go to them some time tomorrow evening. Me, I shall make it my especial duty to keep in touch with her, and where she goes, there will I go also. I too, I volunteered, and we struck hands upon it. 5. Walpurgisnacht Covertly but carefully, we noted every movement the girl made next day. Shortly after luncheon, de Grandin looked in at the consulting room and nodded significantly. She goes. So do I, he whispered, and was off. It was nearly time for the evening meal when Diane returned, and a moment after she had gone upstairs to change for dinner, I heard de Grandin's soft step in the hall. Name of a name! he ejaculated, dropping into the desk-side chair and lighting a cigarette. But it is a merry chase on which she has led me today, that one. I raised interrogative brows, and... From pharmacy to pharmacy she has gone, like a hypochondriac seeking for a cure. Consider what she bought. He checked the items off upon his fanned-out fingers. Aconitum, belladonna, solanine, mandragora officinalis. Not in any one, or even any two places, did she buy these things. No, she was shrewd. She was clever by blue, but she was subtle. Here she bought a flasson of perfume, there a box of powder, again a cake of scented soap. But mingled with her usual purchases would be occasionally one of these strange things which no young lady can possibly be supposed to want or need. What think you of it, my friend? Hmm, it sounds like some prescription from the medieval pharmacopoeia, I returned. Well said, my astute one, he answered. You have hit the thumb upon the nail, my Trowbridge. That is exactly what it is, a prescription from the Pharmacopoeia Maleficorum, 
the witch's book of recipes. Every one of those ingredients is stipulated as a necessary part of the witch's ointment. The what? The unguent with which those about to attend a sabbat, or meeting of a coven of witches, anointed themselves. If you will stop and think a moment, you will realize that nearly every one of those ingredients is a hypnotic or sedative. One thoroughly rubbed with a concoction of them would to a great degree lose consciousness, or at the least a sense of true responsibility. Yes, and? Quite yes. Today foolish people think of witches as rather amiable sadly misunderstood, and badly persecuted old females. That is quite as silly as the vapid modern belief that fairies, elves, and goblins are a set of well-intentioned folk. The truth is that a witch or wizard was, and is, one who by compact with the powers of darkness attains to power not given to the ordinary man, and uses that power for malevolent purposes, for a part of the compact is that he shall love evil and hate good. Very well. Et puis, just as your modern gunmen of America and the Apache of Paris drug themselves with cocaine in order to stifle any flickering remnant of morality and remorse before committing some crime of monstrous ruthlessness, so did, and do, the witch and wizard drug themselves with this accursed ointment that they might utterly forget the still small voice of conscience urging them to hold their hands from evil unalloyed. It was not merely magic which called for this anointing. It was practical psychology and physic which prescribed it, my friend. Yes, well, by damn, he hurried on, heedless of my interruption. I think that we have congratulated ourselves all too soon. Mademoiselle Diane is not free from the wicked influence of those so evil men. She is very far from free. And tonight, unconsciously and unwillingly perhaps, but nevertheless surely, she will anoint herself with this witch prescription, and, her body shining like something long dead and decomposing, will go to them. But what are we to do? Is there anything? But yes, of course. You will please remain here, as close as may be to her door, and if she leaves the house, you follow her. Me, I have important duties to perform, and I shall do them quickly. Anon I shall return, and if she has not gone by then, I shall join you in your watch. If— Yes, that's just it. Suppose she leaves while you're away, I broke in. How am I to get in touch with you? How will you know where to come? Call this number on the phone, he answered, scratching a memorandum on a card. Say but, she is gone and I go with her, and I shall come at once. For safety's sake I would suggest that you take a double pocket full of rice and scatter it along your way. I shall see the small white grains and follow hard upon your trail, as though you were a hare and I a hound. Obedient to his orders, I mounted to the second floor and took my station where I could see the door of Diane's room. Half an hour or more I waited in silence, feeling decidedly foolish, yet fearing to ignore his urgent request. At length, The soft creaking of hinges brought me alert as a fine pencil of light cut through the darkened hall. Walking so softly that her steps were scarcely audible, Diane Wickwire came from her room. From throat to insteps she was muffled in a purple cloak, while a veil or scarf of some dark-colored stuff was bound about her head, concealing the bright beacon of her glowing golden hair. Hoping desperately that I should not lose her in the delay, I dialed the number which de Gronda had given me, and as a man's voice challenged, Hello? repeated the formula he had stipulated. She goes, and I go with her. Then, without waiting for reply, I clashed the monophone back into its hooks, snatched up my hat and topcoat, seized a heavy blackthorn cane, and crept as silently as possible down the stairs behind the girl. She was fumbling at the front door lock as I reached the stairway's turn, and I flattened myself against the wall, lest she descry me. Then, as she let herself through the portal, I dashed down the stairs, stepped soft-footedly across the porch, and took up the pursuit. She hastened onward through the thickening dusk, her muffled figure but a faint shade darker than the surrounding gloom, led me through one side street to another, gradually bending her way toward the old east end of town, where ramshackle huts of squatters, 
abandoned factories, unofficial dumping grounds, and occasional tumble-down and long-vacated dwellings of the better sort disputed for possession of the neighborhood with weed-choked fields of yellow clay and partly inundated swampland, the desolate backwash of the tide of urban growth which every city has as a memento of its early settlers' bad judgment of the path of progress. Where field and swamp and desolate tin can and ash-strewn dumping ground met in dreary confluence, there stood the ruins of a long-abandoned church. Immediately after the Civil War, when rising Irish immigration had populated an extensive shanty town down on the flats, a young priest, more ambitious than practical, had planted a Catholic parish, built a brick chapel with funds advanced by sympathetic co-religionists from the richer part of town, and attempted to minister the spiritual needs of the newcomers. But prosperity had depopulated the mean dwellings of his flock, who offered jobs on the railway or police force, or employment in the mills then being built on the other side of town, had moved their humble household gods to new locations, leaving him a shepherd without sheep. Soon he too had gone, and the church stood vacant for two-score years or more, time and weather and ruthless vandalism taking toll of it, till now it stood amid the desolation which surrounded it like a lich amid a company of sprawling skeletons. Its windows broken out, its doors unhinged, its roof decayed and fallen in, naught but its crumbling walls and topless spire remaining to bear witness that it once had been a house of prayer. The final grains of rice were trickling through my fingers as I paused before the barren ruin, wondering what my next move was to be. Diane had entered through the doorless portal at the building's front, and the darkness of the black interior had swallowed her completely. I had a box of matches in my pocket, but they, I knew, would scarcely give me light enough to find my way about the ruined building. The floors were broken in a dozen places, I was sure and where they were not actually displaced, they were certain to be so weakened with decay that to step on them would be courting swift disaster. I had no wish to break a leg and spend the night, and perhaps the next day and the next, in an abandoned ruin where the chances were that anyone responding to my cries of help would only come to knock me on the head and rob me. But there was no way out but forward. I had promised Jules de Grandin that I'd keep Diane in sight. And so, with a sigh which was half a prayer to the god of foolish men, I grasped my stick more firmly, and stepped across the threshold of the old, abandoned church. Stygian darkness closed about me as waters close above the head of one who dives, and like foul, greasy water, so it seemed to me, the darkness pressed upon me clogging eyes and nose and throat, leaving only the sense of hearing and of apprehension unimpaired. The wind soughed dolefully through the broken arches of the nave, and whistled with a sort of mocking ululation among the rotted cross-beams of the transept. Drops of moisture accumulated on the studdings of the broken roof fell dismally from time to time. The choir and sanctuary were invisible, but I realized they must be at the farther end of the building, and set a cautious foot forward, but drew it quickly back for only empty air responded to the pressure of my probing boot. Where was the girl? Had she fallen through an opening in the floor to be precipitated on the rubble in the basement? I asked myself. Diane! Oh, Diane! I called softly. No answer. I struck a match and held the little torch aloft, its feeble light barely staining the surrounding blackness with the faintest touch of orange, then gasped involuntarily. Just for a second, as the matchhead kindled into flame, I saw a vision. Vision, perhaps, is not the word for it. Rather, it was like one of those phosphenes, or subjective sensations of light which we experience when we press our fingers on our lowered eyelids. Not quite perceived, vague, dancing, and elusive, yet somehow definitely felt. The molding beams and uprights of the church, long denuded of their pristine coat of paint and plaster, seemed to put on new habiliments, or to have been mysteriously metamorphosed. The bare brick walls were sheathed in stone, and I was gazing down a long and narrow colonnaded corridor, agleam with glowing torches, 
which terminated in a broad, low flight of steps leading to a marble platform. A giant statue dominated all, a figure hewn from stone and representing a tall and bearded being with high virgin female breasts, clothed below the waist in woman's robes, a scepter tipped with an acorn-like ornament in the right hand, a newborn infant cradled in the crook of the left elbow. Music, not heard but rather felt, filled the air until the senses swooned beneath its overpowering pressure, and a line of girls, birth nude, save for the veilings of their long and flowing hair, entered from the right and left, formed twos and stepped with measured, mincing tread in the direction of the statue. With them walked shaven-headed priests in female garb, their weak and beardless faces smirking evilly. Brow down upon the tessellated pavement dropped the maiden priestesses, their hands palms forward, clasped above their heads, while they beat their foreheads softly on the floor and the eunuch priests stood by impatiently. And now the groveling women rose and formed a circle where they stood, hands crossed above their breasts, eyes cast demurely down, and four shaven-pated priests came marching in, a gilded litter on their shoulders. On it, garlanded in flowers, but otherwise unclothed, lay a young girl, eyes closed, hands clasped as if in prayer, slim ankles crossed. They put the litter on the floor before the statue of the monstrous hermaphroditic god-thing. The circling maidens clustered round. A priest picked up a golden knife and touched the supine girl upon the insteps. There was neither fear nor apprehension on the face of her upon the litter, but rather an expression of ecstatic longing and anticipation as she uncrossed her feet. The flaccid-faced, emasculated priest leaned over her, gloating. As quickly as it came, the vision vanished. A drop of gelid moisture fell from a rafter overhead, extinguishing the quivering flame of my match, and once more I stood in the abandoned church, my head whirling, my senses all but gone, as I realized that through some awful power of suggestion I had seen a tableau of the worship of the great All-Mother. The initiation of a virgin priestess to the ranks of those love slaves who served the worshippers of the goddess of fertility, Diana, Miladath, Astarte, Kobar, or by whatever name men knew her in differing times and places. But there was not a vision in the flickering lights which now showed in the ruined sanctuary place. Those spots of luminance were torches in the hands of living mortal men, men who moved soft-footedly across the broken floor and set up certain things, a tripod with a brazen bowl upon its top, a row of tiny brazen lamps which flickered weakly in the darkness, as though they had been votive lamps before a Christian altar. And by their faint illumination I saw an odd-appearing thing stretched east and west upon the spot where the tabernacle had been housed. A grey-white, leprous-looking thing, which might have been a sheeted corpse or likened tombstone, and before it the torch-bearers made low obeisance, genuflecting deeply, and the murmur of their chant rose above the whispering reproaches of the wind. It was an obscene invocation. Although I could not understand the words or even classify the language which was used, I felt that there was something wrong about it, it was something like a phonographic record played in reverse. Syllables which I knew instinctively should be sonorously noble were oddly turned and twisted in pronunciation. Duke Sirairog. With a start I found the key. It was Latin, spoke backward. They were intoning the fifty-second psalm. Quid gloriaris, why boastest thou thyself, whereas the goodness of God endureth yet daily? A stench as of burning offal stole through the building as the incense pot upon the tripod began to belch black smoke into the air. And now another voice was chanting, a woman's rich contralto. O ichianimuli sunimod. I strained my ears and bent my brows in concentration, and at last I had the key. It was the twenty-seventh psalm recited in reverse Latin. The Lord is my light and my salvation. From the shadows Diane Wickwire came, 
straight and supple as a willow wand, unclothed as for the bath, but smeared from soles to hairline with some luminous concoction, so that her slim nude form stood out against the blackness, like a spirit out of purgatory visiting the earth with the incandescence of the purging fires still clinging to it. Silently, on soft-soled naked feet, she stepped across the long deserted sanctuary and passed before the object lying there and as her voice mingled with the chanting of men, I seemed to see a monstrous form take shape against the darkness. A towering, obscene, freakish form, bearded like a hero of the Odyssey, its pectoral region thick-hung with multiple mammy, its nether limbs encased in a man's chiton, a lingam-headed scepter and a child held in its hands. I shuddered. A chill not of the storm-swept night, but colder than any physical cold, seemed creeping through the air, as the ghostly, half-defined form seemed taking solidarity from the empty atmosphere. Diane Wickwire paused a moment, then stepped forward, a silver hammer gleaming in the lambent light rays of the little brazen lamps. But suddenly, like a draft of clear, fresh mountain breeze cutting through the thick, mephitic vapors of swamp, there came another sound. Out of the darkness it came, yet not long was it in darkness, for his face picked out by candlelight, a priest arrayed in full canonicals stepped from the shadows, while beside him, clothed in cassock and surplice, a lighted taper in his hand, walked Jules de Grandin. They were intoning the office of exorcism. Remember not, Lord, our offences, nor the offences of our forefathers, neither take thou vengeance of our sins. As though struck dumb by the singing of the holy chant, the evocators ceased their sacrilegious intonation, and stared amazed as de Grandin and the cleric approached. Abreast of them, the priest raised the aspergillum which he bore and sprinkled holy water on the men, the woman, and the object of their veneration. The result was cataclysmic. Out went the light of every brazen lamp, vanished was the hovering horror from the air above the stone, the luminance on Diane's body faded as though wiped away, and from the sky's dark vault there came the rushing of a mighty wind. It shook the ancient ruined church, broke joists and timbers from their places, toppled tattered edges of brick walls into the darkened body of the rotting pile. I felt the floor swaying underneath my feet, heard a woman's wild, despairing scream, and the choking, suffocated roar of something in death agony, as though a monster strangled in its blood. Then, Trowbridge, mon brave! Trowbridge, mon cher! Do you survive? Are you still breathing? I heard de Grandin's hail, as though from a great distance. I sat up gingerly, his arm behind my shoulders. Yes, I think so. I answered doubtfully. What was it, an earthquake? Something very like it, he responded with a laugh. It might have been coincidence, though I do not think it was, but a great wind came from nowhere and completed the destruction which time began. That ruined church will never more give sanctuary to the wanderers of the night. It is only debris now. Diane, I began, and she is yonder he responded, nodding toward an indistinct figure lying on the ground a little distance off. She is still unconscious, and I think her arm is broken, but otherwise she is quite well. Can you stand? With his assistance I rose and took a few tottering steps. Then, my strength returning, helped him lift the swooning girl and bear her to a decrepit ford, which was parked in the muddy apology for a road beside the marshy field. Mon père! de Grandin introduced. This is the good physician, Dr. Trowbridge, of whom I told you, he who led us to this place. Friend Trowbridge, this is Father Ribet of the French Mission, without whom we should... Eh bien, who can say what we should have done? The priest, who, like most members of his calling, drove well but furiously, took us home, but declined to stay for refreshment, saying he had much to do the next day. We put Diane to bed her fractured arm carefully set and bandaged. De Grandin sponged her with a Turkish cloth, drying her as deftly as any trained hospital nurse could have done. Then, when we'd put her nightclothes on her and tucked her in between the sheets, he bore the basin of bath-water to the sink, 
poured it out, and followed it with a liberal libation of carbolic antiseptic. "'Can you withstand that violescence of the old one?' he demanded as the strong scent of phenol filled the room. "'Well, I'm listening,' I informed him as we lighted our cigars. "'What's the explanation, if any?' He shrugged his shoulders. "'Who can say?' he answered. "'You know from what I told you that Mademoiselle Diane prepared to go to them. "'From what you did observe yourself, you know she went. "'To meet their magic with a stronger counter-agent, "'I had recourse to the good Père Ribet. "'He is a Frenchman, therefore he was sympathetic when I laid the case before him, "'and readily agreed to go with me and perform an exorcism of the evil spirit "'which possessed our dear Diane, and was ruled by those vile miscreants. "'It was his number which I bade you call.' and fast we followed on your message, tracing you by the trail of rice you left, and making ready to perform our office when all was ready. We waited till the last safe minute. Then, while they were chanting their so blasphemous inverted psalms, we broke in on them, and— What was that awful monstrous thing I saw forming in the air, just before you and Father Ribe came in? I interrupted. Tiens, who can say? He answered with another shrug. Some have called it one thing— some another? Me? I think it was the visible embodiment of the evil thing which man worshipped in the olden days, and called the Mother Principle. These things, you know, my friend, were really demons, but their strength was great, for they drew form and substance from the throngs which worshipped them. But demons they were, and are, and so are subject to the rite of exorcism, and accordingly, when good Père Ribet did sprinkle... Do you mean you actually believe a few phrases of ecclesiastical Latin and a few drops of holy water could dissipate that dreadful thing? I asked incredulously. He puffed slowly at his cigar. Then, have it this way if you prefer, he answered. The power of evil which this thing we call the Magna Mater, for want of a better name, possesses comes from her or its worshippers. Generation after superstitious generation of men worshipped it, pouring out daily praise and prayer to it, believing in it. Thereby they built up a very great psychological power, a very exceedingly great power, indeed. Make no doubt about that. But the olden gods died when Christianity came. Their worshippers fell off. They were weakened for very lack of psychic nourishment. Christianity, the new virile faith, upon the other hand, grew strong apace. The office of exorcism was developed by the time-honoured method of trial and error, and finally it was perfected. Certain words, certain sounds, if you prefer, pronounced in certain ways, produced certain ascertainable effects, precisely as a note played upon a violin produces a responsive note from a piano. You have the physical explanation of that, Good. This is a spiritual analogy. Besides, generations of faithful Christians have believed, firmly believed, that exorcism is effective. Voila, it is therefore effective. A psychological force of invincible potency has been built up for it. And so when Pierre Ribet exorcised the demon goddess in that old and ruined church tonight, tiens, you saw what happened. What became of those men? I asked. One wonders, he responded. Their bodies I can vouch for. They are broken and buried under tons of fallen masonry. Tomorrow the police emergency squad will dig them out, and speculation as to who they are and how they met their fate will be a nine days' wonder in the newspapers. And the stone? Crushed, my friend. Utterly crushed and broken. Père Ribet and I beheld it. "'Smashed into a dozen fragments. "'It was all clay, not clay surrounding a meteorite, "'as the poor deluded wickwire believed. "'Also, but look here, man,' I broke in. "'This is all the most fantastic lot of balderdash I've ever heard. "'Do you think I'm satisfied with any such explanation as this? "'I'm willing to concede part of it, of course. "'But when it comes to all that stuff about the magna mater and— "'Aha! He cut me off. "'As for those explanations—' They satisfy me no more than they do you. There is no explanation for these happenings which will meet a scientific or even logical analysis, my friend. Let us not be too greatly concerned with whys and wherefores. The hour grows late, and I grow very thirsty. 
Come, let us take a drink and go to bed. This has been a Highbridge production. Read by Paul Woodson, a member of SAG-AFTRA. Copyright 2018 by the estate of Seabury Quinn. Jules de Grandin Stories. Copyright 1925 through 1938 by Popular Fiction Publishing Company. Jules de Grandin Stories. Copyright 1938 through 1951 by Weird Tales. Published by arrangement with Skyhorse Publishing Incorporated. Recording copyright 2019 by Highbridge, a division of recorded books. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.